A very good morning, everyone. On behalf of Bass and Kim's Hospital, I welcome dear participants, respected faculty, and all the brilliant minds behind this excellent and knowledge sharing execution. Uh, now we are just um, displaying a trial game of Kahoot. This is just to familiarize all the participants how so it has to be taken into. And this, we're just doing a dry, dry run. We're not starting the program. Uh, all of you, please uh, open your internet and just download uh, kahoot.it. In Google, just type kahoot.it and log into that. Kahoot, K A H O O T. Display the steps now. No? So, K A H O O T, kahoot.it. Yeah. They also can do if they want. <laughs> yeah. IT, IT uh, dot login, like. Look at that uh, steps. No? Uh, pin. We'll give you the pin. Everybody got that open? Is it asking for a pin? Yeah. So can go straight away for the pin. People know that. Yes. Yes, uh, can you give a game? Everybody, uh, yeah, uh, so can you display the game pin? display yeah. so everybody has got this everybody is asking it's asking for game pin yeah but you can help Mike. Yeah. So yeah, can all of you uh, this enter this number in the game pin? One three four three nine eight four. Yeah, and I mean, if you don't want your name, you want to participate. Faculty who wants to participate but don't want their name, it's, uh, this guy's name.
this game pin is going to be different for a different MCQ test. So every time you have to enter the different game pin. Yes, sir. all has not have not yet done. Yeah. Eleven. We want everybody. At least some forty are there. You can give your name only, sir. It's up to you. Nickname or even whatever you want. It's just to identify yourself. Because so that whoever gets the highest at the end of one and a half day, they uh, five of them get five prizes are there. How many prizes you okay. have? Top five or top ten? Top five will get some prizes. So your names should be consistent. <clears throat> Yeah, so we'll have a demo run now. You have the first question. First question. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'll start with the difficult question. So, um, so we, in 10 seconds, one have to answer, yeah. So just uh, click on A, B, or C, D, whatever you feel right. And so 10 seconds, three, and after 10 seconds, then. So, <laughs> so and this is how it will run all throughout. After every three session, we'll have questions on the three sessions, uh, which faculty has given. Uh, so you have to be attentive during the sessions, otherwise you cannot answer. And uh, so that you'll have self-evaluation at the end, you'll know uh, how much you have assimilated. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Kevin is the winner for this. Where is Dr. Kevin? He has done online, I think. Okay. Because people will participate online, but the prizes are only for people who are here. Online people will not get prizes, but they will be appreciated. On a positive note, life, the light of divinity, wisdom, intellect, and good works are all manifestations of the symbolic nature of the Lamb. I would kindly call upon Dr. Syastri, Dr. Shubha, Shubhash Kaul, Dr. Suresh Naya, Dr. Manas, Dr. Suchenda. Ma'am and sir, please come onto the stage for lighting the lamp. As a markup respect, I would request everybody to please be standard. <laughs>
Kindly be seated. Sir, please take your seats. I would request Dr. Asyastri sir just give a, a opening remark. Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege as president of the Bas Society to welcome you all for this meeting. And it is very heartening that Dr. Manas has taken this initiative to have basics in neurology for the postgraduate students and also those who are practicing neurology and neurosurgery. And I'm sure you will all will be benefited by the two-day program and enrich yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would request Dr. Shubhash Kaul, sir. Sir, please address the gathering. Thank you. So I welcome all the faculty and all the students who have come here today. I think you will have two days of real fun with uh, knowledge. So all the best. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Suresh, sir, please last. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Hyderabad. It should not be some monotonous lecture from our end. It should be interactive session. Eh? And you know, neurosciences, neurology, neurosciences is not a one-time learning and lifelong learning. Every day it changes. Eh? And this Manas has, had given me three topics. You know, I thought it's so easy. Eh? And till today morning, I was changing. Eh? So difficult. Eh? And I learned so many things. Thanks, Manas, for giving me these topics. In fact, I have learned so many things. Hope you'll enjoy and interact. Thank you, sir. Now we are moving on to our academic session, that is anatomy and physiological basis. To chair this session, I would request Dr. Syastri, sir, and Dr. Sanjay Wohra, sir, come on to the stage and lead the session. Hello. Good morning, everybody. This is the opening batsman, uh, Frontal Lobe Clinical Science, Anatomical and Physiological Basics by Dr. Pramin Kumar Yada. May I request Dr. Pramin Kumar? Uh, at the outset, I would thank Manas sir for giving me the opportunity and it obviously a privilege because uh, I am in front of my teachers, Kaul sir, Jabin madam, who has taught us the basics. I hope to keep the basics correct. Thank you. The first of the topic is the frontal loop. I would request all the residents to just uh, uh, to pick up the important points from all the topics so that you have a because the schedule has been tight and it covers the whole of the spectrum of neurology. The first part is about the frontal lobe. I am Dr. Praveen, consultant at Kim's Hospital. Now, as we see the frontal lobe, frontal lobe definitely has evolved. As, we, as a part of evolution, our ancestors, their brow was very much prominent. But as we evolved, we found out that uh, there was a the frontal lobe kept on increasing to the extent that uh, now the high straight forehead that is a characteristic of the present structure of the people is a evolution that uh, 
that respects the frontal lobe which has developed and till about 50 60 years back it was thought the frontal lobe doesn't contribute much to any part of cognition to the extent with that uh, we all remember know this famous neurologist igas monis who had uh, uh, introduced uh, frontal leukotomies so that the schizophrenic patients psychiatric patients they become calm down and uh, also you know about this uh, famous railway person with a crowbar phineas gage who was whose whose accident while working in a uh, railroad showed us the picture how much the frontal lobe has contributed to the cognitive ability of a human in fact after the there the famous uh, 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 phrase that uh, after the accident he was no longer gauge what he was before this is in brief uh, therefore what does the frontal lobe do how has it evolved right if we look at our counterparts of the living beings the cat and the dog they have the smallest frontal lobes our nearest cousins they have a little bit more and we seem to have the largest frontal lobe it contributes almost to about 33% of the brain volume and even as we uh, after our birth till 6 years it keeps on uh, uh, increasing in size it's well developed as i told in primates monkeys and us and uh, and it's still developing i think so what does it do now we know it contributes how we behave what we do what we see the sarcasm the empathy the seat of all of this is the frontal lobe will it further evolve will it become a operculum i doubt with the advent of ai our thought processes may not be uh, evolving further possibly shall we retrace back that i don't know now a brief uh, to start with the anatomy the most important uh, that uh, we know in the frontal lobe four important gyri that is the precentral gyri superior frontal gyri middle and the inferior frontal how are they separated they are separated by four important sulci four gyri four sulci the central sulcus in front of it we have the precentral precentral gyrus which have the motor cortex motor cortex and the premotor cortex as we know it corresponds to helps in the initiation of movement before that we have the precentral sulcus and if we draw two lines perpendicular to that we have the superior frontal gyrus middle frontal gyrus my talk will be focusing more on this part that is seat to our functioning seat to our doing all today day to day activities and the middle frontal gyrus corresponds to a language the uh, left part corresponds to the words the right to the numbers at the end of the middle frontal gyrus as where it joins with the precentral sulcus we have the frontal eye field the inferior frontal gyrus corresponding to the broad main area 44 and 45 is the brocas here there are three parts which has been divided by a uh, lateral ramus from the lateral sulcus and the lat and uh, ascending ramus or the lateral fissure the two three that corresponds to the semantic word semantic word means if i if i am hearing a word what does it mean that corresponds to the past triangular uh, triangularis and the past or uh, orbicularis whereas the part one that is the most important part broadman area 44 corresponds to word generation and also numbers this is a brief i would like to talk about that but is this what we need but as i as we all know it's the uh, time of mri then how does it corresponds to the mri this is a beautiful presentation that i have taken from somebody i will be telling it later and i would like all of you to focus on this right as we start from the vertex who is at the top the king is at the top that is the superior frontal gyrus right if we take the topmost cut and the most prominent gyri which is seen that is the superior frontal gyrus just looks like a king how do we identify it just it is as a 
thumb of a fist. Okay, just if we make a fist sign with a thumbs up sign, the thumb corresponds to the superior frontal gyrus. And uh, what happens to the incurled fingers? Oh, sorry. Now, what else do we have? The superior frontal gyrus also contains the supplementary motor area. Two parts to this. The posterior part is walking, anterior part is language. How do we remember? We walk first, then we develop language. Similar way, there is the, this is the thumb. At the base of the thumb is the motor. The anterior is the language. This is about the superior frontal gyrus, functional anatomy. And what about the incurled fingers? The incurled fingers corresponds to the middle frontal gyrus. That's as simple as that. All of us going back, I uh, have done that. Look at the MRIs, you will easily fi find out, locate the, uh, the thumb and the incurled fingers corresponding to the superior and the middle frontal gyrus. This is it. Now what? As, as we trace back the superior frontal gyrus, it comes and crashes with the one gyri, that is the motor cortex. And that is the point, uh, that is how we recognize the motor strip. This is the supplementary motor area coming and crashing into that gyri, that is the motor strip. How, well, how else can we recognize the motor strip? Don't forget the omega sign. This is the omega sign, the one one part is that also yeah one part is that you are looking at the point where the supplementary area corresponds to and comes and crashes with the motor cortex and the second part is that look at the omega this is how you you can easily recognize the most important gyri of the uh, frontal lobe and it, when we trace it back we find a c shaped lo c shaped lobule that is the paracentral lobule this is as simple as it gets, but it helps a lot in identify the gyri, important gyri on the MRI. Now coming to the functional part, I already covered it, but this is the area which we are con concentrating on. That is the prefrontal area, which comprises of the three structures, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, and the medial cortex. A gist about the functions, this was about the functional anatomy. When we come to the functional uh, uh, functions of the frontal lobe, it has it has domains in all of it: motor, cognition, behavior, and attention. Starting from initiation, planning, voluntary action of the motor activity, attention, social behavior, the frontal lobe covers all of it. Therefore, we have to look which part of it focuses on what. As, we, as I was talking about the uh, prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, as we segregate it, there is a big dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And in the base, we have the orbitofrontal cortex and the medial, we have the medial frontal cortex. All of it contributes to different functions, different actions of the frontal lobe. Is that it? Whenever we talk about the frontal lobe, it's not frontal lobe. It is frontal lobe and its connections. Because all of the sections, they have uh, elaborate circuits connecting to about, uh, connecting and making about five circuits. And one of it, I am just demonstrating it because the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has extensive connection and this I am showing the thalamic connection. Why? If the patient may be presenting with a frontal lobe syndrome, but you see the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe seems good. Don't forget to look at the subcortex. Because a thalamic lesion can itself produce a similar feature as a frontal lobe due to its connections. Therefore, whenever we talk, discuss about a case, whenever we talk, tell about frontal lobe, it's just not the frontal lobe, but it's the frontal lobe and its connections. Now, as I come to individual part, the most important is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex having extensive connections with the motor cortex, sensory cortex, basal ganglia and the thalami. What does it do? What does it do? It is the most important cortex involving in the planning, adjusting and monitoring behavior. What therefore, what are the problems? It causes a planning disorder. That is the executive function disorder. And there is a decreased attention. Frontal lobe has, it amalgamates all the sensor stimuli 
and gives the output. This output is deranged if there is any defect in the frontal loop. Now, what do you mean by the executive function? Executive function is a think about the executive in a executive in an organization. What is his function? He sees that all of the workers are coming, all the people are coming, all the work is being done, and their output is there. That is the function of an executive. The same thing frontal loop does. It plans, it initiates, there is a response inhibition, mental flexibility, there is a working memory and a fluency. These are all the headings of a executive dysfunction, executive function. What does it entail? What does it entail? It I will the, I will give a beautiful analogy. Think of it as a cooking. A, a good cook is an epitome of exact executive function. Think of your uh, mother or your better half. Do they calculate what they cook? Or if there is a big party, do they measure? No. They all use their frontal lobes to do the work. What happens if the problem is there? First of all, they may not have the necessary ingredients. That's the part of the frontal lobe. Second, they may not have exact measures. There may be problem in the measures. Third, they cannot may not judge accordingly how much to give and what are the ingredients to be added. Next, they cannot, they can, there can be problem in the uh, sequence of also addition. And uh, these are all the steps where a cooking may go wrong. And that this, the frontal lobe looks to it and prevent this from occurring. For this, it needs planning, uh, initiation, and response inhibition, and uh, all the proper steps one by one. Therefore, how we can test it? Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is uh, as the patient enters the room, the, we start the testing. That is, how is he giving the uh, story? Is the history being accurate? Is he able to tell each of the thing properly? That is a simple bedside test. Is he on time? Has he, uh, has he come properly at that time? That is also important. Now, how we test it? The simplest test is a digit span. What do you mean by a digit, digit span? We give a string of numbers, ask the patient to remember it, and they have to. There is two components to that. One is the digit forward and a digit backward, right? Digit forward is the most important for attention, whereas digit backward is for whether he is able to store the numbers and again repeat back. That's a component of the working memory. Therefore, simple bedside looking at the demeanor, asking few questions will set the ball rolling because till the patient has a good attention, then only we can go forward either for the history or for the examination. Now, coming to the medial prefrontal lobe, medial prefrontal lobe has also has extensive connections with the temporal cortex, parietal, and also with the basal ganglia. It is the seat of motivation and initiation of activity. For all of the activities, we need an internal motivation. The so thought of it is a medial frontal lobe, which is the seat of it. In other words, this is thought to be the reward center. If a, a part of it is damaged, then the patient may not feel any motivation. He won't get any reward for doing that. Therefore, there will be... Oh, sorry. I, okay. There will be positive of the spontaneous movement, decreased verbal output, lower extremity weakness along with incontinence, as we know. What is the bedside function? Simple, phonemic word fluency. How much words he can tell that comes down. And overall, he is very slow to perform tasks. Coming to the orbital, sir, can I go slow and finish? A few times, sir. Not much. The orbitofrontal cortex, it has uh, extensive connection with the limbic cortex. What does it do? It is important for our social decorum. How he behave us, ourselves in a party. If there is a problem to that, there is a socially in inappropriate behavior, cracking inappropriate jokes. And uh, for example, being a rash driver, 
these are all features of a improper orbitofrontal cortex therefore looking into this what what can we do simple test what we do is known as the go no go test for example first step it is that i ask i tell i will tap once you tap once if he follows that next i will ask him to stop it and he has to stop it that's a part of uh, the simple orbitofrontal cortex therefore this is the simple schema for the or prefrontal cortex function involving the dorsolateral prefrontal medial prefrontal and the inhibition now what, therefore categorizing it there is three syndromes first is the dis executive syndrome where they cannot plan there is the impulsive behavior and they cannot judge disinhibitory system there are improper behavior they cannot condemn themselves and they become quite impulsive and the apathetic syndrome there is no initiation social isolation and in each to we need to coax them to do activities all corresponding to the three uh, parts of the prefrontal lobe as i have discussed this is a gist about the uh, what i have told it would i would like to talk something about the alien hand syndrome very important uh, part of a problem of, of the frontal lobe this is a photograph from a video in which the patient's left hand left hand is hitting herself that is the most important feature of alien lamb there are two criteria for that first when it is involuntary second one it is automatic there are three regions that can cause a alien hand syndrome that is first at the frontal lobe that's what's being shown here the patient owns the limb patient will tell yes i have this is my hand and it is causing problem what it it will what it does it is a exploratory behavior for example if i am holding a pen the other hand will come and grab the pen that is the frontal alien limb you have the callosal defect that is the intermanual conflict if i button the other hand will come and unbutton it and the posterior that is in the parietal alien limb the patient may just deny that no 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 this is not my hand this is someone's hand, else hand also called as dr strange glove syndrome this is brief about the uh, bedside frontal battery which is a very simple test which comprises of uh, looking at similarities word fluency luria test along with uh, conflicting in interference go no go and prehensile behavior all of it comprises of the frontal lobe assessment battery higher we score on it better it is the take home message i would like to say is that uh, this is the low low for or the seat of civilization a good history uh, will help in localization but the caveat here is that a frontal lobe patient may perform well in the test but in the real life scenario there may be uh, he may not just uh, uh, go to it thank These you these are my references jane this the uh, this is the beautiful book uh, all the neurology resident will be having it anybody interested it is just like reading a story and uh, this is the twitter handle i would like i will request all the residents to follow the, uh, she is a radiologist and uh, the beautiful uh, neuroanatomy what i have taken i have taken from this handle thank Th you thank you very much now i would request uh, jabin sheik of san for temporal lobe clinical science and anatomical and physiological basis we'll appreciate if you could stick to the time please uh good the cortex because i think the order of uh, today's talk is little it should have been different because uh, the process starts does not start in the frontal lobe the process mainly starts in our sensory input which you get all of you not hearing to the lecture you are getting visual information you are getting auditory information so how this information is going to the frontal lobe for further intellectual processing it the main the strategic location of the temporal lobe is in the processing of your sensory information so what are the sensory information you are getting you are getting auditory information you are getting all uh, of course visual information olfactory information and you are also
also getting sometimes visceral information. So, so many information is coming to your brain and this temporal lobe, it acts mainly as an association cortex. Lot of association cortices are present in the temporal lobe, which analyze this sensory input. So I am not going into the details of anatomy uh, in the temporal lobe, but what we have to understand is only primates have the temporal lobe and uh, it con constitutes almost 17% of the cerebral cortex. And most of the times where you see in your clinical practice is uh, neurosurgeons probably mainly in the head trauma and neoplasms. Of course, after epilepsy surgery also, it is very important to know whether there will be any deficits after the temporal lobectomy or if there is any strategic location uh, lesion placed in different parts of the temporal lobe, you should know what are the deficits produced. So why it is called temporal is that this, uh, the graying is supposed to happen in the um, temple area. So this lobe which was adjacent to the temple area had become the temporal lobe. So uh, directly going to the grass anatomy, I think all neurosurgeons know better than uh, any neuro neurology resident is that uh, you have superior middle and inferior temporal gyrus and the basic temporal lobe which we usually do not concentrate much. It contains the uncus, the parahippogampal gyrus and the fusiform gyrus as well as the but part of inferior temporal gyrus and this part of the lobe that is the superior part of the temporal lobe which actually borders the insula it contains two transverse temporal gyri these are important because they are uh, they are the primary area for your auditory information to come so coming to radiologic anatomy all of you should concentrate on the coronal sections because they can they contain the maximum amount of uh, temporal lobe can be easily differentiated in the coronal section this is the anterior part of the temporal lobe uh, coronal section where you can see the uh, amygdala actually becoming the hippocampus, the adjacent gyrus to the hippocampus. Not going into the details of hippocampal structure as such because uh, this will take a lot of time. The parahippocampal, this is very important because it causes, it is, you can cause uh, here, most of your limbic system is situated, which I will be telling later. The other name is the lateral to the parahippocampal gyrus is the lateral occipital temporal gyrus, otherwise called as fusiform gyrus. And the lateral most part of the temporal lobe is the superior, middle and inferior temporal gyrus. Going further posteriorly in the radiology, you can also sometimes uh, identify the uh, Heschel's gyrus, otherwise called as auditory gyrus. Going further posteriorly, when you are seeing the fornices, you can also identify the medial post part is the parahippocampal gyrus and the fusiform gyrus almost extends posteriorly up to the visual uh, occipital lobe. If you look, look at the axial sections, you, sh you should be able to identify that the lateral part, the uh, hippocampus will resemble like a seahorse and it will be bordering the medial part of the lateral ventricle. And going further posteriorly, you can, uh, I mean, if you go inferiorly in the axial sections, you will identify the fusiform gyrus. Sagittal sections are very, very important if, because the most of the medial structures, most of the basic temporal structures are not visible on the axial and the coronal sections. So I am just trying to show the fusiform gyrus, which is very important as we go further into the functions of the brain. But not only gyri, white matter is becoming more and more important to understand the functions. So human connectome project is about all this only. So you can see that the temporal lobe, the important connections which you should know is uncinate fasciculus. So how the frontal lobe is getting all the information from your sensory input, it has to be, it goes to the uh, amygdala, the hippocampus, and again, there is a connection to the basic temporal lobe. So your motivation, your emotional aspect of your learning is through this uncinate fasciculus. Another important is inferior longitudinal fasciculus. And here it plays a role because it connects temporal lobe with the occipital lobe. So the visual information goes through the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the temporal lobe is processing it by its previous memories. Important cingulate. Cingulate is another important white matter structure which connects the various parts of the limbic lobe, which I will be elaborating later. So you can remind me five minutes before so that. Uh... <clears throat>
coming to the clinical science, I will only concentrate on the three important things. One is processing of the auditory information. There is other, another sensory information, which is olfactory, which is important, but I am not going into the details of that. Second will be the visual pathway, that is the ward pathway, which is coming from the occipital lobe to the basic temporal lobe. And third, most important is the temporal lobe as part of the limbic lobe. So the auditory information, whatever you are getting through the cochlea, it uh, along the cochlea now, again, it uh, decussates at the level of uh, trapezoid body. And after that, it through the auditory radiation, it reaches the bilateral auditory cortex, which is the transverse temporal gyre. Once it reaches there, what is the function? The function is you are aware of the auditory stimuli, what you are receiving. So you are, uh, I am able to see that the, I am able to see the frequency, the pitch of the sound and from where it is coming. That is the function of the primary auditory cortex. The cortex which is adjacent to the primary auditory cortex is the auditory association. That is the posterior part of middle temporal gyrus. This gyrus is important because it helps in understanding the sound. So whatever information you're getting to your brain now, you are localizing that I am talking. And then if you are analyzing, by your previous knowledge. Previous knowledge, you are analyzing that sound and the, you are creating an understanding of the sound, what you are receiving. Whereas Wernicke's area, so what you, may, you must be confused. What is the difference between association cortex and the Wernicke's area? So Wernicke's area not only connects with the auditory cortex, it also gets information from the visual. So you are able to see the vision, visual stimuli you are also able to ex understand the person's expression. All those things will go into the Wernicke's area and you will be able to comprehend what we are speaking. So if I am giving a three-stage command, you will be able to comprehend because you are the information is going and again it is getting analyzed in the association and again it is going to the Wernicke's area where it is finally getting comprehended. And this Wernicke's area, of course, most important structure which connects to Broca's is the arcuate fasciculus. So this is called as perisylvan language network area. So understanding of this area is important because this on the dominant side, sometimes it can become the eloquent cortex. So coming to the uh, limbic system, this is a little complex system to understand. Uh, but what you can see that uh, limbic system is in the medial most part of the hemisphere. So how it causes, what are the important structure in the limbic system? The important structure is the olfactory system. Why olfactory system is important? Whatever smells you are, uh, so olfactory system was very dominant in the animals, but slowly as the humans in evolve, the other sensory system like auditory, as well as the visual became more dominant and the olfactory has come down, but it still plays a major role in your emotional as well as your basic instinct responses. So this olfactory stimulation goes to the uncus and from the uncus it goes to the parahippocampal gyrus, which again acts as a olfactory association areas. Along with that, you have amygdala and the hippocampus as well as the cingulate cortex and the anterior body of the thalamus. So what is papus circuit? So papus circuit is so, Two important functions of limbic lobe is emotional responses and the memory. For memory, papus circuit is important because whatever information you are getting now, it will be reverberating in the papus circuit. And repeatedly, if it reverberates in the uh, if it reverberates in the papus circuit, it gets consolidated. And once it gets consolidated, it is stored in the lateral temporal cortex as well as in the frontal cortex. So this white matter, uh, so what happens if there is a damage to the limbic lobe? So main important is amygdala is mainly for your emotion and behavior. So if you are feeling fear, anger, rage or sadness, all this is because of your amygdala is functioning. Once your amygdala is damaged, your emotional responses will become uh, placid, means they will not, you will not have any response. So you will become more uh, non-reactionary. Behavior. So the basic behavior of the human being, if you are sad, you will not, because it will be getting connected to the thalamus, you will not feel hungry. 
So all this because of the connections between the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So this, this is important. Limbic lobe is important because it helps in understanding the epilepsy. The RS which you get in temporal lobe, the most common are the abdominal rising sensation, the fear, uh, are all because of the amygdala involvement. And autonomic RS, like you are getting uh, palpitations, all those is because it is connected to the insula also. And of, of course, olfactory RS can also come times uh, when there is involvement of the uncus. So when uh, in, the, in a case of monkey, if you remove two amygdala, what happens? It will develop placidity, hypersexuality, hyperphagia, and amnesia. But you don't get Kluver BC syndrome in normal clinical settings. What you get is uh, because of involvement of biological temporal lobe because of multiple diseases. For neurosurgery, it is most happens if there is a biological temporal contusions. Mm -hmm. Coming to the last, uh, that is the visual processing. So whatever information you have got through the visual cortex, there are two pathways which you should know, what pathway and where pathway. What pathway is the one where the temporal lobe plays a major role. So what pathway means, whatever you are seeing, so uh, uh, what is it? How are you seeing? What? Uh, suppose you are reading this uh, picture. How are you identifying that what is this? This is because of your old memories which are stored in the temporal lobe. So that once the information goes to the temporal association areas, it will process. And the main area is the fusiform gyrus. So it is important to know about the fusiform gyrus. It's in the basic temporal lobe bordered by the parahippocampal gyrus on the medial side and laterally by the inferior temporal gyrus. This fusiform gyrus, what is its main function? Its function is processing of color information, processing of face and object recognition, word recognition. So you are able to read because of this uh, fusiform gyrus and also different category identification. So lesions of fusiform gyrus, especially bilateral, causes face blindness, that is prosopognosia. They can also cause dyslexia in early, if it is early onset, and they can also cause dysphasia if later on fusiform gyrus has been operated. So the third language area is supposed to be in the basic temporal lobe on the left side. And in epilepsy, fusiform uh, epilepsy is usually cause formed visual hallucinations. To summarize, temporal lobe is the seat for emotion, learning, behavior, it has important association cortices for auditory, visual, and olfactory stimulus. There are eloquent cortex in hippocampus, primary auditory cortex, and one key area. And understanding, of course, is important because it gives an idea of your localization and lateralization. Thank you. Any clarifications or comments? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we will have a parietal lobe clinical science anatomy, anatomical and physiological basis by Dr. Subhash Kaul. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Manas, for involving us, and uh, I welcome all the young uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists. Dr. Shastri, thank you so much. Um, parietal lobe basically deals with sensation. It's the highest sensory uh, part in our brain, and you can see post-central gyrus. So it will receive sensations and touch proprioception, these two. But to make sense of that touch and proprioception, you need association areas. And these are the association areas, supramarginal gyrus and superior parietal lobule. And with this, we make sense of whatever sensations we are feeling. But what is important to know is that these sensations are represented on the sensory homunculus, which is on the right side. And you can see on this homunculus, each part of the body has got a different representation. For instance, leg has got this much of representation. Hand has got very big representation because hand has so much of sensory input and we do so much things with our hand. So hand has got huge, face has got, you know, face has got almost one and a half times representation than 
rest of the body, then trunk and all. Tongue has got a representation. Teeth have got representation. So this depends upon how much of the sensitivity that particular organ has. And you will realize it when you check for two-point discrimination. So if you take fingertips, you can detect even two millimeters change there. But if you take your trunk, even two centimeters also, you may not be able to know. It all depends upon the representation of the homunculus, how much of uh, neurons are represented there. Now, the functions of parietal lobe is that primary somatosensory cortex, which I showed, uh, receives information from the body about proprioception and touch. And the rest of the parietal lobe is composed of association areas, which can be unimodal or multimodal. Multimodal means that they can get information from vision, from memory, from past experience. Then the association uh, sensory information makes sense of what they are perceiving. Now, there is a network connectivity principle, which is now the hot topic at this time in neurosciences, in which they say that everything is happening simultaneously. You know, it's not that previously we used to think that first a vision comes, then it goes by the optic now, then it goes to the radiation. It's not like that. Everything is happening simultaneously. And that is the concept of the uh, net default network and connectome and all that thing. And now there are got huge computational neuroscience which study this. So if you see this, this shows you that there is a, all the sensations are coming to the thalamus and from thalamus, these sensations are simultaneously, bidirectionally going to the parietal lobe, both and they check the position, distance, size, orientation, velocity, simultaneously, thalamus is sending it to motor targets also, to basal ganglia also, simultaneously data from the medial temporal lobe is coming into the thalamus to make sense of what he's realizing. This is the network connectivity of brain and this huge topic. But as students of neurology and neurosurgery, there is no need of dwelling too much on it because it's a subject on its own. Basically, we are talking about the conventional ways of testing the parietal lobe function in which we test those functions which are common to both parietal lobes and then those which are for left parietal lobe and finally those which are for right parietal lobe. Now, first thing in parietal lobe is to check cortical sensor. And this you have to do for all patients. Stereognosis, which is able to recognize and identify objects by feeling them like a coin, right, or like a pen. And it has to be done on both sides. It has a lateralizing value. Graphesthesia, make something on the palm of the patient like eight or zero or one. Again, it has a lateralizing value. Both lobes are responsible for this. Two-point discrimination, which is ability to recognize simultaneous stimulation by two blunt points, which you must be doing. Again, it has a lateralizing value. And then sensory attention in which you give two simultaneous stimuli, touch both sides, and if there is a disease in one of the parietal lobes, he will uh, extinguish the side which is opposite to the disease side. So these four are must, and these have to be done in all patients on both sides for checking the uh, parietal lobe function. Now we'll go to the left parietal lobe. Now left parietal lobe, the most important function is apraxia. And apraxia means inability to do a function in the absence of any other neurological deficit. If they have a neurological deficit, then don't do this test, particularly in exam, because you will not have so much of time. But if a patient is having normal power, normal sensation, normal cognition, only then, which is very rare actually, but only then you will be able to test for apraxia. Now, this is the most fascinating subject in neurosciences, this apraxia, because most of the the moments, routine moments which we are doing, they are already embedded in our brain. They are called moment formulas because we have learned them since childhood. How to pick up a cup of tea, we don't think about it. It's there, we just pick it up. This is in terms of a formula in the brain. It's called moment formula or praxicon, right? They are embedded there. Most, you know, musicians, cricket players, all those things, they, they, those formulas are embedded there because of constant practice. So what happens is that when there is a verbal input, let me say that somebody tells me, lift that cup of tea. So I understand verbal semantics. So what does cup mean, right? So immediately I have to go to the temporal lobe. It automatically happens. And then the temporal lobe connects with the parietal lobe in which there are those moment formulas or praxicon, and then it gives commands to the left supplementary motor area, and then right limb does the action. And it also, through corpus callosum, can go to the other side. But all this happens within microseconds. You don't have to think about it. But this is the concept of apraxia, that if something is wrong with the parietal lobe, he will not be able to do the action. 
even though there is no motor deficit, even though there is no sensory deficit, because there's a problem with the movement formula in the parietal lobe. Now, so, so for checking the uh, apraxia, ask the patient to pantomime, means to do it. And it's called two types of pantomime. One is trans, uh, transitive, one is intransitive. Transitive means which is done with the action of a tool. So remember that T for transitive, T for tool. Means show me how you comb your hair. You don't have to give him a comb initially, but you have to see his concept. Is he able to hold the comb? Show me how you brush your teeth. It's called transitive. So check the action with the imaginary tools. Imaginary tools. Show me how you will comb, brush teeth. Observe how the patient holds a tool and use it. Observe the precision timing and location of movement. Okay. And uh, commonly observed error is that you ask the patient to comb he is not able to conceptualize the calm. He will do with his hand like this. This is a common body tool defect. And I'll show you some videos. Uh, show me how you calm your hair. Don't worry about the language. Just language. So she's bombing, which is wrong. Okay. So this is, as you can see, she is not able to hold the comb. Okay. Now, the second thing is that then you, if, if the patient is not able to do it, then you, to help her further, you give her an actual tool. You can give her a comb and do it. Some people will be able to do it, but some people will not be able to do it, even with the tool. So this... So that only shows you grades of apraxia. Apraxia is not all on it. Apraxia also has got five, six grades, depending on how much of damage is there. So this lady is asked to cut something with a scissor, and she's not able to do it. Finally, the scissor is got, and she said, okay, take the scissor, now you cut it. Now see how clumsy she will do. The word is clumsy. <laughs> She doesn't know what it is, even though power is good. So even with the actual tools, she can't get the hold of it. Okay. Then, so after transient, you do intransitive, right? Which means only with gestures, with waving goodbye, salute. Observe the responses. Observe the response, the content of the action. When asked to do the salute, she may do something else. Now, if she's not able to do it, now you perform. Initially, you only tell her, do salute. If she doesn't understand, then you do the salute. So that you see to what extent, to what grade she is disabled. Now, this is the example of intransitive or gestural function. She's doing namaste. She can't do it. She can't even copy. She's clueless. She can't do bye-bye. Okay. Now, uh, these are all called ideational apraxias. Ideational thing, when you do only one, th no, ideomotor. What I showed you was ideomotor. Ideomotor means that when you are only ask her to do one thing, like saluting, right? Or like using a scissor. Then the after ideomotor is ideational. In ideational, you give her a series of things, right? You know, like putting a letter into an envelope, right? Or showing how one smokes a cigarette, taking a cigarette, taking a match. That's called ideational. So that the conceptualization and carrying it out. It is ideal motor, but in a sequence in which two, three things are connected. So this is the inability to conceptualize a task. So I'll show you the example of this also through a video. She's asked to open the lock with the key. She's asked to open the lock with the key. Now she holds the lock and doesn't know what to do with it. The key is also there. But she can't make the sense of the lock. Just clueless. Key is there. He's, he's pointing also. 
such a simple thing she has to do. Just put the key into the lock. See the clumsiness. Okay. Now, uh, now after this ideational and ideomotor apraxia, one component of apraxia testing is to give patients some meaningless gestures also. Those are learnt movements. Those they have learnt over time. Now we have to see the capacity of a person to learn new things, whether they can do something or not. Now this is not, all those were left hemispherical functions. This meaningless gesture is left as well as right because space is involved here. So you give her meaningless gestures, ask her to do like this. Ask her to show a thumb, just to see whether she can comprehend what you have to do because she has not learned this. This is unlearned. This is to test the new, but this is part of apraxia testing. First give meaningful, learn, and then as one test, you give her meaningless gestures. Ability to copy meaningless gestures. Normal person should be able to do that. Now, this is our very good friend, Dr. Madhusudan. He's a master of clinical neurology. I'm sure you must have attended his lectures. He has made a test for apraxia screening in which quickly you go through all this in two minutes. You will see it's in, it's in uh, Malayalam, but don't worry about the language. It's a neurological language. He will tell her to salute. He will tell her to do namaste. Then he will give her a pen and ask him to write it all within two minutes. Apraxia screening by Dr. Madhusudan, the master teacher. He's asking him to go. Only Dr. Nair understands the language in this call. He's repeating the So anyway, now after this, so, so you got the concept of apraxias, right? Ideational, ideomotor and meaningless gestures, apraxia screening. Now we go to specific syndromes. On the left side, there's a famous syndrome called Gerstmann syndrome. And Gerstmann syndrome is because of the damage to the angular, angular gyrus, which is behind the somatocentric cortex. It's one of the association areas which coordinates and you know combines the activity from visual area, from spatial area. And when there is a damage to that left side, the angular gyrus, Patient has got a combination of finger agnosia, right to left confusion, agraphia, acalculia. So as a matter of routine, you should do this. Ask him to uh, show his finger, where is the pinky, where is the thumb of one side. Then right to left, is you can uh, ask him, touch your left ear with your right hand, touch your right hand with your left, just to check whether he's oriented in this. This should be done quickly. Ask him to write something and give him simple calculation, 10 plus 10, 20. There are no hard and fast rules, but it should be done. The examiner should be told that there is no Gerstmann syndrome. He'll be impressed that you know about the subject. And this is the left parietal lobe. Now, right parietal lobe is also very fascinating. Right parietal lobe. Right parietal lobe has to do all with the visuospatial orientation. You know, our understanding of our environment is very important. What is on me? Like I'm speaking at this time to you, but I know on right side, there's a monitor. On left side, Dr. Shastri is sitting here in the front row. It is in my background. So this visual spatial orientation is very important. And this visual spatial orientation extends from the environment to our own self also. That my right hand, my left hand, this is all non-dominant or right parietal lobe. And another thing is that the right parietal lobe gives to both sides. It controls both sides of the atmosphere, whereas the left does only on one side. So the result of it is that when you have got a left-sided damage, 
you know, you will not find any hemi neglect because the right side is still controlling it. But when you have got the right side, you will have the left side in neglect. So that's important. Now, this neglecting of the atmosphere or the surrounding is okay. But to that group, when it becomes more, you neglect even your whole part of the body. You will not know that your left side of the body is existing also. And that's called anosognosia. So the patients will say, I don't have any problem, even though his left uh, his side will be totally hemiplegic. And this is a right hemispherical dysfunction. So just remember, right side has to do with the visual spatial function. And how we test it in the clinic is by asking the patient to make a clock and he will completely neglect the left side, only right side he will make. Similarly, house you ask him to make, he will make only half house and half vertical house will be absent. You can give him anything. You can give him a plant. He will make only one half of the plant and left side. And in the day to day life, the attendants, the family will tell you when he's eating food, he's eating food only from one side of the thali. Other side of the thali, he doesn't even touch. But in the exam, you have to draw it like this. There are any number of tests, but you can choose three or four tests. But the basic idea is that he will neglect one side of the world, right? Including himself. And line bisection test, this is normal. You have to do in the center and see he's doing here. Because for him, that left side doesn't exist at all. Now, again, another thing on the right side, so far we said visual function, uh, visual spatial. Another thing of the right side, which is again related to visual spatial, is ability to construct a thing. So they have lost the ability to conceptualize, to construct a thing. And again, there are 100 tests to check. You can ask them to make a house, but usually we ask them to make a three-dimensional thing because construction is about three-dimensional. And this is part of your MOCA. All the neurosurgeons should have this. This is freely available. This page, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, MOCA test, because it has sample of all the functions, including parietal function. And in the MOCA, you can, they are asked to copy this cube. And this cube, what we are basically, this cube, we are testing a right parietal function, three-dimensional square, right? So construction and another important apraxia of right side is dressing apraxia. And this is with which patients of Alzheimer's or patients of stroke, often the family says he's not able to wear the clothes, even though he's, because he has lost the capacity of the visual spatial aspect of wearing the clothes. That also needs some visual spatial that I have to put my sleeve from this side, I have to put my leg into this trouser on this side. It needs a lot of visual spatial. It's called dressing apraxia. And you can see dressing apraxia is inability to dress. Patients put clothes in the wrong order. They may put socks on over their shoes. Patients may put legs into sleeves and arms into trousers. And this is happening. You will see these patients if you pay little attention to them. This is again a right uh, parietal dysfunction. Now the last is complex visual perception. From the striate cortex, from the occipital cortex, there are two streams which go into our consciousness. One is the ventral stream, which goes into the temporal lobe. One is the dorsal stream, which goes into the parietal lobe. And the dorsal stream is mainly about visual spatial, right? And the ventral stream is mainly about the past vision, past memories and all. So we are concerned here about the occipital parietal which selectively processes visual spatial function, location of object, motion of object, reaching the object. The example in the real world, I can give you a snake somewhere. He sees a snake. This is visual vision. Then he sees how away the snake is from me. Then he sees whether the snake is dead or it is coming towards me. And based on that, he'll be afraid. He will sweat a lot. There's something called mirror neurons in the brain. You know, immediately he will respond what I should do. And that depends upon the occipital parietal to the dorsal stream from the vision, how it is connected to the parietal lobe. And when there is a damage of both of these, which happens sometimes in strokes usually, then you get a syndrome called Balint syndrome, which is because of the damage of both occipital parietal areas. It has three components. <clears throat> One is simultagnosia, in which you are not able to comprehend the whole thing. So if I have simultagnosia at this time, I'll see only Dr. Suchenda and everything else will not be visible to me because the surroundings are gone. Only I can see only this central or Dr. Nair. That's all. That happens in simultagnosia. But otherwise, we have to, the real person has to know everything, whatever is happening around. This disease is called simultagnosia. Second is there's a disturbance in visually guided eye movements. It's called ocular motor apraxia. That means they will not be able to do saccadic motion. They will not be able to look like this, like this. They move their whole head, right? So they have lost the capacity to do saccades. It's called oculomotor apraxia. And the clinical sign for this is 
had thrusts. It usually happens in children. They look like this, like this, like this. Because every time they cannot move their eyes, they have to move their head. This is called ocular apraxia. It's a component of balance syndrome. Balance syndrome will come as a short note to you. And third is optic ataxia. Optic ataxia also is very fascinating. It is not a cerebellar dysfunction. Optic ataxia is a parental lobe dysfunction in which you cannot do any movement which is driven by your eyes because there's a problem with the dorsal stream. The dorsal stream is not working properly. So he, the patient asks, touch my finger. The moment she looks at the finger of the examiner, she will not be able to touch it because the dorsal stream is defected. On the other hand, you ask her to touch her own nose, she will touch her own nose because that is driven by proprioception. She doesn't have to look at her nose. She knows it is there, she will do it. But anything which is visually driven, they will not be able to do it. Many times in this, we ask the patient to close the eyes and then do, after closing the eyes, they are able to reach by approximating where is the, or by sound, they get clues from the sound. It's called optic ataxia. So Banning syndrome is a combination of simultagnosia, oculomotor apraxia, optic ataxia, Cookie and the jar picture is very famous in which a person is asked to say what is happening in the hole. So you're supposed to say there's a lady there, she's cleaning dishes, boys are, you know, stealing cookies from it. The whole thing they have to say. Now, there are Indian versions of it also, but this is good enough. Cookie and the jar to check simultagnosia. And this is the last video, again, borrowed from Dr. Madhu, example of optic ataxia. Optic ataxia is usually bilateral, usually, but sometimes it can be unilateral. And you will see how on one side, on right side, she has difficulty in reaching. Left side, she does reasonably well. This is the last video. So, in summary, parietal lobe is the highest center for sensory perception. Along with association area, it makes sense of those sensations, right? So, whether a rounded thing is an apple or it's a cricket ball or it's a tennis ball, that is because of association area and the somatosensory. Both hemispheres control graphesthesia and stereognosis. They have a localizing value. But ideational and ideomotor apraxia are left parietal functions. Visuospatial orientation is a right parietal function. Now, you know, all these things are being challenged these days. If you read some new books, they will say, no, there is no lateralization, everything. But forget about that. That's at a research level. At our level, we have to remember this. Visual special orientation is right parietal function. Gerstmann syndrome is due to left parietal lobe dysfunction, angular gyrus. And Belint syndrome is due to bilateral parietal lobe dysfunction. Thank you very much. Now it's time to... Yeah, that's right. That's right. He won't be able to do the first step only. Yeah. Correct, sir. Now it's time to know how much we have retained. And uh, so there will be an MCQ uh, quiz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, chairpersons. We are moving on to the next stage. I, I request all, uh, at least senior uh, people or faculty, to come to the front chair so that there will be some chairs for the students. Or students can occupy the first chair. Please, all of you, come to the first so that people can sit. Sandeep and Dr. Babs. Uh, thank you, chairpersons. For... I also thank all the speakers. Now we are moving on to the MCQ test. Meanwhile, let's prepare uh, download the steps we need on the skill. I would request Dr. Baras to onto the stage. I would request Manasa to come onto the stage to give token of appreciation to the chairpersons.
Thank you, chairpersons. I would also request uh, Dr. Pravin Yadav sir come onto the stage to take memento for your time. So meanwhile, all the participants, please do download it. I'm sorry about it. Next Sir, I would request Dr. Ishwar Sir to moderate the MCQ test. Good morning, everyone. And uh, just as there are speed breakers on the highways, we have sleep breakers with these MCQ questions. You couldn't hear that? Well, this is a sleep breaker, breaker session for you. Uh, I hope everybody has downloaded this app into your uh, uh, mobile phones. Um, the procedure is I'll run the questions for you and you can choose the best choice out of the four sequences that are given. Okay, here we go. Shall we start? Can all of you open your Google and type kahoot.it? Yes, I will do it again. Uh, no, please type kahoot.it in here. Yeah. Kahoot.it in and then there's the game pin. All of you have joined. Please enter your name and all of you have to enter your name. Yeah. Uh, how, many, how many people have registered? Uh, how many people have registered in the counter? Do we know. Do you know how many have found registered? Uh, this is all all online also they can do. Plus whoever are here. Uh, how many how many have registered? Can somebody here? Yeah. No, no, but I just want to so that I know. How many have checked in so that we know how all have entered the name also? 87, 89. Uh, we had 160 registrations, at least we should reach 120 here. And the number of seats are 150, so 98 still people have not done. All of you have to do. You will not get certificate without that. If your name is not there, certificate will not be given. <laughs> 108, yes, we still have. So, uh, yeah, 113. Once you reach 120, we'll start. Okay, wait. Okay. I'll tell. I'll tell. I, I, has anybody any problem in downloading Kahoot? Uh, can you raise hands or all of you could do? You could not do? You have uh, your internet connection is okay? Yeah. Anyone else uh, who has problems? Please uh, ask your neighbor, they will help you. You could get it or check your internet connects. Uh, yeah, it's 125. We'll start. Yeah. Yeah. And all of you, please enter game pin number. Okay. Yeah, we'll start. The participants are recommended to use their mobile data instead of the Wi-Fi because it affects the speed of it. Please remember, it's the fastest finger first. Okay, here we go. Uh, the marks are not only that correct, but the fastness also. So if somebody does it faster, he gets like one or two points higher. So that's how it is scored. So, so yes, no, no, not after each session. But after each session, we can clap for them. Session one, quiz one. Okay, right. Here we go. The famous railroad worker whose accident helped us in learning about the frontal lobe was. 
Louis Gehrig, Phineas Gage, O. Henry, and Stephen Hawking. I think it's a sitter, the famous railroad worker whose accident helped us in learning about the front lobe. Fine, good. Still, there are people who haven't got it right. Should I spell out the answer now? No. no. Yeah, I can tell the answer. No, sir. Later, later. No, after each one, the answer is. Who said Who said this question? The answer is displayed now after each. Answer is right. After each question, the correct answer will be displayed. Okay, fine. Yeah. So All right. So, yeah. Question number two. Uh, yeah, the, you uh, can see there the is a right tick mark. Orange yeah. one, Phineas Gage. He was a railroad worker and uh, uh, a kind of sharp instrument has been stuck in. I think the image was shown, the picture was shown by Dr. Yada in his presentation, which I'm sure many of you must have missed it in the morning. Like, next question. Okay. This is the scorecard. The fastest was Arshu. Next, Arshu. next. Okay. Which slope or its part appears as a thumb on MRI? It's the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, the orbital frontal gyrus, the parietal lobe. So which lobe or its part appears as a thumb on MRI? Okay. Fine. Who got it right first? Again, Akshub. Fine. Congrats, Akshub. You have the fastest finger. <laughs> Okay, question number three. Which of the following is not a competent guest man syndrome? Okay. Finger agnosia, right, left. Disorientation, agraphia, alexia. Uh, finger agnosia, right, left. Disorientation, agraphia, alexia. Oh, 104 got it right. Okay, and who was the fastest? Again, Archub. Congrats, Archub, again. Okay, so we go to the next question. All the are components of the prefrontal cortex except all are components of the prefrontal cortex except medial prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, paracentral lobule, and orbitofrontal cortex. Okay, eight, nine, if only 15 got it right. So begin. Oh, this is Pooja Salunkir who beat all the men. Fine. All right. We go to the next question, question number five. Prosopognosia. Prosopognosia is due to lesions of the following gyrus. Supra-marginal gyrus, lingual gyrus, endorhinal cortex, fusiform gyrus. Okay, prosopognosia. Okay, 58, got it right. Fusiform gyrus is the answer. And I don't know who this is. They have some acronym for yeah. themselves. Yeah, at the end, we can ask them to identify them. Who is this? A-P-R-C-H. After 15 questions. After the question. Okay, After the first one. Okay, the next question. Sixth question. Optic ataxia occurs due to, because of dysfunction of which of the following structures? Uh, optic nerve, cerebellum, parietal lobe, oculomotor. That's a sitter. <laughs> okay, optic nerve, cerebellum, parietal lobe, oculomotor. We had a beautiful video. And okay, so Dr. Okay. Call is a good teacher. Time. Again, okay, APRPH. Okay, shall we go to the next question? Seven out of 14. The inability to initiate movement is called as akinesia, bradykinesia, rigidity, gegen halton. The inability to initiate movement is called as akinesia, bradykinesia, rigidity, gegen halton. Okay. Fine. No, no, let's have the answer first. Okay. Fine. Again, this unnamed person is getting it right. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Eighth question. Inner GPS of the brain come, consists of inner GPS, uh, place cells and grid cells, bed cells and place cells, place cells and microglia, and none of the above. I think that was a tough one for me. <laughs> yeah, I think it was not mentioned in the morning. <laughs> okay. The answer is play cells and bridge cells. Okay, thank you. Who got it right? 
again, IPR just gets it right. Okay. Okay, ninth question. Kluver Busi syndrome is characterized by all except hypersexuality, visual agnosia, aggression, and amnesia. Hypersexuality, visual agnosia, aggression, and amnesia. Fine, aggression. Okay, all right. Fine. How many got it right? 68. Again, this name, no, this time, Japs beat others. Japs beat others. Okay. Now, the 10th question. Verbal memory is localized to, verbal memory is localized to, the right temporal lobe, left temporal lobe, bilateral temporal lobe, none of the above. Okay. Yeah, the left temporal lobe. I think again that was again a sitter. Okay. How many got it right? Jabs that does it again. We go. Eleventh question. The ability to remember a ten digit phone number of for a small period of time is called as the ability to remember ten digit phone number for a small period of time is called as mental flexibility, fluency, set shifting, working memory. Okay, everybody got it right. I think that was again an easy one. Okay, Jabs, Jabs gets it right. Okay, let's move on to the 12th question. The false statement about a person with pure word deafness. False statement about a person with pure word deafness. Person can hear the sounds, person can write, person can hear music, person can speak normally. Fine, all right. Person cannot speak normally. That is the answer for it. Let's see who got jabs again. Jabs got it first. Okay. The penultimate question in this round. Which of the following apraxia refers to inability to correctly order sequence, order bar sequence, a series of movements to achieve a goal? Ideomotor apraxia, ideational apraxia, limb kinetic apraxia, conceptual apraxia. Which of the following apraxias refers to inability to correctly order sequence, series of movements? I think everyone got it right. Okay. Fine. Ideational apraxia, that's the answer. Again, Japs gets it right. All right. So the last question in this round, which of the following is not a component of balance room? This was the last thing that was taught today morning. Optic ataxia, simultagnesia, oculomotor apraxia, and homonymous hemianopia. Optic ataxia, simultagnesia, oculomotor apraxia, and homonymous hemianopia. I think the answer is homonymous hemianopia. And uh, I think that's the end of the first session. Okay, well, 9705. I, I think now we can ask them to identify uh, who is Dr. Pooja Salonke. Is he here? Okay, congrats. And you are from? It's Hinduja, Mumbai. And then Jabs. Dr. SMR. <laughs> Cheating Jabs. <laughs> okay, you're not allowed then. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, and Dr. SMR. Okay. Oh, oh, congrats. Congratulations. Thank you. So you have to maintain this till end of the Thank session till tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. We move on to the next one. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, we are moving on to the next speaker, sir. Now, after the quiz competition, let's move on to the scientific program. Yeah, but then you should have told who is the fourth person. Ajay, who is the fourth person? Because we disqualified Jabin. Fourth? Who is the fourth? We at least we should applaud him. Okay. The software tells only three, yeah, not five. Only three. Okay. Now I'll request Dr. Kapila to come and speak on hospital lobes. Dr. APRCH, who is Dr. APR? C H. Not there. One. Minute. Okay.
Pathari. Is Dr. Pathari there, fifth person? Okay, also online, no? Should I be starting, sir? Should I be starting, sir? A very good morning to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Manas, Dr. Suchanda, for having me here. And believe me, it's very difficult to speak after Dr. Paul. All these three talks were amazing. So that you forgot what Dr. Paul said only temporarily. Just let's have a look at something. Think there's anything that will get doctors in the same room as. What are you doing? Dr. Nothing. Hulse. I think you all have seen Dr. House at some time. Heard about him. Yes. And then Dr. Hulse and just in front of this boy. I saw you leaving last Tuesday. So, I mean, if anybody of you can tell me what was the syndrome which was going on, that's the visual symptom. So, Dr. House just is appeared to that boy transiently. He gets up. He walks through the room, but is not seen by the boy. So, basically, the boy could not appreciate moving Dr. House. He could just see a static Dr. House. Anyone? You get a chocolate extra? A loud noise? So, this is a kinetopsia. A kinetopsia. What did you say? This is what you said? No, this is not Anton's. We'll read about it. So I'm happy we start on a good note. We start on House's note. And let's see what we have in store in occipital lobe. So this occipital lobe is the smallest of all four lobes. You know about this anatomy better than me. Very quickly, you have a superior, middle, and inferior occipital gyrus, which you see on the lateral view. Very quickly, in medial view is where the occipital lobe is most beautifully assessed. You draw a line just following parietal occipital uh, sulcus or fissure and the line uh, just extends further and gives you this occipital lobe. Between the parieto occipital lobe and the other sulcus which is the calcarine sulcus, you have this cuneus. Below that you have a lingual gyrus and as told by Dr. Jabin in inferior, in the temporal lobe, you have this collateral sulcus dividing and where uh, this, this sulcus into two halves. So lingual gyrus continues as the parahippocampal. You can see over here parahippocampal gyrus and the fusiform gyrus. Moving on from here, this is the uh, this is a small picture, just uh, highlighting what I said earlier. And just to highlight a small thing on the axial view, the lingual gyrus continues as the parahippocampal and the fusiform gyrus, and the functions are interconnected. Very quickly, small note on the radiology. So it's very difficult to localize occipital lobe on axial images. Very difficult to know about the lesions which are there when the MRI is presented. So just so that you remember, do uh, focus on the occipital horns of the lateral ventricle. Do compare it with the sagittal uh, image uh, of the MRI. And what you can see over here is the parietal occipital sulcus at the level of this occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. And at the level of midbrain, you can see over here, you see what is the calcarine sulcus. So most of it is a pair, is you can see on the sagittal images, because this is how conventional occipital lobe has been taught to us. So we all know that the pole of the brain, the, the, the last pole of the brain is the occipital lobe. We all know that this is the striate cortex. And as we move ahead, we enter into the parietal and below we enter into the temporal cortex. And this is where the role of association areas come. I'll be talking, I'll be entering into parietal and temporal lobe one by one as we go further. The most of the occipital cortex, the functional occipital cortex can be seen in the medial side. And that's where we have the striate cortex, which is beautifully arranged along around the calcarine sulcus. And it is in the length and the depth of this calcarine sulcus is where our visual system, it exists. Around this striate cortex, we have an extra striate cortex, also known as para or peristriate cortex. And let's see how they look like. So this is just a handmade diagram. You can note over here, again, lateral surface, medial surface. The pink one is the uh, calcarine, uh, is the striate cortex. And this blue and green one is the extra striate cortex. So let me move from here. Just a small short note on the historical aspect. Why is this cortex known as, why is the visual cortex known as the striate cortex? It's because of this stria, this white line, if you can appreciate over here, which is nothing but the myelinated exons coming from the optic radiations, landing up into the layer core of the occipital cortex, giving this white appearance. It is also known as calcarine cortex. Why? because of the terminology borrowed from calcium. So calcium, white, white calcarine. So calcarine cortex or striate cortex. Moving ahead. 
quick note on the blood supply of the occipital cortex. So you have posterior cerebral artery supplying the occipital cortex. It goes along these both sulci, the parieto occipital sulci, giving the branch of ox parieto occipital branch of the PCA. And you have the other branch, which is entering the calcarine sulcus, giving the calcarine branch of the posterior cerebral artery. Remember one important note that though occipital cortex is primarily supplied by posterior cerebral artery, important thing over here to know is that the pole may also be supplied by the middle cerebral artery, hence leading this pole to become a watershed area. So these are the two arteries which are converging and supplying the occipital pole. This is important because of the functional anatomy. So let's directly jump on to the visual cortex, which we all know occipital lobe. Where is it needed? It's needed for our vision. Vision where? Along the, around the calcarine sulcus. As I told you, it's in the length and the depth of the calcarine sulcus where this primary visual cortex is situated. Remember one thing, that this particular calcarine or the striate cortex is highly retinotopic in its organization. It means it directly follows the instructions of the retina, which means that the central retinal fibers, the macular retinal fibers, the fibers which help us see the central 10 degrees of vision are located in the pole. This is where the, these fibers will be located. Remember that the peripheral retinal fibers, the peripheral vision is located where? In the depth of the calcarine sulcus, which is here, area 4. Remember that the upper bank of the calcarine sulcus represents the upper retinal fibers and the upper retinal fibers they represent the lower visual field and vice versa, which means that the lower calcarine, the lower bank of the calcarine uh, sulcus represent the lower retinal fibers, which mean the upper field. So why is it important? It's important because this is what we get as questions and this is what we get to see in our patients. So if the damage is involving the entire, the cortex, the occipital cortex, where will be the damage? The damage will be in the opposite side of the visual field which means if the damage is in the left occipital cortex, you're going to get a contralateral congruent homonemous hemianopia on the, on, the, on the right side. Absolutely. So it's the contralateral. What does congruent means? Congruent means that it is exactly the same, point by point. It's same. Homonemous means it's on the same side. What if the damage is in the superior bank or the upper bank of the calcarine cortex? Where will be the damage? The damage will be down. So the damage will be inferior quadrant anopia. What if the inferior calcarine uh, sulcus is involved? Inferior bank is involved. You'll, you're going to get a superior quadrant anopia. Absolutely. And what if the damage is at the pole only involving the only involving the posterior cerebral artery? The pole will be spared because middle cerebral artery will still be uh, spared. And this is what you are going to get, a keyhole defect. So you'll get a vision where only a key is spared, half the key is spared, the center vision is spared, and the rest of the part of the field is defective, a C-shaped defect. So now, this example quickly, 70 years old male wakes up with decreased vision from the right side. You see this field. So where should be the deficit? The deficit should be in the posterior cerebral artery area, which means middle cerebral artery is spared, which means the pole is spared, and here you have the MRI. Look at it. The pole is spare. The second example. Now, 45 years old lady, again, gets vision loss after cardiac arrest, after hypoperfusion, and is still bumping into objects, but is not the, 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 the doctor who's examining, can't make out the visual field effect on concentration. Why? Because only a small area in the center is defective. Why? Because only the pole of the occipital core is affected, which means the defect is in the watershed territory, the, both the hypoperfusion has caused the defect uh, in both the circulation. So again, the same thing, homonymous hemianopia, both the uh, banks of calcarine sulcus are involved. You get a superior quadrant anopia, the inferior bank of the calcarine sulcus is involved, and you get a inferior quadrant anopia, the upper bank of the calcarine sulcus will be involved. Moving from here, so we have been listening about this in both the previous talks, temporal and the parietal cortices. So what happens once we see an object? When the eye sees, it takes the, uh, the visual pathway to the lateral geniculate body. And from there, it goes to the primary visual cortex, which is the V1 area. And then starts the stream of recognizing the 
uh, thing which we are seeing, which is the what pathway. It is also known as the process object recognition pathway. And where pathway? Where is this object? Where should I keep my hand? How should I pick this object up? This is in the parietal cortex. And this is also known as the where or processing spatial recognition pathway. There's another small pathway which helps us to recognize the moving objects, which helps us to recognize motion. And this is the area which is situated in this occipital temporal pathway, and we'll see what it is. So this is a beautiful animated drawing from one of the series of continents, and it very beautifully explains how we see objects. So I think this, I'll just take two minutes in explaining this. In case a red glass is placed in front of me, how am I going to recognize it? So first of all, the information will go to my occipital cortex, the visual striate area, which is going to see that there is something and how it is going to formulate. The something is by making a small primal sketch or primary sketch. And this is something about how the primary sketch will be made. So a sketch is there, but no contouring is there. So for making this contouring, the pathway which will be followed is the what pathway, what object is it? So this will be done in just next to the striate cortex, the extra striate area, which is also known as the V2 area, which is going to form segmentation and going to form a small contour of this glass. Subsequently moving, V3 area will tell that yes, I am seeing this glass, which is a conscious awareness of this glass. And then this is going to enter into V4 area, which is almost entering into the temporal lobe, as you can see, which is going to fill in the color. Tell me that, yes, it's definitely a glass. It's red in color. It's this in shape. And then the information from here will travel to the parietal lobe, telling me, yes, now hold this glass, reach out to this glass and drink water. So this is how we are going to recognize things. And this is exactly how the extra striate cortex would work. So let's come out to the V2 area. What can you see over here? In one unison, what is this? This is a this is a triangle. All of you can make out. But if you nicely see, there is no triangle which is made. This is just an illusory contour, which means despite the fact that there is no triangle, there are only three Pac-Man images, you are still able to perceptually integrate a contour. This is exactly what is the function of an extra striate cortex the V2 area. So if this functioning is not there, though you will be able to see, you will not be able to make sense about what it is. And this is exactly what we call as visual agnosia, right? So this 18 years old lady, girl, she came to my OPD in a, and she had a history that she was found in a state of unconsciousness. There was a gas geyser poisoning. The patient was unconscious for a while. And when the patient got up, she came walking to the OPD, but claiming that I cannot see anything. She was so panicky that my resident made the diagnosis of a functional uh, visual loss, that the patient is malingering. But he, he still got the patient to me. Why? Because he saw this MRI. So what was happening over here is that the patient was having an affection of the extra striate cortex, which was more. Hence, the patient, though could see, though could walk, though could navigate, but could not make out what a contour of an object is. This is what we call as a visual agnosia. So remember, this is the extra striate area where visual agnosia localizes. Now let's see this example. A 51 years old male, a kidney disease patient, diabetic hypertensive, came in the OPD, this time banging into objects, but is not ready to believe that he is blind. Now what is it? This is, this is Antons, which means that both the extra striate cortices are lost, but along with that, what is lost is V3 area. So remember, see this diagram. I put this diagram in all these slides so that you remember. So this is this is known to be an area of visual awareness. It's not that simple as Colser was talking about. There are multiple associations, but grossly, if this area is affected, the visual awareness is gone. So this is exactly what is the Anton syndrome. Let's move further. I told you, after, the, after you recognize the object, make a contour in your mind, colors get filled in. So this is the color processing area, which is the V4. And if the damage to the V4 area is there on one side, what are you going to see? A black and white image, half black and white charminar and one half colored charminar. However, mostly what happens is that when this area is damaged, the V4 area is damaged, you can see that this is also, the occipital lobe also gets damaged and it's the inferior calcarine bank which gets damaged. So now you remember, if inferior calcarine bank is damaged, you get a superior altitudinal field effect along with it. And this is the common scenario what you get. So uh, you can get with the damage to this inferior uh, color area, V4 area, along with the damage to inferior calcarine 
cell curves. So this is a small example. Now, 57 years old female came with quadrant and opaque field defect. This is the only thing which was picked up by the ophthalmologist. What the ophthalmologist did not pick up was this, which was noted later on when we saw that this is the area which is getting damaged. So this is high likely that V4 is also damaged. So it has a fancy name, hemichromatopsia. So chrome, chrome is color. So this is multiple colors which are getting damaged. The patient is only seeing a monochrome. So how do you differentiate it from the damage to inferior radiation, optic radiations? In inferior optic radiations, only color is, only the vision is defective, not the color. So color being defective takes your lesion to the uh, V4 area of the extra hydrogen. So you can all make out this is a bunch of vegetables, right? Am I right? But when this image is inverted, it's a very famous, famous image in neurology. So when the image is inverted, what is happening? is that your fusiform area, what Dr. Jabin was talking about, there is an area in the temporal cortex, the lingual gyrus continues as fusiform face area. So this is the area which automatically gets picked up and it recognizes the image of face which is in there. So there's a very famous book by Oliver Sacks. I think he's written a phenomenal number of books. And one of the book was the man who mistook his wife for a hat. So, so that you remember this and don't mistake your wife for a hat. Remember that Fusiform area is the one which is helping you see your wife, your friend, your brother, anybody, right? So this is fusiform face area. So look at this example. Now a 37 years young female had a metastatic lesion in the right occipitotemporal cortex. Look at the region, the occipitotemporal cortex, the cortex which is involving the fusiform gyrus. He is operated and after operation, she claims, now look at, I, I really like this description. She sees things as if there is an Instagram filter on it which means she is not able to see the details of the face. She's just seeing plain faces. So uh, this was seen after operation, after, after the, the post of images, they show that the patient was having damage to this occipital temporal region. You will see it only if you ask for it. So next time you see such a lesion, do ask. A very quick mention about the visual word form area. How do you read things? Once something is given to you visually, what happens? Your eyes take the information to your visual cortex, right visual cortex. From right visual cortex, the pathway will go to the language area so that you can speak it. The language area is where? In the left side of it, in the dominant cortices. Same occurs with the, 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 the left side cortex. So you see the object, they go to the visual cortex, they go to the language area. What would happen if a defect is over here in the right occipital cortex? The left side will take over, the left side will read the thing, and the left side will take the thing to the language area and read it. But what will happen if the damage is over here, which means the left occipital temporal cortex? It means that the patient will be able to see from the uh, from the right side the occipital cortex, but the patient will not be able to see from the left side occipital cortex. And also whatever he is seeing from the right occipital cortex will not go to the left sided language areas. So this is exactly what occurs in left sided occipital temporal uh, damages whereby also there's a damage to the splenium, which means the association area also goes away. And this syndrome is known as, this syndrome is known as alexia without agraphia. The patient is not able to read, patient is able to see, patient is able to work, patient is able to do even write, but the patient cannot read his own handwriting because the pathway to the language area from the vision is defective. So now this patient had inability to read words, but could write. Spoken language was perfect. Patient was having right side homonymous hemianopia, and the patient was having an infiltrative lesion in the left-sided occipitotemporal region involving the splenium of the carpus callosum, which was damaging this pathway, which would start from the right occipital cortex and go to the language areas. So uh, I, I mentioned to you that uh, there's another path, small pathway from the occipital lobe to the V5 area, which is also the occipital temporal region, which tells you about the motion of the object. So from I to lateral geniculate body to V1 and then to the motion processing area. So an interesting phenomena was described by Redox. Redox was a British uh, physician who noted that during World War I, because these patients were wearing, the, these soldiers were wearing this broadies helmet, they would get damage in the occipital region sparing some hot, some temporal cortex. And hence, though they were blind after injuries, they were still able to process motion. They could see the moving objects. So this was known as redox phenomena, that you are able to see moving objects, but not the, uh, the, the object when it is static. Just the opposite of it is what you saw in the first video, that 
the patient is not able to see a moving object, but is still able to work, see, and do his things. So that was echinotopsy, and this is redox phenomenon. The V6 area has been beautifully described by Dr. Call. Just small mention that after you have recognized what this thing is, the entire information goes to your parietal lobe. All these occurring in micro nanoseconds. It all goes to the parietal lobe and parietal lobe tells you that yes, this is a glass which is placed on this table. I have to go and pick up this glass. And this is something like this. Now the parietal area would send signals to various parts, which is ventral, motor, premotor cortex, to pick up an object, frontal eye fields, to look at that object, and so on and so forth. Just giving you an example, if there are multiple diamond rings seen, and I just want one, so my eyes will be fixed. So my frontal eye fields will then follow after the parietal lobe has told me, go reach there, I'll go and pick it up. So this is how the entire circle of uh, looking at an object and picking it deals with. So now this is a 70 years old female. She could not reach out to objects. She could not read single words and had difficulty moving from one word to the next. I'll not go into detail, but what you can see over here is a typical simultagnosia. Look at this cookie theft picture uh, Colser was talking about. So what she was claiming was that this is a man working in a jungle. This is just a man. This is a leech. This is a flag. This is a sea maid. So this is exactly how these patients will fare once given the cookie theft picture. And this is what was occurring. The, the damage was occurring in the occipital parietal association areas. And the, what, what, what was the damage? You all know it was balance syndrome. A small example. Now, often we get patients who are totally blind because of whatever damage, either damage anteriorly or posteriorly, but they claim that they see mixture of colors. This is a typical phenomenon, which is known as Charles Bonnet syndrome. So despite complete blindness, often what happens is that the small islands remain in the visual cortex, which are just adequate to produce some images, some color, some contouring. This is known as Charles Bonnet syndrome. And uh, this can occur with any blindness, just put over here so that you know about the extra syndrome also. So the take home message is again, this simple animated cartoon, which has been taken from continuum. You can all remember the V1 area of primary vision, V2 area of contouring segmentation, V3 area of visual awareness, V4 area of color putting into that object. And then what follows is the fusiform face area to recognize face, abnormality known as prosopognosia, and to read the written objects, the visual word forming area, abnormality known as alexia without agraphia, and V6 area, you have balance syndrome. If the damage is somewhere here, you get redox phenomena. Thank you very much. Dr. Gopi. about clinical approach to memory loss. Respected chairpersons. Good morning, delegates, students. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Manas, sir, for giving the opportunity. So my topic is approach to memory loss. So a few signs in this talk, I would like to interact, as I said. So before that, the memory is defined as ability to ability of the brain to register 
store and retrieve the information whenever is needed. What is learning? Learning is acquiring of new information. You have to a lot of information from the learned speakers today. And learning is an outcome of memory. A memory has a necessary prerequisite for the learning. So this is usually the last one the examination. What is immediate memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, and motor memory? This immediate, other than working memory, short-term memory is recent memory, or episodic memory, long-term memory, semantic memory, all are explicit, explicit memory. The center for immediate memory is prefrontal cortex, short-term memory is medial temporal, and long-term memory is L for lateral temporal, and for motor memory are procedural memory. The centers are basal ganglia and cerebellum, which is implicit memory. So one or two words about this immediate memory. It refers to the amount of information a patient can keep in conscious awareness without active memorization. Normally, you can keep this memory for only for 18 to 20 seconds, five to seven digits. The centers are dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, superior frontal cortex, neocortex, and the dopamine plays a role in this. The second stage is the recent memory or episodic memory. That is ability to register, recall specific items such as words or events after deal of minutes to hours. Initially, the short the immediate memory is few seconds, 18 seconds. This is minutes to hours. And the centers are hippocampus, parahippocampus, and amygdala, especially emotional content of specific events. So there are the various areas, hippocampus, parahippocampus, and amygdala. You have a papus circuit, usually in the exam, I ask you, that is a sector pathway that interconnects major limbic structures. You can easily can remember antinucleus of thalamus to A, C, E, F, like that you can easily can remember. Antinucleus of thalamus, cingulate gyrus, enterorhinal cortex, hippocampus through fornic mammary bodies, and again to thalamus to memorothalamic tract. This is involved in recent memory. Coming to long-term memory, this is a factual knowledge. Long-known information recalled after days or weeks or months or years. That is long-term memory. So lateral temporal of the center. Multiple cortical regions, associated areas are involved. The semantic memory can continue to replenish by reading or conversation and resist for medial temporal damage. So the other classifications, fire and dollars classification, that's declarative memory, facts and events, medial temporal lobe, non-declarative procedural skills, basal ganglia, frontal lobe, classical conditioning is cerebellum, probabilistic classical learning is basal ganglia, and priming is neocortex. So the, the brief anatomy of this, I will go for interactive session now. So in your examination, you will ask you to examine memory. So you have to remember working memory or immediate memory, short-term memory and long-term memory. You have few tests for each thing. One of the neurosurgery residents, please stand up. If nobody stands, I'll ask our residents, Emma Supriya, our neurosurgery from Andhra Medical Gallus. So I'll, I'll ask you, I'll tell you few digits, you repeat. So the test for immediate memory are digit repetition test. Digit forward, digit backward, both are known as digit repetition test. Second is a random letter test. They'll examine you on all of you. Serial seven subtraction test and spell word backwards. The first test is digit repetition test. They'll give you a few digits. You have to give the digits one per second. I'll give you digits. Please repeat. Three. Make sure the patient should register the words. And they should be in a sequence, like one, two, three, four, five, you should not give. Three, two, three, eight, four. Three, two, three, eight, four. Very good, excellent. So backward, four, eight, three, two, three. So if you tell quickly, you can easily understand. So this is the way to your exam. Sit down. So next is a random letter test. So they will ask you what is the test for? It is a test for retention also. So test for retention, a random letter test, or tap a test. All residents please do the test. So the instruction you have to give is instruct the patient. I will say, I will tell certain words like alphabets A B C D or anything P Q R S. So whenever I say A, you have, you have to tap like this. Whenever I say A, you have to tap. That is a random letter test or tap a test. I will test on you. So whenever I will I will be saying any any word. Whenever I say A, you tap B D A. See, all of you are not typing most of the presents only. X, Y, A, X, A, D, B, A. Excellent. So, so you are not omitting any words. Is it test of commission? Is it complex attention? Test of commission, omission, preservation. In random letter A test, you have two, three subheadings. 
test for omission test for commission test for preservation what you done is test of commission suppose if i say a if i say b you you tap that is test of omission sometimes you say i say a you will go on tapping that is test of preservation so you see the patient any abnormality with this omission commission preservation that is random letter a test next is serial sub subtraction seven subtraction test Ashwin, where is Ashwin? Our please, you are Ajit. Ashwin, you, our please. Okay, you see, you are also Ashwin. You know, serial seven subtraction test. Do the test. You instruct the patient. You have to take hundred minus seven, minus seven, minus seven till sixty-five. Don't tell him that uh, this is ninety-three. They can you get eighty-six like that. You do the test. See, see, you know, you know very well. Serial seven. The name of the test is serial seven subtraction test. Do that. Six, then seventy nine, seventy two, then sixty five. You see how speed they are doing us good. You have done well, but hundred ninety three, seventy nine, seventy two, sixty five. You can how speed they are doing. You have done well. So you, you ask him to instruct hundred minus seven, ninety three, eighty six, seventy nine, seventy two, sixty five. So excellent. That is serial seven subtraction test. You have to do on the patients. Next is one more. Roshan, so much. Spell word backwards. Other test is spell word backward test. This is a test for immediate recall. Your immediate memory, short term memory, long term memory, and procedural memory. At least at the end of the lecture, you should know at least some basic test. So spell word backwards. D L O R W. D L R O W. If you examine on patients repeatedly, you can easily can tell D L R O W. Just tell D L R O W. D L R O W. Okay. So these are the tests for. immediate memory and retention next recent memory recent memory so that is orientation of person time place for example i am dr gopi my age is 50 years my birthday is october 26 is 1974 and first and hod now we are in lamentary hotel 7th floor hyderabad Like that, so the place the patient has to orient the place, person, and then now the time is around eleven o'clock. Today is third February. This is winter season, February third, twenty twenty-four. The basic thing orientation to time, place, person, in time, day, day, and today is Saturday. So you just these are the things you can ask for recent memory, remote memory, personal information. So where we are born, your school information. your vocation history and family information about your wife like that so new learning ability this is another important test in memory actually very few tests are there unlike frontal temporal a lot of tests are there in memory examination short term recent long term and new learning ability whenever i go as examiner ask students what are the four components of new learning ability most students they cannot answer anyone what are the four components of new learning in this in this lecture should know the four components very clearly anyone Ashwin, okay. Four and these four readings are four unrelated words: visual memory, verbal memory, and paid associate learning. Because you take each each. If you would like to take, you take five to ten minutes. I'll only say two, three. So visual memory and paid after the four, I will demonstrate two. That is visual memory and paid associate learning. These the four headings are four unrelated words: visual memory, verbal memory, and paid associate learning. Paid associate learning. You have to give four internationally accepted pairs. You should not give as if you like, like a boy and a girl. That you should not give. You have four internationally accepted pairs in any classical dementia books. The four internationally accepted pairs. You have two easy pairs, two difficult pairs. Two easy pairs are you get high marks. They don't tell you give close. You get high marks. There's high and low, and book and pairs. These are the two internationally accepted easy pairs. Hi, low book pairs. You first you register the these pairs. Whenever I say hi, you say low. Whenever I say book, you say pairs. In, anybody can tell these two pairs very easily. Of the four pairs, the difficult pairs are weather box, house income. So born less than seventy years, they have at least they have to do all for one of the two first recall and all for the second recall. So whenever I say hi, you say low weather box, house income. I will ask you. You remember these four internet accepted pairs, okay? Hi. 
book, weather, house. Now I will tell you. Okay. Now I think you are seeing that. Hi, book, weather, house. Excellent. So that is the way you have to examine paid as the paid associate learning. Next is visual memory. I told you four, four comes under the new learning ability. Acquire new information. Four underrated words. Visual memory, verbal memory, and paid associate learning. I will examine, I will now examine the visual memory. You have to take four or five objects. At least five hidden objects. You should have five hidden objects. So I have some four objects. I will write one of you come. Which one of you come? I will write these five objects. So what you're supposed to do at the bedside, I'm telling just within one minute you complete. You see, I'm hiding this here. Okay. Hiding. This is the comb. I'm hiding in my pocket. This is the pencil. Right pocket. Okay. Remember. This is the pen pocket. Spets. I think here. Okay, you should you should identify lot of things to actually discuss all these things, but just I'm telling the method. Where did I keep my spets? Then it's uh, computer. No, take, take it off. Take take spets. Sometimes they can tell they cannot take it. Sure. So, in new learning ability, four unneeded words visual memory, verbal memory, and paid associate learning. So, after that, in the memory explanation, we have to do the mini mental status examination. In this, the memory company have 21 marks, language of 9 marks. Registration 5, recall 5, no sorry, orientation to time place 5, 5, registration 3, recall 3, and serial subtraction test, 100 minus 100 5, total 5, 5, 5, 3, 3, 3, 21 marks. And the remaining 9 are languages. So this one you have to do. Uh, everybody knows this mini mental status examination. After this, this is actually very few tests for short term, the work, immediate memory, working memory, short term, or recent memory, long term memory. And some coming few points about amnestic disorders. Amnesia means a deficit in the memory caused by brain damage, disease, or psychological trauma. The amnestic disorders, the group under loss of memories previously established. You have good memories, but you lost those memories. Loss of able to create a new memories. No good, very good new memories now. We are establishing new memories in the lemon tree under the leadership of Manas sir. Loss of able to learn new information. So there are the various things, amnestic disorders. You have two types of amnesia, anti-grade amnesia, disorder amnesia. After the event is anti-grade, loss of memory before an injury is retrograde. All of you know this. So what is amnestic syndrome? The basic point is impaired recent memory. Impaired recent memory with preserved procedural memory, immediate memory, remote memory. Very simple. Only the recent memory is gone. Immediate memory, procedural memory, long-term memory, they're all well intact with the disorientation of time and place, but patient is confabulated. This is the criteria for amnestic syndrome. One more point about transient, amnes transient amnesia. So transient amnesia is a temporary version of amnestic syndrome. It lasts for several minutes to 24 hours. Both It involves both anti and retrograde amnesia, leaves a permanent gap in the memory, for example, in one type of epilepsy, cognitive stages, where you get transient amnesia. So there are various diseases where you get memory loss. So Alzheimer's disease, the most important is the recent memory loss, diffuse every body disease, vascular dementia, FTD, PSP, CBD, all the list you can get in the books. So approach the memory loss. The final aspect of this, the last five minutes, I will tell how to approach a memory loss. Any patient who comes with memory loss, first see whether really memory loss or confusion of state like delirium. Is it a delirium? How to distinguish? You have to say confusion assessment method. In these four points are there. In these four points, acute onset and fluctuating course and inattention. The two should be there. Out of three, four, one should be there. That is desire of thinking and alter level of consciousness. These two, one should be there. So then you can diagnose delirium. Delirium basically a attention deficit. Whereas dementia is basically a memory deficit. Others you can, in the memory, these two points are important. So next is, is it depression? After, once you rule out delirium, whether you are dealing with depression, that is true dementia, 
or pseudo dementia. The new name for dementia is neurocognitive impairment according to DSM-5. So how to distinguish? So it is the presentation, anxiety, irritability. So just now, okay. how much time you have, sir? How much time you want? <laughs> no, no, just I will finish in time. Okay, another two, three minutes. Okay, I'll finish. So here in the dementia, pseudo dementia. So in the memory, both recent and remote, both are equal effect in pseudo dementia. Whereas recent memory is more effect in two dementia. So reversible, irreversible. Reversible causes, you know, pneumonic, delirium, endocrine, metabolic, emotion, nutritional, alcohol, all as reversible, irreversible, AD, FTD, PD, HD, and post lack of disease. Next is, this is very, very important. Whether you're dealing with is associated mental impairment, AMI. So once you pass 70, you get some mental impairments, memory loss. Is it AMI or mild cognitive impairment, MCI or two dementia? So this is very important. A normal cognition, AMI, MCI or dementia. The points here you can get in our test books. The important points, the patient times memory loss, but can recall incidents of forgetfulness. That is A, that is normalizing. In dementia, they may report memory loss. The close family members more concerned with memory loss. The patient is not concerned. Family members say that they have memory loss. So mild cognitive impairment. So you have the criteria in the books. Mild cognitive impairment can be amnestic, non-amnestic. Now amnestic only single domain. The economic DSM-5, you have six domains. The memory and learning and memory, attention, execution, motor perceptual, social cognition. Of these, only one domain is affected, memory is affected. There is the amnestic, multiple, multiple domains are affected. Then you, the risk of AD and VD. So there is a different distinguish between mild MCA, dementia, and AAMI. So DSM-4, the mem regarding memory, DSM-4 has given much importance to memory. Memory impairment plus at least one of the following, either aphasia, hypoxia, agnosia, or disturbance into functioning. In DSM-5, it is not so. They give equal importance for all the domains. Memory is one of the domains. So complex attention, executive function, learning and memory, long ways, perceptual motor, and social cognition. Last but not least, the cortical dementia, subcortical dementia, reversible, irreversible, earlier laid. Cortical dementia, major changes in the memory in cortical dementia. The memory is basically affected. Whereas in subcortical dementia, memory is usually spared. Whereas you get more of extra pernal symptoms. That's why you can easily you can distinguish the mixed R, BD, DLB, LB. Rapidly, you have some rapidly progressive dementia. Nowadays, we are more concerned with autoimmune encephalitis, VGK encephalitis, NMDA symptoms, and with facial brachial disturbance stages, memory impairment. You have to think of this autoimmune encephalitis, prion disease, and there are other causes of AD can present as rapidly progressive dementia. Finally, so what type, if fine if it is dementia, what type of dementia? Is it a degenerative dementia, vascular dementia, secondary dementia, or mixed dementia? Somebody come with acute onset fluctuating cause with vascular risk factors. Counselor always says when I send a patient of stroke, first he asked me, he told me, sir is asking about obstructive sleep apnea. Are you snoring? Since then, I, asked, I, I used to ask every patient of stroke. Sir, 80% almost are getting this history of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. New risk factor. In the IN subsection, they are given one supplement. Okay. About new risk factors of stroke, like obstructive sleep apnea, air pollution, gingivitis, physical inactivity. I always walk 20,000. I always motivate our students to walk. So I always walk 15 kilometers per day. So it's a new risk factors, physical inactivity. Try to walk whenever just to go sit and uh, talk. You just walk and talk. And low intake of fresh foods and vegetables. Some risk factors, upon traditional risk factors, fluctuating course, sudden onset, memory impairment, vascular dementia. For example, fluctuating in attention, cognition, visual hallucinations, review about dementia. You can you can distinguish between various things. All tables are there. So finally, is it a cognitive impairment? Yes. Deterioration of previous high level of functioning. Yes, that is dementia. No. Patient had loss of this memory from birth. This is mental degradation. So, what the consciousness? Consciousness altered or confused. Confused. There's delirium. So, multiple domains are affected. The dementia, only one domain is affected. Aphasia or amnesia. Thank you very much for patient listening. Now, I request Dr. Patil. After a lot of clinical and bedside evaluation, now I'll take you to neuro labs. Something objective to understand today.
So moving on to electrophysiology, since we have to stick to the time schedule, I'll keep this to uh, bedside day-to-day -day clinical cases only. For the next session, we'll try for interoperative electrophysiology. So, one minute, one minute. I request all the delegates to please come and occupy the chairs, please. The lecture has started. Please take your chairs. Thanks. So coming to nerve conductions and electromyography, these are an extension of clinical examination. These simple tests helps us to localize the lesion in peripheral neuraxis, right from a muscle, neuromuscular junction, peripheral nerve, plexus, nerve root, or anterior horn cells. And similarly onwards, the sensory radical, DRG or dorsal root ganglion, or the sensory nerves. It helps us to classify either the etiological, axonal versus demanding lesions versus the pattern of anatomical pattern either neuropathic or myopathic ones. They help in assessing the severity as well as prognosticating the lesions. Basically, nerve conductions are stimulation of a periphery or peripherally accessible nerves to record action potentials along the muscles of innervated. The motor nerve conductions are defined in terms of compound muscle action potentials, which are summation of individual muscle fiber action potentials. They are described in terms of the initial duration right from the stimulus artifact till the initiation of the graph, the amplitude, the duration, and the motor conduction velocity between the proximal and the distal stimulation. Similarly, the sensory nerve action potentials, they are in terms a bit shorter and smaller than the motor nerve conduction studies. The basic patterns of axonal or demanding conduction, uh, demanding uh, patterns can be distinguished in, as per. Axonal loss basically will have low amplitudes, Normal latencies and conduction velocities. They can be easily seen in long-standing traumatic or metabolic toxic or vasculatic degenerative neuropathies. As against in demyelinating, the conduction velocities will be reduced, uh, latencies will be delayed, and there will be an apparent conduction block, which is more than or equal to 50% drop in the amplitudes between the proximal and the distal nerve stimulation. These can be seen in mostly inflammatory and vasculatic neuropathies. Coming to electromyography, this is a recording of the electrical activity in the muscles per se. This can detect abnormalities, including chronic denervations or fasciculations in clinically normal muscles as well. Conventionally, the electromyography needles are almost one millimeter thin, and they can be uh, recording from 100 surrounding muscle fibers. The spontaneous activity in the form of fibrillations and positive sharp waves indicates an ongoing denervation. Whereas giant motor units, as can be seen in the first upper graph, motor units of almost more than 2 millivolts, as can be seen in this graph, are almost 5 to 6 millivolts, and complex fasciculations somewhere beyond 2 to 3 phases are suggestive of chronic renervatory changes. Electromyography helps us to distinguish the lesions as neurogenic pattern, wherein giant MUPs, motor unit potentials, and incomplete recruitment can be seen. <laughs> slowly recruiting giant motor units as against small multiple motor units which are early and completely recruiting as can be seen in <laughs> now going to case based uh, scenarios this is a 28 year old gentleman who had come almost 2 months following a road traffic accident around june 2023 clinically he had left upper limb weakness hardly having some abduction and flexion of the shoulder, but none of the other joints were mobile. He used to complain numbness along the lateral more than median aspect of the hand, forearm, and distal arm. The nerve conductions, motor nerve studies failed to elicit any excessive, like elicitable motor action potentials at any of the left median, ulnar, radial, as well as axillary and musculocutaneous nerves. Sensory potentials, however, elicited small but recordable and reproducible potentials. So how to interpret this? Coming to any traumatic nerve in plexus injuries, it takes almost seven, seven, seven to three days. Three days for the motor unit potentials and seven for the sensory to start to drop. And the drop goes maximum by around seven days to 10 to 11 days in sensory uh, nerves. 
the amplitude of the CMAPs or the motor nerve, uh, motor nerve potentials correlates well with the severity of the injury until unless re innervation sets in. Progressive increase in the amplitude on successive uh, studies signifies re innervation and recruitment of new and new motor units. As against sensory nerve action potentials, these record the distal part, the distal portions of the nerve segments beyond the DRG, dorsal root ganglion, and hence help in localization of pre versus post ganglionic lesions. Low elicitable sensory nerve amplitudes and nearly absent motor amplitudes, as we had seen in the earlier case. They suggest more of predominantly preganglionic lesions. Coming to this case, therefore, the pan brachial plexus injury predominantly preganglionic and indicates severe because two months down the line there were no elicitable or reproducible motor unit potentials. So further information can be elicited by an electromyography of the affected muscles. We went and did electromyography also. The left supraspinatus and FDI showed spontaneous activity, fibrillations, and uh, reduced recruitment, whereas the rest all muscles, including the flexor carpi ulnaris, biceps, deltoid, EDC, failed to recruit any MUPs. The cervical paraspinals showed normal recruitment. Now, why spine sample the cervical paraspinals? Cervical paraspinals, along with rhomboids and serratus anterior, indicates lesions to the direct cervical nerve root, indicating avulsion injuries. Dense fibrillation potentials or inability to activate motor unit potentials almost four to six months down the illness suggest lack of axonal continuity. This supports potentially the surgical intervention such as nerve grafting or decompression. Pan plexus injuries, however, without no renervatory signs late into the course suggests a worse prognosis and may have variable responses even to reconstruction. An evidence of reinnervation in a clinically improving person may support clinical observation and waiting for surgical interventions. So follow up of the same guy, almost seven months down the illness, he had come with some shoulder abduction and elbow flexion extension up to almost three by five. The nerve conductions showed, compared to the earlier one, the nerve conduction showed improvement in CMAPs than the previous study. There were still elicitable but reduced CMAPs in radial and axillary and musculoplanus nerves and ulnar sensory nerve potentials were reduced. This indicates predominantly injury to the posterior cord and lower trunk, but still the recruitable and improving clinical status, that's why he still bears potential to recovery. Moving on to the next case. 53-year-old gentleman woke up with right-handed weakness. On examination, he had right wrist drop and finger drop. Rest of the examination, including reflexes, sensory, were normal and there were no UMN signs. This is his nerve conduction study. The upper table shows motor nerve studies, whereas the lower one is sensory, which is perfectly fine, normal. The study was done on day three of his presentation. This uh, elicits the importance of well-preserved CMAP amplitudes from uh, inner muscle, which is clinically weak, suggests neuropraxic lesion. It takes almost two, two weeks down the line for the follow-up. The person had presented with right, like improved right from wrist and finger extension. Coming to case three, another 42-year-old lady presented with numbness along the medial side of the forearm and weakness in the little, little finger. This had happened after a fall that she has sustained a trauma to the left elbow. The nerve conductions here shows conduction block between the elbow and the wrist. So the upper tracing here into the diagram is recording at the wrist. The second one is below elbow and third one is above elbow. So compared to the distal pre present uh, stimulation, the proximal stimulations have reduced amplitude and temporal dispersion. So this suggests conduction block. Although a hallmark for focal demyelination, sometimes inadvertently conduction blocks can be seen in recent axonal interruptions, which can be in sudden trauma or vasculitic neuropathies. This termed as pseudo-conduction blocks. Herein, the digital segments of the nerves are still preserved and are able to conduct before the valerian degeneration sets in. Follow-up nerve conductions are therefore uh, advisable in such cases, wherein at follow-up they show axonal pattern with loss of both proximal as well as distal CMAPs. Moving on to case four, another 56-year-old lady without any comorbidities had presented with right more than left hand numbness since over the last two months. On examination, tinnitus was positive. There was subtle yeah, pincer grip weakness. Sure. Clinically, picture was fitting into carpal tunnel syndrome. However, the clinical catch here, bilaterally, the reflexes were diminished. And lo behold, her nerve conduction studies showed grossly prolonged distal latencies, temporal dispersion, and conduction blocks. 
these are all suggestive of inadvent like uh, uh, acquired demyelinating ne neuropathies, polyneuropathies like CIDP. So sometimes nerve conductions may help in picking up clin clinically inapparent weaknesses as well. Follow up, the lady was started on immunomodulation and just within two weeks, there was subtle improvement in her clinical symptoms as well as this is her baseline study wherein the median and ulnar, the upper limb latencies were almost 10 and 18, which had improved up to 8, 10 and the conduction velocities had also reasonably improved. So sensitive tool for electrodiagnostics may help in detecting clinically inapparent neuropathies. Case 5, another 41-year-old gentleman came with severe pain along the right leg after intense labor a week ago. Clinically, there was no apparent motor or sensory deficit except for a relatively diminished ankle jerk on the right. The nerve conduction showed relatively low tibial amplitudes onto the right side with normal nerve conduction, sensory nerve conductions. However, on testing, H reflex showed normal elicitation onto the left side, whereas right side was completely absent. This is Hoffman's reflex, an important tool in detecting the proximal lesions, especially important for lumbosacral and cervical nerve root lesions, particularly involving S1 and C6 to C7 root radicals. In cases with normal sensory or mild sensory abnormalities, but showing prolonged latencies or unilateral absence of H reflex, it is suggestive of a motor root, root lesion. That's about the absent H reflex. What about the ones when it is present? Presence of H reflexes from clinically dormant or uh, silent soleus like muscles is evidence of hyperreflexia and should raise a suspicion of ongoing degenerative conditions like motor neuron disease, especially when denervation is also apparent in the same muscle. Moving on to electroencephalography. This is a potential, it's a graphical display of electrical discharges occurring extra across the brain. The clinical standard array of electrodes is used as per the International 1020 system, wherein each letter indicates the region and the number signifies the precise position of the electrode. The right is hemispheric electrodes are labeled as per the even numbers and the left one along the odd. The midlines are represented with the letter Z. Different comparisons along the electrodes can be used in terms of montages, wherein the uh, potential difference between the electrodes compared to the surrounding electrodes or to a common montage or common referential electrode will be used in assessing the origin of the electrical discharge. Moving on to a normal record, a normal awake EEG shows alpha rhythm of 8 to 13 activity, posteriorly dominant, slightly more amplitude onto the right side and sinusoidal in nature. With eye opening, there is a disappearance of the posterior dominance and there are frequent lead artifacts. When on to sleep, initially there is a slow dropout in the frequency followed by post loss of the posterior dominance and by the stage 2, K complexes and sharp spin sleep spindles set in as seen into the lower tracing. Moving to case based uh, EEGs, this is a six year old child which has presented with staring spells noted multiple times in a day normal clinical and, uh, examination and imaging, and EEG is suggestive of this typical 3 hertz spike and wave pattern, which is classical for idiopathic generalized uh, epilepsy, especially childhood absence epilepsy. Treatment of choice always valproate ethosuximide. When coming across such a EEG, at least better not to choose any sodium channel blockers, which are likely to precipitate seizures. Then EEG in focal epilepsy is another 28-year-old gentleman with left hippocampal sclerosis. This is an interictal tracing wherein the upper graph shows focal spikes. The blue recordings are along the left side, red along the right. Color combinations may not always be apparent. The upper tracing shows phase reversal. So positive spike along the anterior temporal, slightly negative uh, def deflection along the posterior spikes. In the middle one, f 7 t one pair, it shows almost isoelectric focus. So that uh, suggests the origin of the ectal discharge. So localizing to F7 and T1. Same way, interictal EEGs can sometimes show just focal slowing. These are uh, ongoing slowing along with the background, not showing any evolving or resolving patterns. The same pressing when, this is another patient, at the time of epileptogenesis or ictal patterns, there is an ongoing electrical discharge. Here, it started along the right frontocentral leads, then moved on to spatial dispersion along to the bilateral frontal lobes, thereafter evolving temporarily along the entire left-right hemisphere. 
unlike this discharge, focal slowing in structural causes. Here also, reasonable slowing is seen along the left frontotemporal leads. But nearly static, there is no evolving resolving pattern. And sometimes this may show variability even with eye closure, arousal, or routine spontaneous clinical stim stimulations. So this is just a structural cause, nothing epileptogenic, and need not be considered for treatment. Lastly, not always, all that spikes is a seizure. So be aware about the artifacts. The first graph shows temporalis artifact, chewing artifact, high amplitude and very thin spikes are seen along the bilateral temporal leads. Easy way to take it out will be to asking the patient to loosen the jaw. The next one is an electrode pop. Looks exactly like a electrical spike, epileptic spike, but perpendicular discharges and almost like a mirror image about uh, across the both the electrode pairs. That is an electrode pop, pop artifact. The eye blink artifacts seen mainly as positive deflection along the frontal leads. To conclude, nerve conductions. Electrodiagnostics are a valuable arm uh, tools in clinical armamentarium. But to remember, it is always an extension of clinical examination. And the clinical hypothesis determines the extent of the study performed, which is tailored for every individual case. And the most important part of electrodiagnostic is the technique. So artifacts need to be if they are to be interpreted with caution. Thank you. Thank you, madam. I think uh, you all agree that all the speakers have prepared well and give a lucid presentation of the topics they were adopted. And I think we all have been enriched by the presentation. And I request uh, now the MPQ. <laughs> Dr. Ishwar uh, so will moderate uh, the MCQ test too. I request uh, Dr. Ishwar to come on. Okay. Both chair. So these are the scores for the first uh, MCQ test. So like this, every quiz uh, will be, uh, before beginning the questions, This the score chart will be displayed like this. Uh, I'm standing in for Dr. Sujanda, who has run for an errant back to her institute. Okay. And this is one session where I'm not sure whether I'll be able to answer all the questions, any question at all, because this is core neurology. Let's start. Okay, fine. Here comes the first one. Yeah. Stop for a bit. Has everyone downloaded the Kahoot app? I hope everyone has downloaded the Kahoot app. Are we? The code of the game team is same. Huh? Different. Okay. Okay, let's so anyone of you have not downloaded Kahoot? Kahoot.it you have to do. In Google you type Kahoot.it. Yeah. Okay, 707 yeah. 0839. That's the pin for this. Has everybody got this or anybody who didn't get? 707 0839. Please, please raise your hand if you didn't come out. Give some time for everybody to enter them. 
wanted to use the same name what you did for the last time. Use the same nickname so that later you have to, tomorrow you have to do the. Huh? Please don't change the name so because it will be difficult to evaluate tomorrow. 110, 100. Last time we had 125. So some people have not done. Yeah, we'll wait till 125. Huh? Yeah. yeah, one more to 119. Yeah, one more to go. One. Ah, yes, we can Going start. Up. Going up. 125. Okay. Fine. All right. Here comes the first question. Okay. When should an EM, EMG be performed after a traumatic nerve injury? I think that's a quite a practical question for a neurosurgeon. Within 24 or 48 hours after the injury, within two weeks of the injury, at least four weeks after the injury and after four months of the injury. Okay, the answer is at least four weeks after the injury and I think who got it right first? Draw me, okay. Okay. Fine, we go on to the next question. Question number two, which is the likely site of a seizure onset? Which is the likely site of a seizure onset? And the answer, the choices are left frontotemporal. This is the EEG of a patient with seizures. Left frontotemporal, right frontotemporal, right hemisphere generalized. The answer is left frontotemporal. I think that... Uh, we could not see the EEG very well. I, I think you draw me got it right again, but I think okay, let's go to the next question. Question number three. Scarf sign is used to assess. Scarf sign is used to assess left lower limb tone, upper limb tone, axial tone, none of the above. Scarf sign. I think that is out of the syllabus. Okay, the answer is upper limb tone. Upper limb tone. The answer is upper limb tone. Okay, and uh, let me see again. Romi gets it. No, Ashwini beats. Ashwini gets it right this time. Okay. Question number four. When the third cranial nerve is injured completely, we find when the third cranial nerve. This is important for the neurosurgeon. Down and out position of that eye. Complete doses, dilatation of pupil, all the above. I think the, that must be a sitter for us, for the neurosurgeons, all the above. Okay, again, who gets it? Ashub gets it right. Okay, fine. Fifth question The sucking reflex assesses which cranial nerve indirectly? The sucking reflex assesses which cranial nerve indirectly? Facial and trigeminal nerve, trigeminal and hypoglossal nerve, facial and hypoglossal nerve, only hypoglossal nerve. The answer is trigeminal and hypoglossal nerve. The trigeminal, I think, uh, was this covered in this session? Not. Okay, I think this was not related to this session. Okay. This is, shall I continue? Okay, the next question. Which of the following is not typical for carpal tunnel syndrome? I think that is part of this session, definitely. Low median nerve amplitude, conduction block between elbow and wrist stimulation, increased distal latency of the median C map, and normal median nerve conduction study. I think uh, that should be an answer. Okay, normal median nerve conduction study. I think that's a sitter, ma'am. For the neurosurgeon who does the surgery without reading what is there in the nerve conduction study. 
ओके अशुभ गेट्स इट ओके फाइन लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन द सेवेंथ ऑफ द नाइन क्वेश्चन which is why is primary visual cortex called as striate cortex why is primary visual cortex called striate cortex striae of red cells are located in the occipital cortex primary sketches of images made in the occipital cortex are arranged in the striae striae gennari can be seen by naked eye i think that was a little too fast okay the bhaidya again gets it right okay the penultimate question earliest when vision can be assessed earliest when vision can be assessed i think that was not part of us the stock this thing 28 weeks of gestation 32 weeks of gestation 34 weeks of gestation 36 weeks of gestation i think 28 weeks of gestation is the answer given i don't think i think again that was again out of the syllabus okay the last question in the session Ninth question: What is the EEG phenomenon shown below? Can you please zoom the EEG, please? Last time we could not see. It. Please zoom the EEG. Can you see? Okay, I think I, everybody can see it. Three hertz spike and wave pattern, photo paroxysmal response, photic drive response, photo myoclonic response. The answer also already given. I think you have. Uh, Please run it a little slowly because the answer is coming. Again, Arshub gets it. Ah, uh, so we have the first first ASP. Who is Doctor ASP? Is anybody here? ASP. He wants to remain anonymous, sir. <laughs> we don't know. Ah, uh, Doctor Atsu. Yeah, a big clap for him. Applause for him. We are from from Jaipur. Thanks. And uh, Dr. Kevin Bharti. And that's big. We are from Ames Foundation. We're done. Okay. Yes. Sorry for the hitches with the questions. No, I think uh, Dr. Suchana was supposed to do. Yeah. She probably has inserted her questions. Tomorrow, <laughs> as goodly. Thank you very much. Thanks tomorrow. No, uh, we are not having tea break. They will be serving tea to you on uh, so that we save time. And uh, I'll request uh, Professor Sastri and Professor Sanjay to hand over mementos to the speakers. So I would request Dr. Praveen Kumar uh, Yadav sir to come onto the stage to receive the mementos, sir. Dr. Praveen Kumar. Yes. <laughs> Next, I would request Dr. Jabeen Sheikh, ma'am, please come on to the stage. I request Dr. Shubash Kaul, sir, to come on to the stage. Next, nextly, Dr. Rasta. Dr. Gobi, sir, please come on. Dr. Anuja Patil, ma'am. Thank you, chairpersons and all the speakers. Let's have a quick break of five minutes. I would request everybody to gather back as fast as as possible to move on to the next session. Okay. Participants who doesn't want break, they can remain be seated.
ठीक
वेलकम बैक पार्टिसिपेंट्स आर रिक्वेस्टेड टू टेक योर चेयर्स प्लीज I request all the participants to take your chairs. We are moving on to the next session. Enough. I would request Dr. S. Sridharala Srinivas and Dr. Sham Babji for chairing the session, sir. फर्स्ट स्पीकर डॉक्टर रंजित मूर्ति सेरेबलम क्लिनिकल सैंस एनाटॉमिकल एंड फिजियोलॉजिकल बेसिस Good morning, uh, respected teachers, uh, friends, and students. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Manas and this uh, team for having organized this very important uh, session. I thought for neuroscience because uh, the value of clinical neurological examination is not emphasized so much in even in our bigger institutes because of the workload. This is a good time for us to get together and focus on that for about one and a half days. So my the topic given to me is uh, uh, that of cerebellum. So we're moving from the supratentorial compartment to the infratentorial compartment now, and I will be focusing the next few minutes on basically the motor functions of the uh, cerebellum and their anatomical and physiological signs. Uh, as you know, cerebellum has got a lot of cognitive functions which I will not be focusing much on. So briefly, uh, this is something all of us will know. The cerebellum is located in the posterior cranial fossa behind the brainstem and the uh, fourth ventricle. Anatomically, it is classified into the anterior lobe, uh, separated from the posterior lobe, the larger posterior lobe by the horizontal fissure. And there's a smaller flocular nodular lobe which is situated inferiorly and anteriorly. And functionally, the cerebellum is divided into three zones the vermis and the intermediate zone. There's vermis in the paramormian uh, region of each uh, hemisphere. And the edge, what is demonstrated, is the hemispheric zones. And below is the flocular nodular uh, lobe. Uh, now, there's a somatotopic organization, the verbis and the intermediate zone, where you can see the head, the body, and the uh, trunk, and the body trunk, and the tail are uh, uh, arranged in this uh, fashion in the midline. And just on either side of the midline are the upper and the lower limbs and the face arranged. So coming once again to the phylogenetic subdivisions of the uh, cerebellum, which is what is, I think, important when we clinically approach a patient with a uh, cerebellar uh, syndrome. Uh, there are three functional or phylogenetic subdivisions of the cerebellum. The first is the archicerebellum, which is the oldest part of the cerebellum that uh, developed, that is called, also called the vestibular cerebellum. It consists of the popular nodular lobe and the uh, vestigial nucleus. The spinal cerebellum or the paleocerebellum, which consists of the vermis and the intermediate zone, what is marked out here in the center, midline, and also on the other side of the blue, consisting of the vermis and the intermediate zone, and the uh, globus and emboliform nuclei, which are called the uh, nuclei interpositus. And the cerebrocerebellum, that is the large hemispheric part of the uh, cerebellum, which connects with the cerebellar hemisphere and also uh, has got the important dentate nucleus. Now, Cerebellar afferents. So, cerebellum receives input from several body uh, several parts of the central nervous system. 
Uh, most important, which I think is from the spinal cord, two, two tracts, the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Now, what do the dorsal spinocerebellar tract do? It provides information regarding the muscle tension, muscle contraction, and the rate of movement by taking the impulses from the muscle spindle and the gorget and the organs. And then through the inferior cerebellar fluid until it reaches the vermis and the intermediate zone of the same side. The ventral spinocerebellar tract, on the other hand, it provides what is called the deference copy. That is when the cerebral cortex sends uh, through the corticospinal tract impulses to the anterior muscle. It exactly provides which anterior muscle has been stimulated at that point back to the cerebellum through very rapidly uh, conducting pathways. It's almost 120 meters per uh, second it uh, travels. And through the superior cerebellar pinnacle, this reaches the vermis and intermediate zone on either side. Now, the vestibular nuclei situated in the brain stem and the various other parts of the vestibular apparatus. Uh, provide information regarding the body and the head position, as well as the direction of movement of the head through the inferior cerebellar pinnacle again to the floccular nodular lobe and the festival nucleus. And the cerebral cortex, provide, uh, that is basically the pre-motor cortex uh, and the association of motor cortices, uh, provide a sequential plan of movement that is uh, there. That is, if a particular movement requires certain steps, all the sequence is transmitted to the cerebellum through the cortico ponto cerebellar fibers through the middle cerebellar pinnacle, and this reaches the intermediate zone of the cerebellum. So this is how cerebellum requires, uh, obtains in input from various uh, aspects of the motor function. Now, what are the efferents of the cerebellum? So the efferents of the cerebellum essentially are from the deep nuclei, that the dentate, vestigial, and interpositus. The most important, which concerns the neurosurgeons, are the dentate uh, nucleus. So the dentate nucleus sends, uh, the large nucleus there, and sends impulses through the uh, dentito rubro thalamic tract. So the, it goes to the red nucleus, uh, and before that, it crosses over in the superior cerebellar pinnacle, uh, superior cerebral pinnacle and crosses over in the midbrain, reaches the red nucleus, and then to the uh, opposite thalamus, and then to the premotor cortex. The facetal nucleus, similarly, uh, sign, uh, sends impulses to the vestibular nuclei and the reticular formation of the brain stem. Uh, so that, in, from the reticular formation, in turn, there are the descending tracts, the reticulospinal tracts, and the vestibular spinal tracts, which play a role in controlling the muscle, the tone of the limbs. And the interpositus again sends impulses to the ventrolateral thalamus, then to the basal ganglia, and also to the red nucleus. So they by they coordinate the various sequential uh, sequence of uh, movements. Now, how does this translate to functions? So the vestibular cerebellum basically gets information about the head position and rotation, and it helps in maintenance of balance and posture. The spinal cerebellum receives proprioceptive feedback from the spinal cerebellar tracts, reflects in maintenance of the axial stability, control of distal fine movements of the limbs. It compares the intended movement, that is, it receives an, uh, information through the cortical onto cerebellar fibers uh, regarding what is the intended movement. And it also receives in, uh, information on the proprioceptive feedback and what is the actual movement that has happened. So it compares the intended movement versus actual performance and makes corrections. And the neurocerebellum is overall involved in planning and execution of the desired movements. It, it helps in planning the sequential movements, smooth transition from one movement to another, and correction of movement to the desired extent. So what happens when there is dysfunction in any of these symptoms? So again, we classify them in the vestibular cerebellum. Predominantly, we get uh, related, uh, vestibular related symptoms like what I go, nausea, vomiting, and nystagmus. Spinal cerebellum is essentially for the neurosurgeons, it's uh, like a midline syndrome. They get frontal ataxia and titubation and coordination of the limbs. And the neurocerebellum and the, and the intermediate zone of the cerebellar hemispheres, when they are affected, we get gate ataxia, we get appendicular ataxia, which means the limbs become ataxic. There's impaired transition of, from one movement to the uh, another, which results in intention tremor, dysmetria, and uh, undershooting and overshooting uh, target and all that. So coming to a little more detail, when we do a cerebellar uh, examination or looking at each parts of the body, uh, with the respect to the head and trunk, the first thing you need to look at the head is the titubation. Titubation essentially refers to tremor-like movements of the head, where there's a repeated head nodding that happens. Uh, that may be seen usually uh, in when there are lesions of the superior vermis, so when there's surgery, when we do surgery in the superior vermis and split the superior vermis very widely, sometimes you get titubations. Nystagmus in the, uh, is a very vast topic, so I won't be able to cover everything. But usually the cerebellar nystagmi are uh, jerky nystagmus, the fast component towards the side of the lesion. So if you have a, a nystagmus where the fast component is towards the right side, it's usually the right cerebellar connections which are affected. 
Disarthria. Disarthria is the, uh, the, it's like how the motor uh, movements broken down in sequence steps. So when a person has got disarthria because of cerebellar uh, involvement, he's unable to smoothly complete uh, saying a word. And so polysyllabic words like Chakravarti Rajagopalaka, Chari, Rashtrapati Bhavan, when you give these kind of words to them, they will actually split them into different syllables. So he will say Chakravarti Raja, like that he will be saying. Instead of saying it smoothly in one flow, that's a scanning kind of speech that he uh, says that he scans each syllable. Uh, in the trunk, we have to elicit for trunkal ataxia. So that is elicited by basically narrowing the body center of gravity. So you have to bring the uh, both the lips very close to the lower lips. He sits on the uh, edge of a chair and the lower lips hanging out. Then bring the arms close to the, the shoulder. So you basically narrow the uh, center of gravity. And then you see whether there is uh, trunkal ataxia. So the upper limb functions, this is the commonly everybody will be doing the finger to nose to finger test. Where you check the rate, return, force, and amplitude, and also whether there's any overshooting or undershooting from the target. Uh, the disguided of is basically rapid alternating points where either pronation or uh, supination is done, or uh, uh, tapping of the hands or the palms or uh, alternately. And figure finger test and the Holmes uh, rebound phenomenon. The Holmes rebound phenomenon essentially tests where you ask the person to uh, flex the elbow and resist it, and suddenly when you release it, the elbow should normally stay there in a normal person. But here, he just again flings it towards his face or towards his, uh, his body because there, there is reciprocal antagonist antagonist actions are not well coordinated in patients with cerebellar dysfunction. Similarly, in the lower limb, the finger nose finger test, the replica of that is he, she, knee shin test, where he again check for the rate, the range, force, and the amplitude of movement. The rapid tapping of the feet helps in checking for dysdiagnosis of kinesia. And when you ask the person to draw a circle on the ground with a heel, you can look for ataxia and uh, tremors. And gait in a person with a cerebellar dysfunction, usually broad based, uh, and there may be onset of imbalance when he turns. They have got impaired tandem walking that when you ask them to place one foot in just in front of the other, they have uh, they tend to sway to either side. And the tendency to sways towards the side of the lesion. The tone in cerebellar uh, dysfunction is the, usually the tone is reduced because of the connections the reticulospinal tract and uh, vestibular spinal tract are affected. The deep tendon reflexes tend to become diminished and isolated cerebellar lesions. And we may be able to elicit the pendular knee jerk, which is because of basically hypomonia superimposed on tremor. And that causes about when there are more than two and a half oscillations of the knee when you perform the knee jerk, it's done with a pendular knee jerk. So, uh, to summarize the localization of a lesion, the vestibular cerebellum becomes vertigo and uh, nystagmus, and the spinal cerebellum or the vermis, the intermediate zone lesion, we have vermeer lesions, you have truncal ataxia, titubation, uh, intention tremor may be there. In cerebellar hemispheric lesions, there will be gait ataxia, limb ataxia. Uh, they will complain the inability to negotiate narrow corridors. Whenever there is anything, any action that requires the center of gravity of the body to be narrow, the cerebellum will not be, unless the cerebellum is functioning well, the person will not be able to do it. So just two more topics when you interest in neurosurgery. So cerebellar dysfunction and CP angle uh, lesion. When we examine for CP angle in a patient CP angle lesion, we look for the Brunn's uh, nystagmus, which is not entirely a cerebellar type of nystagmus. It is a bidirectional nystagmus, which consists of a coarser, on looking towards the side of the lesion and it's got a low frequency and it's fine it's fine on looking towards the opposite side with a higher uh, frequency so this is basically a combination of the neural integrator which is supposed to be responsible for eye movements uh, consisting of brainstem and cerebellar connections uh, and uh, as well as the uh, combination of vestibular uh, dysfunction so both of them cause this kind of nystagmus and the gait and limb bait axis that we commonly see uh, in uh, cp angle lesions is because of Compression on the middle cerebellar peduncle and not the cerebral hemisphere. So these I, I just showed it because they're very commonly asked questions in the examination. Now, lastly, coming to cerebellar mutations. This is again something that neurosurgeons see very often. Uh, it is usually seen uh, postoperatively in children in patients with uh, usually with midline uh, tumors of the cerebellum, most commonly in medulloblastoma. Or, or the fourth ventricle. So initially, when we were training, and even for the last few years, we thought that it was because of the long splitting of the inferior vermis and some damage to the dented nucleus. Um, so now we have moved forward from there, and we have used using functional MRIs. People have actually shown uh, that it is a dentato rubrothalamic tracts, and the connections of the dentato rubrothalamic tract to the olivary nucleus, which are affected during the uh, during surgery, 
And that is what probably results in cerebellar mutism. So this is an example from this, it's not my original uh, picture. These are pictures I've taken from this uh, article. So uh, this is a, a person showing a normal intact dentatorubral uh, thalamic tract, and that's a thalamus. Uh, we can uh, see that. This is normal. Uh, this is a patient in whom the left side of dentatorubral thalamic tract has been damaged, uh, where there is, he had transient uh, mutism for uh, things. And, uh, and the dentate nucleus is intact here, but it's damaged on the other side. This is a patient where bilaterally the dentatorubral thalamic tracts have been damaged, as shown here through the deficient tensor imaging. And this patient had very frank uh, mutism. Similarly, here on the other side, the same uh, patient, uh, some, uh, another patient is shown where uh, the olivary nucleus is not visualized at all in the middle of the normal uh, situation. And this is the place where you can see the hypertrophy, hyperintensity in the medulla, which refers to the region of the olivary nucleus, which is seen because there is hypertrophy of the olivary nucleus. So as soon as the initial damage occurs to the dentatorubrothalamic uh, tract connections to the olivary nucleus, there is a compensatory hypertrophic degeneration which happens in the olivary nucleus. And as months pass by, this becomes uh, atrophy. So this is another patient where there is a bilateral olivary nucleus hypertrophy. So he had a frank mutism. So these are now been shown to be the anatomical correlates for the cerebellar mutus. So what exactly happens to these children? So they are unable to speak. They have difficulty in swallowing. They have difficulty in um, uh, speaking, swallowing. The gait attacks have worsens. And some of them have emotional problems. So people have now said that it may be because of a cerebellar cerebral diastasis. Now what is meant by diastasis? Diastasis means that there is damage to one area of the brain, but a very distant area of the brain is where you will clinically localize the function. For example, when there is a speech abnormality, you would normally say it is in the frontal lobe, not, not you will not directly to the cerebral. So that is because of these pathways that connect the two are damaged. So that, that's called as a phenomenon of diastasis. So many people now think that this mutism is actually a frontal type of apraxia. And the good thing about it is most of those children usually recover in about three to six months uh, time. And some of them are left with permanent uh, dysarthria for some. So to summarize, cerebellum plays a very important role in the maintenance of cerebral posture, sequential changes in movements, and smooth transition from one movement to another. Dysmetria, ataxia, and intention tremor result from cerebral dysfunction. And it's now shown that the damage to infant cerebellum pathways and its input to the ordinary people is responsible for post-operative cerebellum. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a timely finish of the lecture. Next, I invite Dr. Jayasri to speak of an approach to movement disorders. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jayashri, consulting neurologist at King's Hospital, Secretary. I would like to thank Marin sir for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my topic is uh, approach to movement disorders. Movement disorders uh, uh, such as Parkinson's disease, tremor, tics, dystonia, these are uh, relatively common conditions which we uh, see in other day to day practice. And uh, they can be broadly classified into disorders with too little movement, that is hypokinetic disorders, and too much movement, hyperkinetic disorders. Uh, hypokinetic disorder, Parkinsonism, is the prototype. And uh, again, hyperkinetic disorders can be divided into jerky movements and non jerky movements. Uh, jerky movements uh, disorders include myoclonus, chorionic disorders, and non jerky movements, the disorders include tremor and dystonia. So Parkinson's disease is the prototype of hypokinetic movement disorder. It uh, constitutes 80% of the kinetic rigid syndrome. Uh, 
So these are all clinical di diagnoses, diagnosed based on clinical criteria and uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, the cardinal features as per the UK brain band criteria include radicalization, rigidity, rest tremor, and postural instability. Other motor features include hypomyemia, hypoponia, decreased blink rate, dysphagia, synodia, uh, hypometric circuits. So here uh, we can see a patient with uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is the classical rest tremor in a patient of Parkinson's disease. The rest tremor frequency, average frequency is 4 to 5 hertz. And uh, it's a characteristic pill rolling uh, type of tremor seen in 70 to 80 percent, which is the presenting symptom in 70 to 80 percent. And tremor can also involve the legs, uh, jaw and tongue. Other supportive criteria for Parkinson's disease include levodopa responsiveness, marked on of fluctuations, levodopa induced dyskinesias, olfactory loss, and cardiac sympathetic denervation. Here we can see a patient of Parkinson's disease having micrographia. See, quite a again. Yes. Now, see, the treatment is the first step. So, there are uh, other exclusionary criteria and red flags uh, which need to be considered in patients with Parkinson's disease. Exclusionary criteria include uh, cerebellar abnormalities, supranuclear case palsy, Parkinsonism limited to lower limbs, drug induced Parkinsonism, absence of response to levodopa, and other red flags include rapid progression to wheelchair dependence within five years and absence of progression over five years, early bulb dysfunction in five years, inspiratory strider, severe autonomic failure in five years, recurrent falls in three years, and anteriopolis and pyramidal signs. So here we can see a patient with early Parkinson's disease. We can see there is a decreased downswing in the left upper limb. Okay. We can see there is a radicalization involving the left upper limb compared to the right upper limb. This is a patient with advanced Parkinson's disease with severe freezing of gait and perspiration and severe portion of instability. This patient we are evaluating for DBS. So again, Parkinson's disease can be divided broadly into a kinetic rigid, tremor dominant, and PIGD variants. This is a patient with severe kinetic rigid variant of Parkinson's disease. Patient is totally totally and this is a patient with the tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. We can see the classical pill rolling tremor involving both upper limbs and as well as hypomyemia, decreased blink rate in the facial expression of the patient. So Parkinsonism can be classified into again idiopathic sporadic Parkinson's disease, uh, which we uh, have uh, seen before, and now uh, Parkinson plus syndrome, hereditary and acquired causes. Parkinson plus syndromes uh, common uh, include uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, MSA, uh, corticobasal degeneration, progressive palatal atrophy, and other hereditary causes of Parkinsonism include dopa responsive dystonia, Huntington's disease, Wilson's disease, NDIA. Uh, frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism and other common causes of acquired causes of Parkinson's disease include infections such as post-encephalitic Parkinsonism, HIV, SSP, CJD and drugs. Drugs are the most common causes of uh, Parkinsonism such uh, 
common drugs include anti emetics anti psychotics reserpent uh, tetrabenazine toxins mptp carbon monoxide manganese mercury ethanol valproate and rock progressive supranuclear palsy it is a parkinson plus syndrome and the uh, four features include ocular motor dysfunction vertical supranuclear gaze palsy postural instability with repeated falls and uh, echinacea gait freezing as well as cognitive dysfunction here we can see a patient with uh, tsp severe postural instability okay sir correct model the full test is positive and uh, here we can see there is a vertical supranuclear by to the lady can you see i think in the case by to the lady so cortical vessel degeneration uh, these are all classified based on the clinical criteria Uh, probable CBS. The criteria include asymmetric onset with limb rigidity, dystonia, and myoclonus, and uh, plus two of orobuckle apraxia, cortical sensory deficit, and alien limb phenomenon. Here we can see we have patients with uh, left upper limb dystonic posture, along with severe rigidity and radicalization, posture rigidity. one of the common uh, parkinson plus syndromes uh, the cardinal features include gait instability gait disturbances with recurrent falls cognitive dysfunction and urinary incontinence here we can see a patient with uh, nph <laughs> next can be more than 0.31 and also we can see diffusely enlarged subarachnoid hydrocephalus so multiple system atrophy is uh, one of the common parkinson plus syndromes uh, it is characterized by so sporadic adult onset disease with severe autonomic dysfunction in the form of urinary incontinence or orthostatic hypotension and at least uh, one of either poorly levodopa responsive parkinsonism or cerebellar syndrome and they need to have other supportive features such as rapid progression within 3 years severe instability within 3 years cranio cervical dystonia exacerbated by levodopa severe dysarthria within 3 years severe dysphagia within 3 years and uh, babinski sign and myotonic jerky myotonic tremor so here we can see a uh, patient with severe camelopardia with andropodia okay so can you talk about this <laughs> yeah. so now come to hyperkinetic syndromes uh, they are classified into jerky and non jerky hyperkinetic syndromes Uh, jerky syndromes include uh, chorionic myoclonus and non jerky syndromes include tremor and dystonia chorea uh, it is uh, uh, characterized by unpredictable contractions involving the, the limb space and drug and they have they are characterized by variable speed direction and time flowing from one part of the body to other uh, whereas the acidosis is characterized by slow movements slow lifting movements with the sinus quality and and involving distal extremities and face palsy is characterized by proximal large amplitude movements with flinging or kicking character the structures involved include cordae nucleus putamen subcutaneous nucleus thalamus and the interconnecting pathways again the chorea chorea can be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive most common autosomal dominant uh, causes include uh, huntington's disease uh, huntington's like one and two benign hereditary chorea and others include drpla neuroferritinopathy and autosomal recessive uh, causes common causes include frederick's ataxia ataxia pelagic ectasia uh, chorea acanthocytosis ncl and pk 
Acquired causes include the uh, autoimmune cerebrovascular or toxic. Again, autoimmune the common conditions include auto antiphospholipid syndrome, autoimmune encephalitis, behesis, um, celiac disease, sarcoidosis, jogrens, and SLE. And cerebrovascular causes uh, can be due to ischemic stroke, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, AV malformations, and toxic or metabolic causes include. Uh, Alcohol intoxication or withdrawal, carbon monoxide, manganese, mercury. And these are the very common causes which we see in day-to-day uh, -day practice. Uh, such patients with hypo or hypernatremia, hypo or hyperglycemia, hypo hypercalcemia, hyperthyroidism, hepatic failure. So this is a patient of uh, uh, presented with the involuntary movements of left upper limb. But the patient came with stroke of uh, left MCA infarct causing right hemiparesis, but because of high blood sugars, patient developed involuntary movements, that is chorea of left upper limb. So this is hyperglycemia induced hemichoria. And this is a patient uh, of Huntington's uh, disease. We can see so this patient presented with the hyponatremia and the uh, large amplitude thinning movements involving left upper lip. Coming to text. Ticks are uh, characterized by repeated, repeated intermittent movements, which are briefly suppressible by the patient. Uh, but they will have an urge to perform the movement. And uh, the ticks can be either brief uh, motor movements or utterances. It can be motor ticks or vocal ticks. Again, they are uh, classified into primary and secondary. Primary ticks can be transient motor or phonic ticks of less than one year. Chronic motor or phonic ticks more than one year, adult onset recurrent ticks and torrent syndrome. Secondary ticks can be seen in uh, other inherited disorders like uh, Huntington's disease, neuroacanthocytosis, NBIA, tuberous sclerosis, Wilson's disease, infection, drug induced, other causes such as trauma and stroke. This is a patient of adult onset motor ticks. <laughs> This is a young uh, adolescent Coming to myoclonus, myoclonic jets are sudden onset brief shock like movements. They are again divided into positive myoclonus, which is due to muscle contraction, and negative myoclonus, which can be due to brief loss or inhibition of muscle tone. Um, again, they are again divided into rhythmic and uh, arrhythmic. Rhythmic myoclonus is seen in spinal segmental myoclonus and hereditary cortical myoclonus. Arrhythmic uh, myoclonus is seen in polymyoclonus and MSA. This is a patient uh, of uh, uh, alcoholic uh, presented with uh, severe myoclonic jerks uh, due to hepatic encephalopathy. You can see that it's a negative myoclonus, so not able to maintain the posture. This is a patient of uh, bicellular juncture encephalitis who came with myoclonic jerks. We consider the possibility of uh, progressive encephalomyelitis with the rigidity and myoclonus syndrome in this patient. Uh, 
but he also had other uh, involuntary movements involving the face and his electrospasms and boromandibular dystonia. Possibly weak syndrome. So again, myoclonus can be classified into focal, based on the distribution, focal, multifocal, segmental, and generalized, and based on the etiology, it will be physiological, essential, epileptic, and symptomatic, and based on the anatomical involvement, cortical, subcortical, spinal, peripheral. Symptomatic myoclonus can be uh, due to disorders of basal ganglia, infections or post infection, or metabolic. Uh, due to other metabolic causes like hyperthyroidism, hepatic, renal, hyponatremia. A central tremor, uh, the tremor it is the most common cause of action tremor. It involves bilateral, upper uh, limbs are commonly involved, and uh, it is aggravated on bold directed movements such as drinking from glass, finger nose type. And the frequency is a high frequency tremor, 6 to 12 hertz. Here we can see the drinking from glass or glasses. Affected the patient that they should them. And this is a finger nose test showing the severe rhythmic movements, high frequency, tremor, action rhythm. Could you check the chain? Yes, Dystonia is a characterized by sustained intermittent muscle contractions causing abnormal repetitive movements. It can be it is a pattern and twisting movements characterized by and it is again classified based on the onset, uh, young onset less than 21 years and late onset more than 21 years. And the features include action or task specificity, overflow phenomenon, diurnal variation. And again, based on the body distribution, it can be classified into focal, segmental, multifocal, generalized. And hemidystonia, and based on the temporal presentation, can be persistent action specific, diurnal, paroxysmal, and based on associated features, it can be isolated or combined. And based on the etiology, it can be classified as inherited and acquired. This is a patient of uh, adult onset dystonia. She presented with one year history of uh, generalized dystonia, basically involving the head, neck, and trunk. Again, inherited dystonias can be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Autosomal uh, uh, dominant uh, dystonias include early onset generalized dystonia, lupa response dystonia, adolescent onset dystonia, of mixed type, cranial and vagal dystonia, paroxysmal kinesigenic and non kinesigenic dyskinesia, and uh, autosomal recessive. Common is a dopa responsive dystonia, attacks at elangiotasia, chorea canthocytosis. This is a patient uh, of a paroxysmal kinesigenic dyskinesia. I think it is. The moment we have one. Patient uh, responds uh, in broad remarkably after starting her Okay. Okay. Quite dystonia can be due to perinatal injury, centrovascular accident, brain injury, drugs, and infection, and neoplastic and paraneoplastic, and also due to toxic problems. Dystonia syndromes, again, they can be focal segmental dystonia, Parkinsonism syndromes. This is a patient with oral mandibular dystonia. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Just... This is a cervical. Dystonia. Focal dystonia respond remarkably to Botox injections. Cardiac dyskinesia, these are very common symptoms which we see in day to day practice. Uh, they are uh, mostly medication induced hyperkalemic movement disorders, and uh, these include. The dyskinesia can have a spectrum of chorea, dosis, stereotypic dystonia, and the ticks and uh, the disc and respiratory dyskinesia. The most commonly implicated drugs include first generation antipsychotics, and in second generation antipsychotics, highest risk is for risperidone and intermediate for alpiprazole and alanzapine, ziprazidone. Metoglopramide, which is commonly used uh, as an antiemetic, is the major cause of cardiac dyskinesia. <coughs> 
So this is one the, the female patient who presented with uh, these movements. She was on respirator for two years. So here we can see a rhythmic movement of mouth and lips. And the very common starting uh, dyskinesia syndrome seen after respirator. And levodopa induced dyskinesia are very commonly seen in patients of Parkinson's disease after having years. They are again divided into peak dose dyskinesia and diphasic dyskinesia. So here we can see an advanced Parkinson patient. In all stage, she is having continuous inflammation. This is the peak dose inflammation. Continuous of the volumes. This is a Parkinson's patient post DBS, but uh, he had a uh, dopamine dysregulation syndrome. He was continuously taking uh, uh, levodopa every two hours and he developed a diaphasic dysphagnation. <laughs> So this was one typical patient of Parkinson's disease post DBS. Recently she got admitted with us with the severe violent dystonia. <laughs> 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 But after the patient was on a very small dose of levodopa, only half uh, of levodopa 125 mg. But after stopping levodopa and adjusting the stimulation, the patient was totally normal. He was walking. Mm. So hemifacial spasms, these are involuntary uh, spasms of one side of the face. Uh, there are the characteristics twitching on one side of the these are seen in uh, patients with uh, uh, some psychological disturbances, uh, anxiety, depression, and other pain syndromes. Again, abruptly it progress uh, to maximum severity uh, rapidly. Functional tremor is the most common functional movement disorder. Others include functional dystonia, functional gait, functional myoclonus, functional Parkinsonism, and functional tics. How much time do you like to take? This is the patient with functional tremors. Yes, the characteristic features of functional disorders include variability, entrainment, and distractibility. Here we can see the tremor. Whereas on distraction, it is the tremor. This is another functional tremor seen in a female patient after a quarrel with the daughter in Thank you. Thank you for giving this. Thank you, Dr. Jayasri, for the excellent video demonstration together with the approaches for the movement disorder. May I request Dr. Nair? Interesting topic. How many neurochemistry residents here raise that? So you can do it here. It's not just an anatomical talk. Eh? It is for the uh, neurosurgeons. And I have so many slides. I will show only 30 or 40. Rest I will give to minors. It will be put on the website. Eh? It's not just anatomy. Eh? It is uh, functional anatomy. Applied anatomy for the neurosurgeon. So if you have any doubt, luckily it is not coming. It's not coming. So what I will do, I, I have I have been asked to talk on uh, uh, applied anatomy of veins and also arteries. Eh? I will restrict. Uh,
If I'm lucky, it won't work out. So. But, yeah. Basically, there's so many new terminologies have come. Uh, because, you know, endoscopy is coming in a big way. All of you should learn endoscopy also. So it is coming in a big way. So, so many new terminologies are coming in curling, uh, not curling. Have <laughs> Don't worry, just relax. I am renaming it, otherwise I will... Uh... What is happening in the program? We have closed it. This is our one, right? Yeah. Yeah, after that, we'll get there, right? I'm putting one I because there's so many things with the same name now. I will copy it to one thing. What takes only one day? This, this laptop has to go off, no? Who are the people from Hinduja Hospital? Hinduja, Hinduja Hospital. Two students have come. Who are they? Raise your hands. Hinduja. Where? They have disappeared. Right? Okay. Yeah, 
Okay. Here I start. Okay. I think sometimes it may not be the correct order. Okay. So my job is to talk to you about some uh, something which is happening in the anatomy of cerebral circulation, right? So when myself, Professor Shastri, Professor Gopas, and all of us studied, so, uh, this, you know, we used to study this by 1930th classification of feature, by segments in the retrograde way, and which were changed totally by Mutlier et al. in the middle of 1990s. And that classification everybody followed, right? Like, you know, these uh, segments, all of you know, you don't have to to teach you all these segments. But importantly, I have to talk about two segments. Eh? One is a lacerum segment, which is from the petrous canal, where the petrous canal ends till the petrolingual ligament. You are seeing that mark there. Then after that, it becomes the <coughs> cavernous segment. So this is all we know. Uh, so, but you know, some great surgeons who used to do skull base surgery in that time, one is you have seen that the yellow of Lallingham Chagher. He told this classification is of no use. So why he told? Because, you know, he said this, this he told that anatomy study should be on, based on constant anatomical structures like carotid foramen, canal, petrous bone, petrolingual ligament, and rings. So what he did based everything on dural. He told it should be cervical. He showed the extra cranial, extra dural. Petrus is intra osseous, extra dural. Cavernous is inter dural, intra cavernous. Clinodal is inter dural, para cavernous. Cisternal is intra dural, intra cisternal. So he removed all that uh, lateral segment and also ophthalmic segment, posterior communicating, everything he removed. So he said, uh, the term lateral segment, which used to be called the trigeminal segment, cannot be justified as internal carotid artery doesn't pass through foramen lateral. And in most of the specimens, lateral foramen is under the dural layer of cavernous sinus. So that was his explanation for removing lateral segment. And uh, it was because he used to do a lot of skull base surgery. And of many of us who have done middle process surgery, we hardly ever see lateral segment, which is because it is under the uh, trigeminal ganglion and V3, and it is covered by this petrolingual ligament. Then there came a big uh, era where the endoscopic surgeons they started attacking uh, uh, many of the lesions uh, to the foramen lacerum, everything through extended endoscopic transmaxillary transterigoid approach. And they swallowed two terms. That is the lateral segment and the cavernous segment. They totally swallowed these, these two terms and made two uh, things. Uh, one is the paraclivin. I cannot move it. You have a pointer here. Paraclivin, carotid, and then paracellar. So what they removed is they removed lateral segment and cavernous segment and made to paracellar and paraclival segments. And there was a lot of confusion. What is this paraclival segment? And this man, Harry Van Lover, he's a big man. So he is from Tamba. He is so he is, he is told that lateral and ascending cavernous carotid should be included under paraclival segment. So that was his contention. But then people <laughs> described the space call, which is actually pre-cavernous. This is post lateral. There is a small part here. They call this as the paraclival or paratrigeminal segment. Understand, it is not the whole lateral and ascending cavernous, but a few areas. After the lateral segment, for the cavernous segment, cavernous segment, that is called, it is called the transitional segment or a paraclival segment. Why it is important? This is the, what you should know. Why this very thing should come, right? Because this was redefined by this man, great man in Miranda, 
Miranda at all. They have described this segment. Why? And it is between this, you know, distal to the... This all will come here. Don't take photograph. I will give you everything. It is distal to petroclavial ligament and proximal to a trigeminal membrane. This trigeminal membrane extends along the upper border of V2. V2 forms the lower border of cavernous sinus. V2 is the lowermost border of cavernous sinus. So upper border of V2 to porous and this is from the petroclavial ligament. A small area. You can see here. This area. This should be called the Paraclival segment or it all in pre cavernous segment. Why it is important? That is what you should know. So, this is, you know, this is the paraclival carotid. You know, this area only people are talking because it gives access to the space through a part of the carotid which is outside the cavernous side. There is no bleeding there. So, it has come out of the petrolingual ligament. And it has not entered the cavernous sinus. So there is a carotid there which is devoid of any venous talent. And you can access this area, which is called the quadrangular space, which also I will tell. And you can access into this area. And this is, you know, this is medial to this carotid, paraclimal carotid, lateral to the Meckel scale. You can open this area and there is no blood vessels there. That is the importance, it is coming in a big way, all extended approaches. Eh? And you can go through, these are the, from the front, you trace median nerve or this terigo sphenoid fissure. It leads you to the bottom of foramen lacerum. And foramen lacerum, you extend up, you, say, you can trace the lacerum part and enter into that area. So people do this extended approaches and reach this area. This is the foramen lacerum. You can trace up, not only that, you can transpose the paraclival carotid. If you transpose the paraclival carotid medially, you enter into the clivus. You transpose it laterally. You, sorry, if you transpose it laterally, you enter into the clivus. You transpose it medially, you enter into the pita sapon. So this area is very important. Right? You can attack that. Lumbar scale, you can go to infratemporal fossa, jugular foramen. You can see where they are doing it. Yeah? And this is one of our excellent surgeons, Chitra. He is a big man. If you want to learn this surgery, come to Chitra Institute, learn from Ragas Nair. Right? He, he does that. So I will skip from uh, this segment. Hope I have taught you something. So the, there is one segment called transitional segment which is after the after the lacerate segment before the cavernous segment why it is important there are no veins surrounding that you can access that through the nose and there is no bleeding you can reach that area and reach this quadrangular area hopefully i will come out of that now we go to cavernous segment why cavernous segment has become suddenly very important because for the neurosurgeon Tumors can extend to the cavernous sinus. And these days, this is the cavernous carotid. It is attached by so many ligaments, which we never knew. Previously, people used to even ask whether there is any medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Now we know there is a medial wall of the cavernous sinus, which is attached by so many ligaments. The inferior paracellar, carotidoclinoid, superior lateral posterior. Extra posterior, all the ligaments are attached from the carotid to the medial wall. And you know, I hope that he is not put the same thing. So, so you can mobilize or resect the medial wall. Resection of the medial wall has become very important for especially secreting tumors of the pituitary. Uh, like in you know, a corticotropic adenoma or a GF secreting adenoma. GF secreting adenoma, even if there is no lateral extension to the cavernous sinus by MR, still people have found that if you remove the medial wall, you get cure, right? So these are, you, you can, there are so many articles that have come, the section of the medial wall, and you can transpose the, I, I will show in some other uh, thing again, you can transfer the pituitary for this section, the posterior clinoid. So that is the importance of cavernous carotid for neurosurgery. Cavernous carotid is important because 
There are ligaments attached from the medial wall of the cavernous sinus to the cavernous sinus, to the cavernous carotid, and you have to cut these ligaments, which I will show in my evening lecture. And next, all of us, I will skip this, you know, cavernous sinus is important for us because of this dural fistula. I quickly go to clinoidal segment. Eh? It is the shortest of the segment. I just want to tell you one thing. Eh? It is between the two dural rings, you know. This is the upper ring and this is the lower ring. Eh? The upper ring is not horizontal. It slows. It slows from lateral to medial, anterior to posterior. So you have medial to the carotid. You get a small space, which is called the carotid cave. I'm sorry, something. So, uh, so this is called the carotid cave. You are seeing a uh, uh, pouch there, medium to the carotid. <laughs> what a time to get this fan called. Eh? So, 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 you know, so, so this, this is, you know, you get this face here. Eh? This face, you know, is actually, you know, you always, you know, when the carotid artery comes out of the outer ring, it becomes ophthalmic segment. So people uh, describe intradural segment at level of the anterior clinoid process. It is not like that. There is a pouch like that where an aneurysm can form. This aneurysm, if you look by the level of anterior clinoid, it looks like a clinoidal aneurysm. But they are not clinoidal aneurysm. They are ophthalmic segment aneurysm, carotid cave aneurysm. So can I move out of that? This is a typical example of a cave aneurysm. Eh? Then I, I, I will finish and all. Sometimes, you know, this, uh, uh, these are these things you should know. This aneurysm <laughs> can arise from the ophthalmic segment. Eh? They are important because there are various aneurysms. Eh? It could be either the uh, dorsal wall aneurysm. Dorsal wall aneurysm arise from the dorsal wall, you know, the, this is the carotid artery coming from posterior to anterior in the cavernous sinus. Carotid artery coming from posterior to anterior in the cavernous sinus. This is the ventral wall. Ventral wall is up, dorsal wall is down. So then it comes, so what happens? The ventral wall becomes the inferior wall. Dorsal wall becomes the inferior wall. So that confusion everybody has. So this is a Dorsal wall aneurysm means they are sitting on the top now. So that aneurysm will close the siphon as opposed to a ventral wall aneurysm. Ventral wall aneurysm will open the siphon. Understand? That is the way you should know what, why it is important. Important because you know these aneurysm press the optic nerve. They are just crushing the optic nerve. Dorsal wall aneurysm. This is the dorsal wall aneurysm you are seeing. It's just compressing the optic nerve. Right? So the thing is, you know, for any aneurysm to clip, you should have a, you should get into the proximal leg. And you should also have a proximal control of the carotid artery, which is, impo it is impossible unless you take out this ball, which is the anterior clinoid process. So for dorsal wall aneurysms, you can see here how how the, this clinoid process, how it is obstructing the proximal neck and proximal uh, carotids for which you have to uh, take out this thing. And so and I don't want to teach you about anterior clinoid activity. I don't have time for that intra, extra, neural. And uh, I will skip all this. And communicating segment, sometimes you know, communicating segment is after ophthalmic segment. So that can also have a very short supraclinoid segment. And there are so many measurements for which also, for a single peak of aneurysm, if the supraclinoid segment is small, you have to still do an anterior clinoidectomy. And there are so many persistent vessels, you know, and the, the earliest vessel to form is the proatlantal intersegment, the last to form is the And the way it disappears is the other way around. And these are uh, some of the things you should know some of the time. This persistent trigeminal usually is found, right? And these are some of the examples of that. Circle of Phyllis and Clipping. All of you know all variations. I just want to show you an anterior cerebral artery. And these are the various segments. For the neurosurgeon, I want to show what is it. I am skipping, skipping, all communicating artery. And this is what I want to show. This is the 
H2 this is the aqua matrix. And you know, sometimes aneurysm, all these aqua aneurysm can have various projections, a superior projection. This comes between two A2. Download an inferior projection is very easy. Usually it is a dominant A1 which supplies a downward projection. So you go from the side of dominant A1. What about superior projection? It is not like that. When the art, when the A form is projecting superiorly, next slide will show. So this is a natural view. Eh? Normally two A2s they don't oppose approximately. Eh? So you know this is called a fork. You are injecting from this side, and you are seeing that the side from where you inject that A2 is posterior. The contralateral A2 is anterior. So that is called an open fork. Understand? So when you when you have to do surgery for a superiorly projecting aneurysm, go from the side where the ischialateral A2 is posterior. That means that is going from the side of open form. If you go, suppose this A2 is coming like that. Suppose this A2 is coming like that. Your aneurysm will be between two A2s. You know, it will be difficult. So I, I will skip all of this. I don't want to teach you all. You can teach me all anomalies, hemisphere, everything. And this is how myself, Professor Subhash, called Professor Shafri, we all used to do uh, diagnose tumors, masses in our PG time, injecting and doing all this shit. And then like approach before this axial imaging, CT scan became available. We struggled. Uh, to find out that. Right? And then we don't look at that. Right? So this is middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery, all of us have this is sweet order segment curves over the insular, opercular, and cortical segment. And say, I won't waste much my time. I have to uh, tell you something. All this you know, not apply like that. And for the neurosurgeon, why it is important? Say, if you see a middle cerebral aneurysm, middle cerebral bifurcation aneurysm, if the aneurysm is projecting inferiorly and laterally, it is easy for you. You do a periodal craniotomy, aneurysm looks at you. You can go from lateral to medial. Understand? As opposed to a MC aneurysm, which is projecting superiorly or medially. You cannot circumvent lateral to medial, you cannot go. You have to have a control over M1. So you have to have a subfrontal axis of M1 before dissection. Okay. Now, just for some neurology professor call, will hit me if I don't teach them this. This is somebody has come with a wake up stroke. Okay? <laughs> so everything looks normal except one picture. Right? You will see here something called what they call the hypertensile. It is a wake up stroke. Okay? And there are uh, various uh, criteria I don't have. I will leave it for you can uh, learn from here. Right? And this patient has come to us and we have to work up quickly before patient develops big infarct. Right? Uh, so these are the attribution of all this. I will leave it to insular ribbon. And we have this Alberta scoring system, which I don't know process called whether it's still do all this and you have a score of 10. 10 is the maximum score normal people will have. Each area gets infected like that. One score is uh, reduced. So that uh, a score of zero, one means everything is one, only one area. So this patient underwent the CT and we showed a block of M1 segment. And uh, this is again, you can see a block and our people they opened it up, Sitarana Institute, our radiologist. And you have some scoring system to assess, suppose, uh, a collateral are good, then you can prognosticate that their outcome will be good. And uh, this is, you know, wake up stroke. This patient had a wake up stroke. So you don't know the time of origin. Previously, everything for one should finish within 4.5 hours. Later, they expanded to 6 hours, 6 to 16, now up to 24 hours. You can do all this. Then. So when you don't know the exact time of this onset of stroke, you can do the CT perfusion. Or also when you there is a dissociation of finding, clinical and radiological findings don't match. You do the CT perfusion and all of us know this. You know, you look at 
the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume, if both are, if both are, I think, in part code means both will be decreased. But if in ischemic penumbra, cerebral blood volume will be either normal or increased. So you can find out a, a penumbra, ischemic core, and then open it up. So this picture I will give you. Eh? And then quickly I will go to, this MRI also is another tool. Eh? Uh, so if uh, you can do present day and then MRI, you can uh, do very quick. This is a magic image, a diffusion weighted image, which will tell us the impact. And uh, I will leave, and uh, this is what you can see, perfusion image is more than diffusion. This is a ischemic penumbra. So you can go for uh, acute stroke management. And these are some of the criteria uh, for uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Eh? Candidates should have all of these criteria, NISS about six, aspects about six, uh, age about. Can this see some of the guidelines which have come? Right? Say so class one, level evidence. So this is here. But later, if you look at age to six to 24 hours, can also in selected patients, they can also go for mechanical thrombectomy, provided they satisfy these criteria, deep use criteria. I will leave it with you. Interested people can or the down criteria. So now go going back to myself, Professor Subhash, Professor Shastri is uh, here again. Sylvia boy. Eh? This is what we used to look on angiogram. Eh? So this highest medial point, and then measure the distance from the orbital loop to see whether it is depressed up and down, medially, laterally, and also the Sylvia triangle whether it is pressed down up and to see mass effect. Eh? And so this is how we used to diagnose. Quickly go into posterior circulation. All you know, posterior circulation, all segments, all of us know. I cup, I can, they have inverse relationship. Uh, so I, I will go through all, skip all this. Eh? Uh, uh, one should know in a lateral spilling, the highest hump, you can see a hump here. This is the cortigeminal part. Eh? Uh, so that's what you should know, area you supply. This is for neurosurgeons. This is for the neurosurgeons. Eh? If, you have, if you are doing a theriotal surgery, eh? you have to go to the interpendicular fossa. What structure obstructs you? It will be internal character. Internal character artery will be in the, So like a basilar, you have to reach the, we see the basilar artery through a theriotal approach. Eh? Uh, so, and very high up, you know. Uh, so, here you are saying internal, internal cerebral artery is coming, dividing into middle cerebral artery, AC. You cannot see anything inside. Eh? Uh, because, you know, uh, these are the windows you, you use to go inside. So, the, uh, especially the carotid oscillometer window. So, there are some obstacles. Eh? That obstacles are this uh, uh, traditional window you do, say, Obstacles are, you know, you have to remove this, you have to uh, mobilize this carotid artery, medially. <laughs> so if you mobilize this carotid artery medially by doing an anterior clinoidectomy and de-roofing the optic canal, and then mobilize the optic canal medially, straight you look at the basilar artery. Understand? So these are the limitations. You have the anterior clinoid, ICA branches, oculomotor nerve, and you do anterior clinoid activity, mobilization, and you can do everything including posterior clinoid activity. Now, coming quickly to, we, how, how much time I have that? Now, I have to talk on veins also. Just a few minutes, veins, you know, they don't have valves. They can have bidirectional flow. They do not accompany any arteries. And drainage territories do not mirror arterial distribution. And always it is difficult to define a normal plan. So accurate, so because the displacement of waves, it provides more accurate localizing information to a, a neurosurgeon. And in the ventricular system, that landmarks are much more important. And it is divided into superficial deep groups. I don't want to teach you all this. Eh? Sinuses, anastomotic veins. You should teach me. I will give this presentation to you. Deep veins you should know. And uh, sinuses, I am just skipping. Uh, at least you should know. Uh, the, 
let me at least you know examination we will ask about this subtle way in the cerebral way thalamus right way these things we will ask in the exam i will leave this presentation to you eh? torcular transverse sinus sigmoid sinus i am skipping all this i am giving to you uh, but I, I this is a good picture to show uh, internal cerebral way you can see internal cerebral way brain of gallon etc here and anastomotic veins very important anastomotic veins uh, uh, i don't have to i don't have time to teach you about anastomotic veins eh? posterior fossa veins very important uh, because you know you do retrosigmoid surgery all these veins uh, converge and then drain to this uh, petrocell vein uh, so this, uh, this superior petrocell vein whether it can be sacrificed or not uh, sometimes you know you do a posterior fossa petrus you know petroclavel meningioma through a retrosigmoid route moment you knock off this vein you are right in the tumor but sometimes you, you may not be able to uh, take it out. So how you do that? So there, is, there, there is some, uh, if the veins are more than 3 millimeter, you all you will do uh, contrast studies with ICG. Uh, after walking, you can find out uh, this venous training. But apply the anatomy. It took two minutes for me. Applied anatomy is two minutes for me. Eh? So whether you can sacrifice these veins eh, when you do surgery. Eh? Sometimes you may have to sacrifice this vein. Eh? Sometimes you see the lapine any time it is frightening. Even if you open, you can just manage that without occluding the sinus. So when you go along the parks, especially in the anterior part, these veins are of not much uh, problem. Um, and in subfrontal approach, these bridging veins hardly ever come. And this terional and subtemporal approach it is important because, you know, this superficial middle cerebral vein, they drain through sphenoparietal sinus into the cavernous sinus or pterygoid tract. So sometimes you have to sacrifice this sphenoparietal sinus so, so that you can mobilize the temporal lobe posteriorly uh, to go to uh, uh, baseline area like that. Many people do that. Eh? And also these veins are important because sometimes anatomy may not be, uh, this sphenoparietal vein may not be draining to cavernous sinus. Instead, it will be draining to petrocell uh, vein or to the, uh, uh, what is the other way, name I forgot. In that case, you cannot uh, sacrifice that vein. So, pineal, all of us know, sacrifice, localizing value superficial veins are there. Uh, uh, so, what will you do when there is sinus wall injury? Small things you can close with interrupted sutures. Large tears, you have to digate the vein. And or sometimes you can also put these pads. So, what do you do when there is big bleeding from the sinuses? What do you do? Correctly, you should do. You apply the pressure and then pray to God. <laughs> that is the first thing you should do. And sometimes it works. Eh? Many a time, God is kind. Eh? Okay, I think I'll uh, end here. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. I, I thank uh, Professor Manas, sir, for giving us the opportunity to chair the session. So thank you. So we are moving on to the next uh, MCQ test. I would request each of the ma'am to so moderate the MCQ test. I request all the participants to use the same uh, name word to enter. Because finding the names is very important to the judgment later. So you have you are all tuned to the quiz by now. So please, as he has instructed, please put the same names because we have to find the winners from you all, right? So don't confuse us with many names and then claim for the prize. So can we go ahead? Yes. And so 
So this is the third phase, right? I think uh, we can go next because everyone knows now. So all set? <laughs> yeah, they have opened the app and the people. It's getting generated. <laughs> okay, so the pin is on your screen. Four five six nine three six four. Four five six nine three six four. All done. No, no. One hundred and twenty. Above online office then. And it's done. It's done. So here goes your first question. Intradrenal veins are different from its systemic counterpart, counterpart except like valves can have bidirectional flow, accompany arteries or drainage territories do not mirror arterial distribution. Your time starts now. Because I used to have Yeah, there was a technical error. Okay, we'll go to the next question. We'll leave that question. All and through of common etiologies of post operative venous infarct, except in avoided coagulation or tear of bridging vein following resection of glioblastoma. Repair of traumatic dural venous sinus, cannulation of neck veins, or intra or post operative dehydration. Start now. So we go to the third question. So the next uh, question will be average frequency of rest tremors in patient with Parkinson's disease. Ten to twelve hours, thirteen to fifteen, four to five, or one to two.
So yeah, Kevin is looks like I know whenever we do quiz, I remember some Kevin used to be when we did online also last time when I say it was some Kevin who did. I don't know if the same person or not. That Kevin is completed, I think. Following other cardinal features of Parkinson's disease, that's for UKPT brain bank criteria, except rest trauma, bradykinesia, hypomyemia, and postural instability. I think the, the mobile they are getting the correct one, two, three, four, like that. No, we do it later. Then maybe we we'll club for this one with the next one. Answering no? 130 minutes. Time is not coming. That's 10 seconds should come. Then I will increase now to 20 seconds. Now it's the it's 10 or 20. No. 20 seconds is there. Yeah. So and the right answer is uh, check. This is check the right answer is ticked. So and most of them have answered correctly. Yeah. So the, the, next. Next. Asking the patient. Oh, that is done. Okay. A patient with a lesion in the right frontal lobe can have gait ataxia because of involvement of corticospinal tract, corticopontine, corticopontocerebellar, frontal aslan tract. One thirty four have answered, and uh, the right answer is what you want to celebrate, right? Uh, and most of them have answered correct. So, Dikti is leading, and Kevin and Chandrasekhar is third. Okay. Next. Which is the last to regress among primitive car carotid basilar anastomosis, persistent trigeminal, otic, hypoglossal, proatlanto, intersegmental? And now it's gone. Okay. So the correct answer, please. Atlanta, 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 So I think twenty seconds is over, right? So what's the answer, please? Uh 
think we can uh, we'll just take a break because uh, they have to fix up the internet something so it would take a couple of minutes to uh, sort out that internet uh, issue meanwhile i would request dr g uh, maleshwar rao sir who is Emeritus Professor of Neurosurgery at Raya Medical College, Kakinada, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at Apollo Hospital, Kakinada, to come on to the stage. He, sir, wants to address the gathering. Sir, please come on to the stage. Uh, good morning. Very happy to see so many pages. I request Dr. Manas to come. Please come. Yeah. Here is a man who is exemplary to the postgraduates. I know him since 1970 when he was in Nimhans. He was a postgraduate like you, and I was also a postgraduate, but I am a service postgraduate. He is a direct postgraduate. I did five years Jamsatri and then came to Nimhans. So what we had to learn from this uh, uh, my friend Dr. Maras is once he finished the post-graduation like you, he not only quit the uh, academic work, simultaneously he is doing surgeries, getting famous in Hyderabad and producing more papers and he is very active in Norlaskar Society of India. Not only that, he started a particular program for the post graduate which I have not missed a single one, that is exam online. May have you all of you are seeing or not? In any of you seen exam online? So he is the man who started that exam online. So there are two tigers. One is a paper tiger who produces papers, but when asked to do surgery, he may not be able to do. And the other is the real tiger. And I feel that our manas is the real tiger. Yeah. What is the presentation we all gave the all NSI members of India given to him in, in recognition of his a lot of work, scientific work, and also academic work. He is a mm, stimulus to the post Tomorrow you will become MC after MCH. It is a stimulus for, for, for you to go simultaneously with the teaching and also a surgical activity. He has now become MSA president. I don't know whether Sar, Sar has to tell you the state of president elect. elect, but he will become president next year. Next, next year. He is president elect means the almost he is the president. <laughs> More than <laughs> so, to finish my talk, my wish is it is not the end for him. For Modi, it is the end. <laughs> but for him, it is not the end. You may ask me what is the next. I wish him to become WFNS president. That is worth the fundraising to the So now I want to illustrate my. <laughs> Madam, it's also here, so why don't you please come and join us? Please come. <laughs> Actually, sir, called me two days back and he said to keep this whole mission a secret. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could not get it in the morning, and uh, when he came, I was not there. So, now. Thank you, Thank you, sir. It is not only you. We all wish what you have wished just before. Thank you once again. The, now the internet issue is being solved. I request each other to take over the mic again.
So Krishna has come up and uh, Kevin is there. So let's go back. Yeah. 19 year being presented in modern tics, phonic tics, ADHD, yes. What, what's the back? They again have to go to that field. Four, five, six, nine, three, six, four. Just four. Now. So done, right? They're not getting internet properly, I think. There is a lag for all of you. You're ready. You, you got entered the pin or what's the problem? Okay. Uh, you're using your own broadband or the Wi Fi? Yeah, gone. Wi Fi is there here. Huh? In, uh, huh? Okay, we'll clock the next one. Maybe try to, uh, what the password of the Wi Fi is. Try your uh, uh, Wi Fi room number and name and see if it's password or not. It works. Huh? Fast. But they're telling they're on the on the road, not on the hotel wi right? Otherwise, you have to come out of Wi-Fi, put it off, and then use your own uh, data. That will work. It. Working? Yeah, uh, no, no, we can have the session later, but we should sort out before going for lunch this one. Uh, can, yeah, can, yeah, if I use my own data, it's coming. Why can you put it off and then use your own data? It's coming. It's coming. No. Is working? How many are still not working? Not working? In both ways, it's not working. Why do you The game pin will give, huh? Roaming. Roaming is in India. Roaming is on. We put it. Uh, means you want green pin or? Okay. Yeah, so. It's slow, is it? Okay. Then phones. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can get another wife. We'll have a wife, better wife in the room, something after lunch. Huh? Then mobile house is not working there. Mobile is not. Um, we can't have a poster or anything. How many of you is working and how many not working? Can... Not. Okay, not working is like uh, 20 people or 100 are working? Not working. Let's check what it is. Maybe you'll understand one of them. Not what is because in my phone it's working for oh. yes.
Yeah, we'll sort out of this issue, go for lunch, and then have the. We'll just wait for some time. So we'll sort out here. Five minutes. Yes, yes. We'll just wait for a couple of minutes till this gets solved before we proceed for the lunch. Uh, so thank you, chairpersons. I request Suchanda Ma'am to come and uh, just hand over the token of appreciation to the chairpersons, please. Thank you. I request chairpersons to be remain on the stage, and I will call upon Dr. Ranjit uh, to come on the stage to receive the amendments. And Dr. Jay Sri, ma'am, please come out to the stage. Next, please, Dr. Suresh Nair, please come. Thank you, sir. Kindly you take your seats. Let's all break for the session for the lunch. And I request all the participants to gather back as soon as possible as we're running late of the session. So lunch is uh, arranged in the third floor. And we have a staircase on the right hand side of the hall on this side. And you can even take the staircases, the participants, and even the elevators on the other side.
A very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. <coughs> So we are beginning with the session two, that is post slides on. We have some questions left in the quiz. Uh, if you test the three, we are going to club in the, the next MCQ test. So before that, we have two presentations. In order to start this, I would request Dr. BJ Rajesh, sir, and Dr. RTS Naik, sir, to come on, chair the session, sir. So the pending quiz will be clubbed with the next uh, MCQs so that we don't lose much time. There is one more small announcement. We request participants who are interested to uh, share their case presentations can come and come forward and so give their names. Good afternoon. Uh, the second session of uh, today's topic will be uh, uh, without wasting much time, we'll uh, start with the clinical. Uh, uh, this is a clinical approach in a patient with visual loss. I invite Dr. Asa Thakur for giving this talk. Thank, Thank you. I have a presentation now. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me once more. Uh, so what I'll be dealing today is uh, right now is with acute visual loss and you would all agree with me that uh, so many times and especially in visual loss patient would have a history of vision loss and nothing more than that no MRI will support you many a times your most of investigations will not, not are not going to support you and the only tool is you have is the most important tool which you know is your history and your examination <clears throat> and it's true believe me both for neurological and for neurosurgical causes, let's see why. So you need to follow a systematic approach when it comes to acute visual loss. And as we have depicted in this chapter, in this book, the systematic approach goes like this. <clears throat> the first question to be answered is, is this visual loss only transient or is it persistent? Is it unilateral or bilateral? And is it static and or it is, is it progressive? The other clues which you are going to get are from the other things, triggers, temporal profile, associations, and pattern of visual loss, especially on visual field examination. You can examine through confrontation or you can get a visual field done. So now let's talk about this example. A 63 years old female comes to us with intermittent loss of vision for a period of one month. And look how she describes her vision loss. A painless, curtain-like vision starts from the upper half and complete loss over few seconds. This is typical of a vascular cause, which is happening, hyperperfusion, secondary to the carotid stenosis. Amorosis fugix should always be remembered. Remember that we have many causes of transient visual loss. But what you need to definitive rule, definitely rule out is a vascular lesion. So always keep it in mind. How many of you are feeling sleepy right now? How many of you are having black curtains in front of your eyes? Very good. I knew that. So... It's basically because you've had food. You do not have carotid stenosis and rest of it call, sir, will tell you why you know, do not have a carotid stenosis. Remember other causes like occipital epilepsy. Remember causes like complex migraine. And remember, in these two conditions, usually positive phenomenon will occur. You'll have, you'll get something to see as against in amaurosis fugix or a vascular lesion in which you will have loss of vision, which is a negative phenomenon. 
do remember this yellow marking which i have done over here you should ask for associations like jaw claudications headache severe headache focal neurological deficits even seizures remember that giant cell arthritis is something until unless you won't think of it you will not rule out you will not send these patients to where they belong like rheumatology or neurology so now let's discuss about persistent monoocular vision loss <clears throat> remember the rule number 1 is established laterality whenever a patient comes and says that i have a vision loss why do i say so i say so because in the morning i spoke about occipital lesions and you must be remembering it's always one side of the vision it is not one eye so this demarcation has to be made whether it's a visual field loss or whether it is a unilateral eye which is being disturbed so remember unilateral may be optic nerve pathologies retinal pathologies yes even an optic chiasmal lesion is going to cause a bilateral loss but the visual field deficits will be separate you know why the patients will have bitemporal loss i'll just be covering in little further as well and the patients with posterior visual pathway will of course have a bilateral diminution of vision but in a visual field see this example a young patient comes to us with history of decreased vision from left eye only of 12 hours duration he had some other pricking sensation some skin lesions 15 days back but i'll take your attention towards this so you are able to make out it's hemorrhagic papilledema but what is the mistake we can make the mistake which we can make is not ruling out other ocular pathologies so what are the signs which can tell us that it's an ocular it's a retinal pathology and not a optic nerve pathology remember always correct the patient's visual acuity to best corrected visual acuity how can you do that by using a pin hole exactly so either use a pin hole and try to correct the patient's visual acuity and do not make a diagnosis of optic neuritis in a patient with refractive error otherwise even i'll end up having a optic neuropathy if i remove my glasses always remember to examine the patient with glasses on examine fundus not just fundus periphery so what was happening in this patient was that the retinal lesions the hemorrhages were much more scattered it was not a pure optic neuropathy so, so retinal lesions use your ophthalmoscope to look here and there also up and down also if you see anything there think that the patient might be having something else remember these all fancy names micropsia macropsia metamorphopsia what do they mean they mean something's wrong which is going on inside the papillomacular bundle inside the retina and hence the things have become either small micropsia large macropsia metamorphopsia means they have been deranged or demantled in shape and of course in older patients do remember to take or see or send for intraocular pressure examination glaucoma is a common cause of visual loss so that gets us to rule number 2 rule out a primary ocular pathology rule number 3 you feel it's an optic nerve pathology what is the test you should do to confirm that it's optic nerve pathology the test is relative afferent pupillary defect so you shine light in one eye direct pupillary reflex the pupil is going to constrict what has happening to the other eye the pupil is also constricting because there's a indirect light reflex you take the torch to that eye if this eye is normal it will further constrict but if this eye is abnormal which means if there is optic nerve pathology it is not going to constrict rather it will dilate so this is what we call as relative afferent pupillary defect so this is rule number 3 establish its optic nerve no and then proceed from here and this is a small chart which can tell you about this order so remember to correct patient's refractive error remember to see relative afferent pupillary defect and in case relative afferent pupillary defect is not there so you think of retina or even a psychogenic pathology or a cortical pathology if it is an optic nerve pathology remember this rule of thumb that it's only the optic neuritis or inflammation of optic nerve does not cause hemorrhages in on the fundus if you are getting to see hemorrhages on the fundus remember it is either increase in intracranial pressure or it is an ischemic lesion causing the hemorrhage remember that optic neuritis does not cause hemorrhage at least the typical one we have exceptions to everything in medicine i'll be talking on them as we move proceed further so fundus examination is rule number 4 so remember to hold the ophthalmoscope correctly so many a times what i have personally observed that our residents also make this mistake so if you want to see the right eye of the patient where should be the ophthalmoscope in your right hand no right hand so right eye right hand right your right eye and patient's right eye do not try to maneuver with the nose of the patient going here and there so right hand 
your right eye and patient's right eye. Similarly, left hand, left eye of the doctor and left eye of the patient. So hold the ophthalmoscope correctly. What do you see? This is what you see. So you see a beautiful optic disc sitting over here. Remember that there is a cup from where the, the vessels are all entering. Remember that you see two types of vessels. The darker ones are veins, the lighter ones are arteries, and you'll often see them crossing each other. Remember also to see the macular area. You all know how to see macular area. What is to be changed in the ophthalmoscope? The color. If you make it green, you'll easily be able to see a dark spot lying over there because you'll be shedding off all the blood supply and red free filter you can consider it to be. This is how you look at the fovea or the macula. Remember that there is mild temporal pallor which is anyways there. So it is counted, but if only clinically it is permitting you. So this is how a healthy fundus would look to you like. And I'll turn, come from here to this case. So 26 years old lady coming to you with headache, pain on eye movements and diminution of vision. So what will you think? Of course, you will think acute history. This should be inflammation of the nerve. And what is inflammation of the nerve? It's optic neuritis. And that's what you see over here. See, there is only minimal disc edema. Can you make out? So it's almost you have to appreciate it. See normal fundi. Let me take you to this fundus. Now see. So you are able to see some minimal disc edema in the, um, uh, in this, in the right eye of the patient. And what is also seen? Look here. The visual field, which is so bad. So why is the visual field so bad when there is only mild disc edema? Because nothing is happening to the periphery of the optic disc. All what is happening is happening where? Inside the core of the optic nerve. This is a typical example of optic neuritis. You'll ask me, why do we need to know? Most of them, uh, most of you are neurosurgeons. So you need to know it because you need to differentiate it from the other condition. Let's see how. So remember, there is a rule in optic neuritis. One week, the patient's vision drops. Second week, it remains static. Third week, it improves. And we call it a rule of one, two, three. Remember, there is no hemorrhage. Fine. This is one, two, three rule. And why do you need this? Need to know is this. So there was a patient who was referred to us in our neuro-ophthalmology clinic by a neurosurgeon because the patient was having visual loss again and again. The first time it was considered that the patient is having compression with the, uh, by this uh, tuberculum cell meningioma. And gamma knife was done. And the patient was also given steroids. The patient had a good visual recovery. And then the patient, after a few years, again comes. This time they thought that there is no compression on the optic nerve. Why is the patient losing vision? Then they felt that it might be the radiation which had caused it. So the patient was treated as radiation-induced optic neuropathy. But look at the and then look at the destiny of the patient. That the patient came the third time. This time they were again confused that how can radiation still keep occurring again and again? We are not giving anything. There's no compression. So why is the patient losing vision? And the answer lied somewhere in the fundi of the patient. What do you see in the fundus? You don't see the rubor. You don't see the hyperemic fundus. Am I right? You see the whitishly turned fundus, and you make out this demarcated boundary in the temporal part. You can, I'm sorry, yeah, yes, the, the, the temporal is very well demarcated, but the nasal is not very well demarcated. So it was not just something compression the optic nerves in the back. It was something which had also affected the optic nerve. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, this patient turned out to be NMO antibody positive optic neuritis. So that is why you need to know, and we had published this case as well, because this may cause the confusion. So what out of this is not optic neuritis? I told you. This can be optic neuritis and the patient is having central field defects. This, is it optic neuritis? No. What is this? This is papilledema. And what does optic neuritis cause? It causes optic disc edema. So don't call all the disc edemas as papilledema. Papilledema only when it is associated with increased intracranial pressure. These are the differences for you. And importantly, let me just highlight a few points. Hemorrhages, you will see peripheral um, uh, edema and how do you make out this edema is that the vessels which are which should be passing through these areas are no longer seen so they are obscured another important sign is this i'm oh, sorry so sorry so the another important point is this what is this so appreciate here what you see you see something some something pulsating over here these are spontaneous venous pulsations so this is the first sign to disappear in a patient of papilledema it is not very sensitive, but you need to, but it is specific enough. So if it is obscured, think that the patient may be having early papilledema. And why is this not optic neuritis? Because again, there's a hemorrhage. But in this patient, look at the beautiful fundus. So you see pallor here, then the pallor is only here. This is still hyperemic. So there is a altitudinal pallor, there's a segmental pallor with a small wedge-shaped infarct. This is a typical fundus photograph of an ischemic damage to the 
optic nerve. So this patient, 34 years old, obese lady presented with headache, transient visual obscurations, blurry vision, and look at it, such a bad looking disc. But look at the visual field, it's still preserved, right? So this is uh, optic neuritis, just for your reference so that you make the difference. So this is typical papilledema and the answer lied over here. Patient had tortuous optic nerves. Patient, uh, you can see the globe indentation over here, suggesting that this patient was having increased intracranial pressure. And you are also going to see, not just me, you're going to see in so many conditions, your malignancies, your hydrocephalus, when the patient starts to develop hydrocephalus. So that's why you need to know how a papilledema looks like. And of course, you corroborate it with the other history of increased intracranial pressure, early morning headaches, projectile vomitings, transient visual obscurations. And anybody, can you tell me, why are these visual obscurations transient because like our pulse our csf is also having good number of waves and because it has waves an optic nerve is enclosed in an enclosed sheath of subarachnoid space whenever these waves come and the pressure is high you are going to see obscurations transiently i hope it's clear to you otherwise we can discuss more after this talk so why is vision field still spared in these patients is because of this now look at look here the retinal, the peris, I'm sorry, this one, yeah. So the retinal most fibers, they will, they will enter into the optic disc in the most peripheral region. The central most fibers are entering the optic disc in the central most region. So whenever there is edema of this periphery, which is being transmitted from the CNS through the subarachnoid space. So whenever there is edema of the periphery and increased intracranial pressure, what will happen? The first sign will be your blind spot will increase because this is the blind spot. So this is going to increase. You see here? Second thing, what will happen? Because it, these are the peripheral most fibers which are entering most peripherally. The second thing is peripheral constriction. And then you'll keep having increase in the number of fibers to cause a complete visual field loss. Also why you can get visual field loss. Look at this macula. So I'm sure you must have all heard about macular star sign. This is how it looks like. Though it is not very specific for increase in tract and pressure, it can also occur in neuroretinitis. But look, look here. This is macular star. And in case macula is affected, you are going to have a complete vision field loss. Also, how you can you, can, you get a complete vision field loss with papilledema is when the patient enters an optic disc atrophic stage. This is a long-standing thing. Remember that the current patient was of idiopathic intracranial hypertension and these patients will not have any deficits in their focal neurological examination. Just for all the neurosurgeons here, look at the uh, various levels in which you can get optic disc edema, which is papilledema. This, these are the various stages. Stage 1, stage 2. Stage 1 is only when you get a small C. Stage 2, when it covers the entire disc. Stage 3, when and it starts obscuring one major vessel. Stage 4, when multiple vessels are being obscured. And stage 5 is the cox appearance because of chronic long-standing uh, papilledema. Also remember to see these lines. These can tell you about uh, the fact that the patient is having was having disc edema at any time. So you see these lines, these lines, these lines, these lines. So they are all along the papillomacular bundle. This is fluid which is there. So these are known as patterns folds. But remember this. Now is this... Your papilledema? Probably no. Why is it not papilledema? You also need to know this because look at the look at the color of the fundus. Let's let's focus on these two fundi first. Look at this yellow bad streak over here. This is a typical appearance, yellow subretinal deposit of infiltrative optic disc edema. So this is infiltration of the optic disc. You can see infiltration occurring at the other uh, retinal compartment also. And look here. So this is specifically known that yellowish subretinal deposits should be thought of as infiltrative unless proven otherwise. And why is this not just uh, disc edema? This is, this is because the patient is having other changes also. And what are these changes? Remember, these are hypertensive changes. Why did I put this slide over here? Was because I want, wanted you to know that in all patients of papilledema do see blood pressure. And the patient may actually be having an accelerated hypertension. And this is an important differential and you should remember. So now look at this eight years old boy who presented with neck pain, two episodes of vomiting and vision loss only for 10 days. And you know what's happening to this patient. This patient is having disc edema. Am I right? The patient's having disc edema. What is so classical about this, different about this disc edema? That the patient's margins are blurred of the disc, but also look at the color. It is white in color. So in reality, it looks as if the patient is having a long-standing disc edema. And what we are seeing right now is a secondary optic atrophy. Right? So now I have again put these three fundi in front of you. What is uh, similar to all these three fundi is that they are all white. Am I right? They are all white. 
So, and how are they different? Let's take one by one. So you see this white disc and you can see that the margins are very specifically demarcated. This is just like seeing a full moon in a dark black night. So this is primary optic atrophy seen in long-standing diseases, seen when the optic nerve is not being touched. And look at this, this is secondary optic atrophy, make out the difference, see the difference, see the margins. This is secondary optic atrophy and this is sectoral optic atrophy. So it's just more you see, more you learn. We have many patients who come to us with the hydrocephalus, optochiasmatic arachnoiditis, in our case, a neurology case, who get this primary optic atrophy. And what, what do you see most commonly as the cause of primary optic atrophy is? Something which is compressing optic nerve, but very posteriorly. It does not come anteriorly. This is pituitary macroadenoma. So it's a common history. Patient will come, long-standing history of vision loss, and you will just see primary optic atrophy. This is another example. You see another thing in this patient. So the disc is white. But look, what is this? These are retinal collaterals. And they will occur again in a few patients who will have some local compression and a long-standing local compression. And you see an optic nerve meningioma over here. Right? So now this patient, again, 77 years old, male, jaw claudication, presented to us with vision loss. You see this white fundus, but you also see some bad choroidal infarcts over here. This is a typical presentation of a patient with giant cell arthritis. I will not take you to this, but to this. So why I have put, I put this slide over here? Just to tell you quickly about the vascular supply of eye. You all listened the previous lecture of thalamic artery arises from intracranial artery and it goes, uh, one part of it goes into the optic nerve as a retinal artery and supplies the retina and the choroid. And the other part also gives rise to posterior ciliary artery which forms a circle of zinc and supply one part at a time which means upper part is supplied by one posterior ciliary artery Lower part is supplied by other ciliary artery and they supply this in parts. Why is it important? Because if the compression is occurring on the vein, what will happen? You'll get a backflow. And when you get a backflow, there's a splash. So this is tomato splash appearance, lots of bleeding in the retina. What will happen if the retinal artery is blocked? You'll get ischemia. You'll get a white disc, white disc and a white retina. And what will happen if one of the posterior ciliary artery is blocked? This is what we call as ischemic optic neuropathy. And this is when you get only one altitude of the air patient's visual uh, optic disc, which is getting pale. So this, this is why the ischemic optic neuropathy will cause altitudinal field effect. So binocular vision loss, I had already mentioned all the pathologies which I spoke in unilateral pathologies, if they are bilateral, it can of course cause a bilateral vision loss. But what you need to remember separately is that the patient may be having a higher visual pathway defect or cortical blindness when you are coming to know that the patient is having a binocular visual field defect. So uh, just a very quick uh, mention over here. Many a times I see that we do not know how to read visual fields. So how do you read such a visual field? You keep the right visual field test of the patient in front of your right eye. You keep the left visual field test of the patient in front of your left eye and then read. So which means you read it like the patient is doing it, like you are doing it. So now I've kept this right visual field over here in front of your right side and the left vision field over here. And what does the patient have now? It is right homonymous hemionopia. This is important because often we get confused with what patient is having and is it matching with our lesion up there. So what does this patient have now? This is right visual field. This is left visual field. What is the patient having? A left homonymous hemianopia, where should be the damage in the contralateral field, which is the right field. Yes, this patient had a stroke. So now what does this patient have? You can make out. So this is one field which is affected and one field which is affected, both temporally. This is bitemporal field effect. What does this patient have? Bitemporal hemianopia. And where is the damage? In unison, it is in optic chiasma. Excellent. And why will I show her here? Because yes, this patient came with a pituitary macroadenoma. Do remember, you all know, this is a typical sign and complete recovery after the surgical procedure. So again, bitemporal hemianopia, everybody can make out. An important cause is a toxic cause. We all treat TB. We all treat TB, so we all should know it. We all should know because the thambutol is the one which may affect chiasma in the form of chiasmitis and cause bitemporal field effect. Look here, again, this is optic primary optic atrophy because the damage is occurring in the chiasma. So remember ethambutol as a common cause of vision loss causing bitemporal hemianopia and these are the take homes from my side. Remember to see peripheral retina and establish best corrected visual equity. Remember disc edema with or without hemorrhage. With hemorrhage, increase intracranial pressure without inflammation. Remember optic atrophy can be of various types and it will help you localize your lesion. Compare the field and see the entire picture. Do not miss 
forests for the trees. This is my group from PGI. We did a national conference of neuro-ophthalmology. And thank you again, everybody, for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Asta, for a nice presentation, starting from basics to the advanced fundus examination. I feel the neurological examination is not complete without a fundus examination. And uh, I remember the neurology is in India started probably with an ophthalmoscope because in the initial days where there was no neurosurgery neurology department, our seniors used to go with a fundoscope to the general ward and uh, medical ward and see fundus examination. Anybody has the papillary edema, they used to shift them to the neurology department and do investigations like angiography and then at that time, cisternography and all the thing. That's how neurology or neurosciences in India have started. So thank you, Asta, uh, for giving a nice presentation. And we'll move on to the next uh, topic, approach to a patient with progressive paraparesis. I invite Dr. Gopi. Respected chairpersons, teachers, friends, colleagues, and dear students. Ashta played very well, like SSV Jaish Pal today. Made double century in both the topics, both arts spell lobe and visual loss. But I will do my level best. So my topic is coming from brain to spinal cord, the approach to progressive paraparesis. Paraparesis is, you know, weakness of both lower limbs. How will you approach a patient comes with weakness of both lower limbs? The weakness can be upper motor neuron type or element type. If it's upper motor neuron spastic weakness, the lesion can be in the either brain or spinal cord. If it's in the lower motor, the lesion can be either anti cell, root, plexus, peripheral nerves, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. So what are the causes of cerebral causes? Cerebral causes of spastic paraparesis. So usually you see patient, when patient had a parasagittal meningioma or unpaid anti acromeningism rupture, or superior size of sinus artery thrombosis. The common cause of cerebral cause of spastic paraparesis, some are sudden, some are insidious, and trauma. Sometimes subdural hematoma lying over the parasagittal region, it also can cause. Rarely, inflammatory lesion like encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, it can cause. Coming to spinal causes. Spinal causes, compressive myelopathy versus non-compressive myelopathies. This is very, very common. So what are the various compressive myelopathies? Maybe very important is tumors. The tumors can be epidural, intradural, or intramedullary, or epidural abscess, epidural hemorrhage, cervical spondosis, herniated disc, or sometimes post traumatic compression fractured uh, vertebral hemorrhage. Coming to various tumors, the extradural most common is metastasis, metastasis, especially from the BK part, breast, kidney, prostate, renal thyroid, lung, and all. Extramillary may be most important meningioma and neurofibroma, intramillary glioma, ependymoma, and astrocytoma. Various non compressive lesions should be very careful. Because as a neurologist, we see sometimes a patient come, a motor neuron disease patient comes with low back pain. They get a scan done. Scan shows mild disc herniation. So actually, the, the main problem is motor neuron disease. They don't get improvement with the surgery. So all neurosurgeons should know about the non compressive myelopathies. To start with, vascular, like arteriovenous malformations, neural fish loss, and APAB, anti first antibody syndrome characterized by arterial thrombosis, venous thrombosis and recurrent thrombocytopenia in inflammatory disease like MS. MS, some, they can usually they involve predominant white matter tracts like medial longitudinal fasciculus in the form of INO or pyramidal tracts, cerebellar, posterior columns, optic nerve. So they, each attack should last for more than 24 hours and each two attacks should be different by one month interval. So they should, they should fulfill all the criteria, clinical criteria, various clinical criteria like shoemaker's criteria. So any patient who commits a weakness, paraparesis or cordyparesis, one should think of a demyelinating disease, if it's subacute onset, a female and predominant white matter tract involvement. So, so also neuromyelitic after spectrum disorders, NMOSD, they can come with paraparesis. But when somebody comes with paraparesis with the ABCDE, like area prostima syndrome, they can have refractive vomitings, refractive hiccups, nausea, or a brainstem syndrome, like bulbar palsy, or a cerebral, or a diencephalic syndrome. The, somebody patient come with paraparesis, a sleep disturbance. So think of diencephalic syndrome. So all A, B, C, D, area, area prostoma, brainstem, cerebral, diencephalic with topic neuritis, myelitis. Think of a neuromyelitis, spectrum disorder. So also sarcoid, non-infectious, 
non-infectious intermediate diseases like sarcoidosis, Jogren's, vasculitis, infectious diseases like vascular myelopathy. Some HIV patient coming paraphrasis attacks, they think of a vascular myelopathy or HTLV-1, HAM, that is HTLV-1 associated myelopathy. Tropical spastic paraphrasis caused by HTLV-1 and 2. So it occurs usually at the age of, uh, around the age of 30 years in sexually active male with uh, spastic paraphrasis, painful sensory neuropathy, bladder symptoms. Think of this topical spastic paraphrasis. Somebody with this spastic paraphrasis with family history. Think of editive spastic paraphrasis. So develop some syringomyelia and especially vitamin B12 deficiency, subacute combined degeneration of the card. So very varied presentation. One should think of these non compressive myelopathy. So cerebral already we discussed ACOM and uh, superior cerebral common causes, whereas in the spinal cord, acute transverse myelitis, injury to the spinal cord, thrombos of the ASA, the, again, one of the common thrombus of ASA and hematomyelia, post-vaccination, post-infectious, perhaps interrupted is called sudden cause of paraparesis. So, most common cause of paraparesis are trauma, tumor, everybody knows all T's, trauma, tumor, tuberculosis, thrombosis, and transverse myelitis. So, UML lesions with shock. So, some of the lesions, they can present with uh, LMN, placid paraparesis, like UML with spinal shock, or acute transverse myelitis, or spinal cord injuries. They can present with basically UML lesions, but they can present with a flaccid paraparesis coming to lower motor neural lesion. So if somebody come with lower motor neural after some time we'll discuss how to what the plane of lesion all the intramillary, extramillary, extradural. So for the time being lower motor neuron, somebody come with lower weakness, flaccid weakness, where is the lesion? The where the lesion in the antigen cell, root, peripheral nerve, NMJ, or muscle. To say antigen cell, few examples polio, post polio, so motor neuron disease. Motor neuron disease, they can present with only one limb initially, asymmetric. Only right limb or left lower limb, right lower limb, side to side. Region to region, segment to segment, there are very few disorders in neurology, especially region disorders, the asymmetric concept. Usually, region disorders, they are bilateral symmetrical. But motor neuron disease, like FSH, other, other things like FSHD, Parkinson's disease, cartilobacterial syndrome, those are degenerate too, they start asymmetrically. Like motor neuron disease, for example, prime lateral sclerosis, starts in the one lower limb, right lower limb, one, the, one, one in the ankle, then in the thigh. So, it was from, from side to side, segment to segment, they may progress. So, one think of uh, anti hospital disease like PMA, progressive muscular atrophy. That is a very classic example of anti hospital involvement, where PLS is classic example of uh, pyramidal involvement. So, anti hospital disorders, the basic points are weakness is out of proportion to wasting. When you see the patient, a lot of wasting is there. When you give a shake and both, both hands and both feet are wasted, when you examine the power, power is reasonably preserved. So, in a pure motor condition with weakness, wasting, fasciculations, and power is out of proportion to wasting. With fasciculations or polymini myoclons, think of anti disorders. Affecting the nerves. Nerves are, you know, they're sometimes they can parapedic with GBS. Sometimes only it affects both lower, even CADP, AADP, it can only affect the only lower limbs. In that, the peripheral nerve disease where you get motor and sensory, usually distal, motor, sensory, distal, weakness and wasting, then think of uh, peripheral nerve disease. Whereas Neuromuscular junction disease, the limb guide lamysin, sometimes the weakness can cause in the lower limbs, but where you can prevent optimal involvement, weakness, wasting, not wasting, weakness, fatigability, improvement with rest. They, are, they, they get the complaining of weakness, in their fatigue, give rest, they, they improve. They get optimal involvement, bulbar muscle involvement, dynal variation. One should think of a neuromuscular junction disease like myasthenia gravis. Sometimes muscle disease like polymyositis, they can start in the lower limbs, where in my, all muscle disorders, they are selective, pure motor. Sometimes highly selective. Selectiveness in the only affects only one muscle, for example, deltoid. In the deltoid, again, it affects only one fibers. Antifibers are deltoid. Highly selective. They are bilateral, symmetric, selective, highly selective, pure motor, no fasciculations, proximal. Think of a muscle disease like polymyositis. You have different criteria like Peter Bohan's criteria and all. That is not necessary for you. But remember, these are the points of muscle disease. So, approach it with therapy. History is important. Onset. What is the onset? Is the nature of trauma? Just of infection, especially epidural abscess. Patient comes with fever, progressive weakness, and pain. Suspect epidural abscess. That can occur anywhere in the thoracic cord. And the important organ is staphylococcus, like that vascular, duration of the symptoms, and sacral sparing. Sacral sparing is commonly seen in intramillary lesions. Sacral involvement seen in conus millaris. So the progression, symmetry, asymmetry, weakness, associated symptoms like fever, infective causes, sages, cerebral causes, delayed menstruation, some leukodystrophy, they can present, with, present as. Uh, paraparesis. Blood and bowel movement will take another, another next after some time. Specific history regarding any previous history of vaccination, involuntary movements, antenatal, postnatal, all these are very important. In general examination, a patient of paraparesis, so any, any student who presents paraparesis always ask 
we have to see for lumbar sacral region very clearly. They can have ulcerated hemangioma. They can have port vein stain. They can have a rudimentary tail. The tail can last for few millimeters or 13 centimeters. And they have tough, tough hair. When you see these things, you think of spinal dysraphisms. Like that, most of the paraphrases, plastic paraphrases, you see for cutaneous markers, like cephalic spots, or axillary freckling, crevice sign, or multiple cutaneous, subcutaneous, multiple or uh, flexible from neurofibromas affecting various parts. If, if they are, those are there, you can think of underlying tumor like neurofibroma. Also, so also you have to see for the eyes, for any list nodules. List are nothing but their iris hematomas. But they are usually common in the inferior quadrant. If they see more than two list nodules, the very characteristic feature of neurofibromas type 1. So to determine the level of fusion, the sensory, motor, autonomic function is impaired with the hallmark of spinal cord disease. So order of compression from extrinsic, first pyramidal tracts, then posterior columns, and then spinal thalamic tracts. Why pyramidal tracts are first affected? Pyramidal tracts separate with terminal branches, spinal arteries, and hence more susceptible to compression from ischemia. Like the pyramidal tracts closest to denticulate ligament. So that's why they're more affected. Coming to a few points about sensory, the dermatomal important dermatomes when you deal with paraphrases. One point about the overlap between C4 and T2. You know, upper limb is supplied by C5 to T1. But here, when you come to the nipple, uh, clavicle level, the C4, T2, the overlap will be there. So when there is relation high thoracic cut, very careful about the C4, T2 overlap. So the landmarks, the T4 is the nipple, T10 umbilicus, L1 groin, L5 great toe, and S1 little toe. You should know some somatotopic organization, some knowledge of somatotopic organization is spinal cord. So very simple. In, in spinal cord, you have posterior columns, corticospinal, spinothalamic tracts. The posterior columns, PSM, if you remember pan-systolic member, posterior columns, sacral fibers, medial. Remaining all opposite. Remaining means corticospinal, lateral spinothalamic tracts, the uh, somatotopic organization is quite opposite. So bladder, one point about bladder, whether it is when you deal with a paraparesis, whether you human bladder, element bladder. Spa you, you know, all know, you have human bladder is spastic bladder, hypertonic bladder with small volume, and there is detrusor contraction of our activity. The element bladder, flaccid bladder, hypertonic bladder with large volumes and detrusor contractions under activity. So incontinence, all symptoms and all, you can get any book. So other important sign is the Beaver's sign. The Beaver's is the one very important in case of paraparesis. This gave a Charles Beaver. So usually what happens when a patient is supine position, ask the patient to keep the both upper limbs like this and ask the patient to get up. So what happens when a normal person, when the patient gets up, whole rectus abdominis acts as a single unit. That's why you don't get any movement of the umbilicus when the patient gets up like this. Whereas, for example, the lower limb, lower abdominal weakness is there. The umbilicus pulled upwards because of the weakness from the lower abdominals. The rectus abdominis <laughs> there doesn't act as a single unit. So this is very important to localize. If, if Bever sign is there, the localization is D10 and T12 L1 segments, the abdominal lift is preserved. You know, root phase of abdominal lift T10, T6 to T12. So T12 L1 lesions, the abdominal lift is preserved. Trimestric is lost, which has the root one of root phase of L1. So you don't get elevation of the testicle and the para, you get paraplegia, wasting of fentanyl object and transfer abdominal muscle. Lumbar and L2, L, L2 to L3, L4, it parallel causes perils of flexion, adduction of the thigh, weakness of actions of the knee, and loss of Petular reflex. Whereas the alpha S1, the movements at angular paralyzed, weakness, flexion of the knee, weakness, extension of the thigh, and loss of ankle reflex here, knee reflex is being normal. A word about cardiac equine and conus medullaris. Cardiac equine, you know, all the roots below L2, L2, L3, L5, L5, S1, S2, S3, cardiac equine. Cardiac equine character four A's is asymmetric, areflexic, the lower limb reflex are absent, like knee jet, ankle jet, asymmetric, areflexic, atrophic, atonic. If you find one side, one, one lower limb, think of cardiac syndrome. Whereas the epiconus means L4, L5, S1, S2, conus is S3, S4, S5. So the terminal parts of the spinal cord, there are conus medullaris, characterized by prominent bowel blood involvement here. Whereas the cardiac equina, the asymmetric, atrophic, areflexic, and tonic. You can have to see the difference between the cardiac equina, conus medullaris. So cardiac equina, only one side, all of you know, gradual onset, unilateral. Usually, the, the, the result is like PAD, metastasis, severe low back pain, asymmetric, ketonic, aeroflexic. These are the points. Ankle and knee both are absent. Here, knee is normal quantum medullaris. Quantum basically the reason is S3, S4, S5. So, L1, L2 are spared. So, L2, L3, L4, which is held by knee jerk. The knee is normal. Ankle jerk is last. Trophic changes are prominent. The plantar responsive actions are here, no response. Coming to spinal cord lesion. Where is the lesion? Lesion is the very, very important. When you come to plastic paraphrases, where is the lesion? Is it intramillary or extramillary? If it is extramillary, it is intrajural extramillary or extrajural. 
No, you can see extramillary, intramillary. In a case scenario, who comes with predominant primal tract signs like weakness, spasticity, brisk reflexes, plantar erection, sir, clonus, most of the times it goes in favor of extramillary. Prominent primal tract signs goes in favor of extramillary. Prominent element signs, weakness, wasting, fasciculations, these goes in favor of intramillary. So upper motor neuron signs, extramillary, lower motor neuron signs, intramillary. Root pain, somebody comes with root pain, classical, paroxysmal, lancinating, sharp shooting pain across the one root that goes in favor of extramillary. Very funicular pains. They're very deep, vague, boring, ill-defined pain. That is goes in favor of intramillary. Funicular pain. This is thesias, goes in favor of intramillary. Dissociative sensory loss. All of you know dissociative sensory loss where, where pain temperature loss, the postural sensations, fine touch, joint sense, position sense, vibration sense, they're preserved. But dissociation is there, that goes in favor of intramillary. Like sacral sensations are lost in case of extramillary, the sacral sparing is in intramillary. Lermet sign is usually seen extramillary, absent intramillary. So bladder bowel, prominent early bladder bowel is seen in intramillary. They are less, less common and late in extramillary. All the investigations you can see in the book. So whereas from extramillary, extramillary, if it is extramillary, is it intrajural extramillary or extrajural? Uh, extrajural. Then very important, very few points to distinguish whether it is extrajural or intrajural. Extrajural, bilateral, bone pain, bone tenderness and short duration. Whereas intrajural, they are asymmetric, vertebral pain is not common, usually benign and long duration. And whereas in intrajural, get dissociative anesthesia, bad environment early, extrajural, there is late and prominent primal tract signs and pain, root pain and spinal tenderness, spinal deformity, they are more common in extrajural. So points which help to determine the level of patient's spinal cord compression, one is sensory level, next motor level, reflex level, root pains shows the dermatomes involved, the type of bladder, the human bladder, element bladder, and autonomic disturbance by which you can definitely localize. So finally, to just you have one word about a parapresion infection and parapresion extension. Usually in examinations, various exams ask you when you get a parapresis case, whether it's parapresion infection or parapresion extension. There are few points to distinguish between parapresion infection and extension. Mode of transaction, parapresion extension, incomplete transaction is spinal cord. Whereas in parapresion infection, the complete transaction. So you where you get tuxer spasms. Or sometimes the patient says there's some improvement after joining the hospital, the patient able to flex the limb. But you tell them it is not improvement, it's worsening. Not only the corticospinal tract, but all extrapinal tracts are gone, patient getting parapresion infection. So early, late, and usually the muscle tone is more in actions are grouped in parapresion extension, so the limbs are extended. Whereas in parapresion infection, the tone is more in parapresion, the limbs are flexed. Usually the flex are brisk in parapresion extension, they are little brisk in case of parapresion uh, flexion. Clonus is present in parapresion extension, they are absent in parapresion flexion. Some of the points to distinguish parapresion flexion extension. So complications, avoid about complications of paraplegia. Like bed sores, very common complications. You get contractures, unidirect infection, pneumonia, and deep vein thrombosis. Finally, hysterical paraparesis. When you could not localize, basing on these points, whether it is upper motor, lower motor, upper motor, cerebral, spinal cord, or lower motor, like anti cells, peripheral nerves, roots, plexus, neuromuscle junction, or muscle, then always think when the lesions, the, the symptoms are varying from time to time, person to person, especially symptoms occurring in more people. So untenable patterns, sensory loss, motor loss, normal muscle tone, normal reflexes, no bladder dysfunction. One should think of a hysterical paraplegia. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Gopi. Thanks. You have covered an extensive topic in a very short time. Good, nice. Now we'll go on to the next topic, MCQs. There's one more MCQ. All MCQs one at more. the end. So we are continuing with the MCQs and So we'll continue with that abundant quiz of last session and then we'll go to the quiz of this session. Okay. Huh? No quiz. I said no. Abundant quiz of the previous session first. We'll do that and then you will come for this session's quiz. Yeah. No. 
Ready? First, you show the pin once again. Let's see, let them. This is the pin. Okay. Yeah, we are doing the third quiz which we abandoned last time fresh. Okay. So you have a fresh pin now. And uh, yeah. So is that on your skin? Yes, those questions are discarded. Because many could not do it. <clears throat> It's nice if you can write your name as Pius, Pius, something like that. Yes, post lunch I'm seeing that somehow. We will start now. I think 110 should be at least. All logged in? Oh, no. Okay, that's it. No, someone is doing it, could not. Okay, we'll start. So now it will be a test of memory also. Because it's the last sessions. So 19-year male patient presented with motor tics, phonic tics, ADHD and psychiatric disturbances, name the syndrome. Red rabbit, red rabbit, torrid, PD plus syndrome. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Anyway, it's okay. So, next, next question. Gene most commonly implicated in monogenic Parkinson's. LRRK2. P I N K two. I don't know how to pronounce them. I also don't know all of them. <laughs> okay, so you get the answer. Yes. How the answer correct is exactly L R R K two. So I also don't know what is L R R K two anyway. Next. Ashwini, okay. Next. 30 year male presented with choreoform movements, psychiatric disturbances, and dementia. Name the syndrome. Huntington's, Tourette's, Meg, Lance Adams. Oh, everyone is getting the correct. One more, six, six, eight, yeah. No, maximum got correct only. More, more is the correct one. <laughs> and so we'll go to the next. You've shuffled the questions, no? Yeah. Okay, again, Ashwin is doing good, I think. And next. All are true of carotid cave aneurysms except... Below the plane of tuberculum, extra dural in location, location ventromedial to distal duraling, rupture results in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here you go. So the 36 got it correct. So I think you all were hungry that time. 
you didn't listen well next question somesh okay next structure which comes in the middle obstructing view of basilarity during a standard terrianal approach ICA, third nerve, optic nerve, ventricular MCA. Here you go. Okay, so 61 got it right. That's good only. Next, Sumesh Srikant. Okay, next. Following are the radiological features seen in NPH, that is normal pressure hydrocephalus, events ratio more than 0 0.31, ventriculomegaly, dash, and diffuse sulcal enlargement. Okay, 88 of them got right out of 110. Okay, good. Next question. Okay. So everyone is changing here. Next. Name the gene expansion found in above syndrome and the syndrome as CTG, CGG, CAG. What syndrome, yeah? Is there, is there a picture in there? <laughs> next. Next. No, she shuffled in while, so maybe. Okay, we'll uh, cancel that. Hummingbird sign is a characteristic radiological finding seen in the following syndrome. Okay. Okay, good. So you get the answer. It is PSP. Next. Yes, yes. Harishyam. Okay, next. Action tremor, following is the most common cause. Okay, essential Parkinson's dystonic cerebellar intention. Okay, so majority got it right. Next question. Mm. <laughs> Next. What is the frequency of essential tremor? Actually, it was already there last time, so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So majority got it, not exactly, okay. 31 people got it correct, out of 110, right? 120. So, so next, no, I mean, some gap has happened, no, so obviously. So now HS is also climbing up, next. You let me know when 15 minutes is over. Name, yeah, gene implicated in dopa responsive dystonia. This only if you have listened to the talk can answer.
Okay, 25 got it right. And you can see the answer, GCH1. Next. Next, next, no. That's what. Name the syndrome characterized by blepharospasm, oromandibular dystonia, and dystonic tremor. Oh, this is a tough question, I believe, because only 29 got it right. Okay, let's see the scoreboard. Aha, uh -huh. Anish is climbing up. Anish must have read a lot of neurology. Next. Idiopathic Parkinson's disease, early bulbar, levodopa, pyramidal, inspiratory, strider. Okay, so we'll go to the next scoreboard. Srikanth is mid leading in most of them. Next. Hot cross bun sign. So at least uh, 70 of them got it right. Scoreboard. So, Srikant. So is Srikant the neurologist or neurosurgeon? Yeah. Neurosurgeon, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next round, I'll call Dr. Isha to come over and conduct. Based on the two talks. Where is it? You're online. Ah, there she is. Fine. We move on to the second round of quiz in the post afternoon session. Okay, and uh, oh, there, yeah, the first quiz post lunch session officially. You have to log in again. Game pin changes. Do you have to log in again? The yeah. meaning pin pin has to go. <laughs> this is the pin five five.
fine okay pin is 9964951 9964951 Nine nine six four nine five. Setting hundred and ten or hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty. I think it has slowed down now to hundred and six. Tell me. Yeah, hundred and ten now. Shit. You wait for another minute or. Uh... Okay, hundred and twelve. Here we go. Okay, the first question. Diagnosis of this patient can be consistent with all except. My God. Diagnosis of this patient can be consistent with all except glioblastoma, multiple sclerosis, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, cryptococcal meningitis. Glioblastoma, multiple sclerosis, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, cryptococcal meningitis. Okay, the answer is multiple sclerosis. The answer is multiple sclerosis and who is the topic? HK comes there. It, okay, we have Muni close on his heels. Fine. Move to the question number two now. Okay. Altitudinal field defect in visual field as shown below is characteristic for visual loss due to altitudinal field defect. Ischemia of the optic, ischemic optic neuropathy, right lobe ischemia, ischemia of the optic chiasm, the tumors of the optic nerve. I think ischemia, ischemic optic atrophy, parietal lobe ischemia, ischemia of the optic ISM, tumors of the optic nerve. Yeah, the answer is ischemic optic neuropathy. Adam, is it the same as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Fine, we marked it up for our entrances. Okay, uh, let's see who. Wins that HK remains HK remains on top. Ashwini is close on heels. KPK is behind. Okay. And Tushar is climbing hard. Okay. Let's go to the next question, please. The third question in this round: Cerebral causes of paraparesis are all except superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, cerebral palsy, parasagittal meningioma, neurofibromatosis. Superior sagittal thrombosis, cerebral palsy, parasagittal meningioma, neurofibromatosis. We have. Okay, the answer is neurofibromatosis. And let's see who is on top. HK. HK. KPK is back up. Harish has come up. Rajendra Prasad is also in the race. Himanshu is in the race. And Purnima climbs hard. Okay, let's go to the fourth question. What would you look for in a fundus in a patient where optic nerve infiltration with lymphoma is suspected? Optic nerve infiltration in a case of lymphoma. Hemorrhagic subretinal precipitates with cherry red appearance. Microaneurysms with cluster of grapes appearance. Yellowish subretinal precipitates and leopard skin appearance. Microaneurysms with blood and thunder appearance. I think that's a tough one for me at least. Okay, the answer is yellowish subretinal precipitates and le leopard skin appearance. Okay. KPK comes on top now. 3,469 points. Fine. Go to the next question, fifth question. All options given below are consistent with diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri, except six nerve involvement, absence of papilledema, focal neurological deficits, 
transverse venous stenosis or sinus stenosis on MRI. I think that should be a sitter for us. Focal neurological deficits is the answer for it. Do we still use this term pseudotumor cerebri? Again, back in the... Okay, that's fine. All right. Narayan has taken this top spot now. Himanshu is back there. And Deepti is there close on heels. Let's go to the next question. Sixth question. What is the probable cause of visual loss in a patient with visual fields A and optic disc examination B as shown there? What is the probable cause of visual loss in a patient with visual fields A and optic disc examination B as shown below? Unilateral op optic occipital infarct, tobacco alcohol amblyopia, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, neuromyelitis optica. The answer is tobacco alcohol amblyopia. Oh, Deepthi climbs on top. Right there. And seventh of the fifteenth questions. Among the vessels supplying the optic disc, identify A. Branch retinal artery, pile artery, posterior ciliary artery, anterior ciliary artery. Among the vessels supplying the optic disc, identify. Okay, the posterior ciliary artery is the answer there. And Narayan climbs back again, 5,056 points. Eighth question, features of extradural compression are all except zone of hyperesthesia, root pain, girdle pain, Ellsberg phenomenon, human signs below the level of compression, zone of paresthesia, root pain, girdle pain, Ellsberg phenomenon, and human signs below the level of compression. Okay, Ellsberg phenomenon. We have a APRCH comes back with Himanshu second, Deepthi is hot. Okay, then. Ninth of the 15 questions localization of inverted supinator. Localization of inverted supinator C2, C4, C6, C8. Localization of inverted supinator. Okay, it is definitely a sitter. C6 is the answer. APRCH comes on top. DT is close on heels. Okay, let's go to the next question. The 10th question is round. Clinical feature characteristic of a spinal dural AV fistula. Acute onset of headache and meningismus. Improvement after steroid Administration, painless hemiparesis, worsening def deficits with exertion or valsalva. Administration, painless hemiparesis, worsening of deficits with exertion or valsalva. The answer is worsening of deficits with exertion or valsalva. Okay, APRCH. No, APRCH still remains on top. Deepti is second. Narayan is third. Okay, let's go to the 11th question. 63-year-old male with two weeks history of visual loss with fundus picture as given below. What is the likely diagnosis? Atritic uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, infiltrative optic neuropathy, ocular ischemic syndrome, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The answer is infiltrative optic neuropathy. Let's see who is there on top. Deepthi moves to the top slot. Okay, let's see. The twelfth question here is intramedullary spinal cord tumor most likely to be amenable to total resection is astrocytoma, ependymoma, glioblastoma, metastatic lung cancer, primary CNS lymphoma. 
ஆஸ்ட்ரோசைட்டோமா எப்பண்டைமா லயோபிளாஸ்டோமா மெட்டஸ்டாரிக் லங் கேன்சர் பிரைமரி சிஎன்எஸ் லிம்போமா The answer is astrocytoma. I thought it was ependymoma would be a better answer. Thing. No. <laughs> I think it is ependymoma. Angioblastoma was not a choice there. Of the, of the choices given, ependymoma would be the answer. Please cancel that question. 12th question. I think that was the 12th question. Yeah, 12th question is cancelled. Intradural extramedial lesion most likely to extend through and the neural foramen in a dumbbell fashion. I think that's again a sitter. Arachnoidosis, metastasis, spinal sarcoidosis, neurofibroma. I'm sure this question was given by the neurologist for the neurosurgeons. <laughs> this should come as relief to the neurosurgeons. Okay, the answer, definitely. I think 96 got right. That means that the neurosurgeons here or no. Okay, Deepthi, Deepthi is still on, Deepthi is on top. The neurologist, yeah, Deepthi is a neurologist. And the penultimate question, paraparesis with beaver sign positive. Cord equina, conus medullaris, lower thoracic up, spinal cord, upper thoracic spinal cord. Cord equina, conus medullaris, lower thoracic spinal cord, upper thoracic spinal cord. The answer is lower thoracic spinal cord. I think oh, APR CH moves to the top slot. It is just there. The last question Which of the following causes postrolateral cord syndrome? B12 deficiency, copper excess, zinc deficiency, all of the above. This is again core neurology. B12 deficiency, copper excess, zinc deficiency, and all of the above. All of the above is the answer. I think Dr. Suresh Nair was telling the answer. <laughs> okay. That's it. Uh, Kavin Bharati, third, third slot. Second slot is APRCH. And the first slot, waiting for BT. <laughs> Let's give a huge hand for them. We can call them up and make them. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Please stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Neurologist in the making. Okay. <laughs> APRCH, he remains anonymous. You see here, APRCH, the man who goes with, or man or woman, online. Okay, fine. And the third is Kamit Bharati. I think he's from Ames too. Bhuneshwar. Uh, okay, congratulations to all of the top people. Let's move on to the next uh, session. Oh, we'll move to the next session. I think this is very important for neurosurgeons. Don't jump at a scan. Be vigilant on the clinical findings. So approach to a patient with foot drop by Dr. Dal Shukla.
Yeah. I should speak less loud there. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am at uh, disadvantage <laughs> like uh, Altha gave a talk on uh, eyes, so she could mimic both eyes with both hands, you will constrict it, you will dilate it, half in defect and on. But unfortunately, I'm giving a talk on foot, I cannot lift my leg and show you everything. So uh, I'm going to talk on foot drop. So a previous speaker talked on both legs, I'm going to talk only one part of one leg. So most of the time foot, log, foot drop is unilateral. So can, can, can anyone tell what is the commonest cause of foot drop which many of us experience? Cause, that is the... So if my lecture would have been of one hour instead of 15 minutes and you sit with your cross leg and attentively listen to everything at the end of one hour, you will get foot drop. So commonest cause of foot drop, it is rather ischemic, not uh, merely mechanical compression, is the involvement of lateral popliteal nerve or common peroneal nerve or also called as fibular nerve because it's a tibial nerve. So it's a counterpart is uh, fibular nerve. Slight change. It's not working. So a uh, normal uh, range of the movements. So we have dorsiflexion, so I will mimic with my hand. We have dorsiflexion, which is opposite of what is there in the wrist. And then we have plantar flexion, we have inversion, and we have inversion. So these are the four uh, common movement at the ankle. There are some movement at the subtalar joint or the forefoot, which we are not of concern as a neurologist, but more of interest to an orthopedic surgeon. Okay, so what is foot drop? It is a self-explanatory term, like the foot drops. So normally when we sit or when we stand or when we walk, foot does not drop, foot elevates. So it is just foot drop. So main culprit of foot drop is inability to dorsiflex. That is the main problem. Inability to dorsiflex causes foot drop. So foot drop is not a disease. It's a symptom or a sign of some other disease. But it is very important to know what all things can cause foot drop. So there are main movement is dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion is with tibialis anterior muscle. It causes dorsiflexion and also the EHL, N1 extends the digitorum, all contribute to the dorsiflexion. And the nerve supplying to which is deep peroneal nerve, which is root value L5, and up to some extent L4 and S1, but it is L5. And the next uh, movement is Eversion. Eversion is outside. I request all of you not to take pictures. It has been found in scientific study that people who take pictures do not retain anything in their brains. And uh, luckily for all of you, Dr. Manas Panigra is uh, live webcasting on YouTube, which can be viewed even later also. So please be attentive. Don't use your mobile phone, not only for talking, but also don't use for taking pictures. So another movement is eversion. Eversion is outside, which is with the uh, help of peroneal muscle. And again, it is L5 and S1. Then another movement is plantar flexion. Method down when you apply brakes or accelerator in the car, that is the plantar flexion movement. And it is by the posterior compartment, which is gastronomic soleus. And the nerve is the tibia nerve. So it is very important to know that there are three compartments. Anterior compartment for dorsiflexion, posterior compartment for plant reflection and lateral compartment for eversion. So this posterior compartment besides plant reflection, it also helps in inversion. So when you see your foot, it is very difficult to have isolated dorsiflexion or isolated plant reflection. There is some amount of inversion with plant reflection and some amount of eversion with dorsiflexion. So this, uh, this will help you to localize the lesions causing the foot drop. So nerve roots like main nerve supplying the lower limbs like at hip flexion like uh, this I always make when I give like if you if for all neurosurgeons you should always read Asia Impairment Scale that is American Spinal Cord Injury Association. So they have given five root uh, key muscles for upper limb and five key muscles for lower limb. So just always read that. So hip flexion is L1 or L2. Extension, knee extension is L3. Dorsiflexion, L4. 
plantar flexion L5, sorry, uh, then uh, EHL is L5 and plantar flexion S1. So you remember this five key muscles in the lower limb and you will be able to localize most of the neurological disorders causing paralysis of part or whole of the lower limb. So what are the symptoms of uh, foot drop? How a patient with foot drop presents? So uh, obviously patient does not tell I have foot drop. He does not know the word foot drop. So he presents that he is not, most of the children, how they present, they present that they tend to fall because their foot or toe touches before their heel touches and they are not able to run. Most of the children run and jump around and they are not able to do so because of foot drop. So that is the common presentation in children. Whereas in adult present that tend, tend to drag their foot. They may have some kind of trophic ulcer if there is a sensory loss at the tip of the uh, great toe. And when you see the, obviously there is a weakness of dorsiflexion. So as I told you, very in very rare cases, there will be isolated weakness of dorsiflexion. It will also be associated with weakness of eversion along with the foot drop. And it is a typical high stippage gait. So clinical examination, so you have to see for uh, signs of motor as well as uh, autonomic. Like motor is obviously there is a wasting. There is a, if there is a prolonged foot drop, there may be contracture. But autonomic signs like loss of sweating, uh, there may be vascular changes and trophic ulcers as well. So where all foot drop can occur right from the head? Like uh, you, had, you heard from the paraplegia talk that uh, tumor right in the center in the vertex, which will compress both the paracentral lobule can cause paraplegia. So similarly, if there is a unilateral lesion, there are case reports, uh, several case reports that since uh, representation of the pyramidal tract is more distal to proximal, so patient presents with more of foot uh, weakness before he develops knee or uh, hip weakness. So early sign can be foot weakness, which can mimic like a foot drop. And then come down the spinal cord, isolated spinal cord injury or spinal cord infarction tumor is very and very unlikely to present with foot drop. It is usually associated with other things. Whereas the L5 root is the first thing in the lower motor neuron which presents with foot drop. Then comes the lumbosacral plexus, sciatic nerve, common peroneal nerve, and the deep peroneal nerve. So we'll go one by one to each. Now, all, all, all of this can cause weakness of dorsiflexion. Take it, don't take picture, it is available in YouTube. All of this will cause weakness of dorsal. Now, how will you differentiate what causes what? So, as I told you, the sciatic nerve. So, first we will start with peripheral nerve, then we'll go to the root. The sciatic nerve supplies the almost except for the anterior thigh, which is supplied by the femoral nerve. The rest, almost all muscles of the lower limb are supplied by the sciatic nerve. The sciatic is the biggest nerve, so as it goes down, it already had supplied the hamstring muscles, the thigh muscles. Once it reaches the apex of the popliteal uh, fossa, it divides into lateral popliteal nerve and tibial nerve, or common peroneal nerve. You can get common peroneal nerve will again divide into superficial peroneal nerve and the deep peroneal nerve. Now, superficial peroneal nerve will go to lateral compartment of the leg and will supply the everters. And uh, deep peroneal nerve will go to anterior compartment and will supply the dorsiflexor, extensor digitorum, and extensor hallucis. Whereas the TBL nerve will go to the posterior compartment and will supply the plantar flexor muscle. So this is this is the distribution of the lower limb uh, uh, nerve supply. So what happens when there is a sciatic nerve injury? So if the sciatic nerve injury is very high above the pyriformis fossa, so even the hamstring will be affected. So there will be knee flexion weakness. But most of the time, sciatic nerve injury is distal to that. And commonest cause is like total hip replacement or injection of palsy. So if there is complete sciatic nerve injury, patients will get what we get a flail foot. So neither dorsiflexion nor plantar flexion nor inversion or not inversion. Whereas if it is only common peroneal nerve involvement, then patient will have weakness of dorsiflexion and inversion. And if it is L5 root, so L5, it also supplies the gluteal abductors. So there will be weakness in addition, gluteal abductors beside the foot weakness. So it is very important to examine the hip movement in patient with foot drop. If there is a gluteal weakness, the abduction of the hip weakness, that indicates L5 root involvement rather than the distal uh, involvement. Now, sensory is also up to some extent is useful, but I would not recommend using sensory as a localizing because there is a lot of overlap between roots and the nerves and it does not follow strict line of control as it is written in most of our anatomy textbook. There is no black line between L5 and S1 or common peroneal nerve and superficial nerve. So sensory is not very much reliable in localizing the uh, lesion. The other symptoms, like if it is a peripheral nerve, you can get tinnel sign, which is very easily elicitable in the over the neck of the fibula. And in case of L5, you will get positive stretch test. SLR may be normal sometimes, so, but when you raise the uh, leg further and you 
forcefully uh, dorsiflex the foot, then there is a positive stretch test, which will indicate radiculopathy. So this is the commonest question asked by most of the people who are seated in the first row, who have been examiners, that what is the difference between the L5 radiculopathy and common peroneal palsy? So you can see in this table, most of the things are common. So one thing I already told, hip abduction. Another thing is, uh, yeah, this thing, inversion. So L5 root involvement will also cause inversion deficits. Whereas common peroneal nerve will not cause inversion deficit. It will cause only dorsiflexion and eversion deficit. So this is another point to differentiate between L5 and common peroneal nerve. So coming to the uh, gait of the foot drop. So this is a normal gait. Like when we walk, like we touch the heel first before we touch the uh, toes. So what happens in patient with foot drop? It does not touch the heel first. What it touches, the it will touch the toe first. So what happens when you touch the toe? You don't get the purchase over the ground. So you tend to lift your knee too much high. So that is called high stepage get, gait. But you want to touch your heel first. It is not touching. So you force the entire foot on the ground. So it will cause slap. So this is the gait of the patient with foot drop. So that's what I have written here. Now, the etiology can be brain, as I told you, or spine. Uh, this are spine. Sometimes spine, what happens at that time of acute lesion, you don't get isolated foot drop. But when the recovery occurs, you, you see that uh, recovery of hip muscle has occurred, knee muscles have occurred, but foot muscle fail to recover in patients with paraplegia or even monoplegia. At that time, you can see foot drop. And low line, like totally power. Uh, the commonest shiatic nerve, as I always told you, THR or injection of palsy. Common peroneal nerve is very superficial, so it is vulnerable to compression neuropathies. And particularly in bedbound patients, like patient in ICU, it has found the patient who remains in ICU for four weeks or more. Nearly 60% of them, at least on electrophysiology, are known to have common peroneal nerve involvement if the position of the knee is not taken care. And another is Baker cyst. Sometimes peripheral nerve tumors can also cause the uh, foot drop. L5 is uh, commonest is our disc prolapse and uh, lumbar plexus. Plexus, commonest involvement of lumbar plexus occurs in patients with cancer, particularly with metastasis in retroperitoneal region. And one very peculiarity of the metastatic peripheral neuropathy is genital femoral uh, neuropathy, which is associated more often with cancers than with any other diseases. So bilateral foot drop, uh, like what causes unilateral can cause bilateral. If there is a bilateral, like cauda equinus syndrome can cause a bilateral foot drop. Like neuro, uh, neurologically, mononeuritis multiplex can sometimes cause bilateral foot drop. And uh, neuromuscular junction like myasthenia sometimes can present with. These are all uncommon causes of bilateral foot drop. So localization, as I already told you, if it's a brain involvement like papilledema, you can see papilledema or the UMN sign like Babinski sign will be positive. In spinal cord also, again, the Babinski sign will be positive. In low-lying lesion and uh, common peroneal, I already told uh, that will be tunnel sign or uh, even weakness of the uh, helix. And whereas in the high lesion, besides dorsiflexion, if it is complete transaction, plantar flexion, inversion, inversion, everything will be involved. In lumbosacral uh, plexus, you will have other like other involved like adductors of the heap will also be involved because of obturator nerve, sure. not only the foot drop. So you have to look for the other signs to localize the lesions. The alpha radiculopathy, like alpha radiculopathy classically presents with uh, sciatic pain and uh, uh, weakness of external fences longus, which is very characteristic of alpha radiculopathy. And in that inversion will also be lost, not only the foot drop. So that's how you differentiate from common parolean now. The investigation, if you suspect brain, then obviously you have to do imaging and all those things. Uh, for peripheral nerve, you can do MRI or ultrasound in case of Baker cyst or tumor. And uh, I don't know whether this is going to be covered later, uh, NCV and EMG. Already covered, so I'll skip, uh, I'll skip this. So this also you can do uh, to localize the lesion. Ah, so this now I will show you videos. Okay? So these are the quiz. So whomsoever wants to answer, raise the hand and I will pick up one of you to answer. Take a look at this child. Just look, observe. So I asked her to lift the right foot. She lifted and I asked her to lift the left foot. She was not able to lift. So she lifted the entire leg. But she is not able to lift foot in isolation. Then 
I'm just doing, it's a small child, I don't use hammer. Like you can just use finger to, and you can see the knee jerks also. Do you want to answer now or do you want to see the gate? You can answer now, what is the cause? Anybody? Cerebral palsy, great. Monomyelic cerebral palsy. Anybody else? So what did you notice? Obviously, right leg is normal. She is able to lift the foot, lift the hip thigh and everything. Left, because she is not able to lift the foot, she is lifting the entire limb to compensate for the lack of uh, inability to lift the foot. And you can see she is able to invert, huh? not evert. And see the knee, uh, patella reflex. It is brisk. And left side, what is there? Is it only brisk or something else is also there? It is little bit pendular. Now you see the gait. So her main problem was foot weakness. And this is how she is walking. So what type of gait is this? It's a circumduction gait. So what is your final diagnosis? Clinical diagnosis. I'm not talking about tumor or demyelination or something. So it's a case of ataxic hemiparesis. So patient has hemiparesis involving more of lower limb, more distal with ataxia. So where is the localization? Localization ataxic hemiparesis. One of you, one of you. Stand up and speak, otherwise I don't know who is murdering. So it can be anywhere, middle cerebral, um, sorry, cerebral peduncle or thalamus or even in the pons. So this child had diffuse middle and glioma involving the thalamus. So one more, one more case. So again, this is a foot examination. So right side is normal. Left side, I am asking him to lift. Asking him to invert, evert. I'm asking both sides simultaneously. Invert, evert, dorsiflex and plantar flex. So what is happening on the left side? I'm asking him to do both sides simultaneously. He is able to do only on the right side. So what is that? What is it? Huh? Please stand up and speak. No. If you're bold enough, stand up and speak. <laughs> See, all of your residents, no? Correct, no? All of you means most of you. So I tell my resident, it's better to ask if you don't know anything, ask silly questions here rather than to give silly answers in exams. So don't worry, I'm not your examiner. So, huh? I'm not asked for localization. What is the phenomenon? This is, this is a flail foot. He is neither able to dorsiflex, nor plantar flex, nor invert, nor evert. So where is your localization? Flail foot. Huh? Correct. So it's an injection policy, shatic now policy. So this is his gait. So he is not able to do anything. You can say how high step at gait. It's a case of shatic nerve injury. So now uh, one one symptom of foot drop. No, like patients. They teach us very well. Like you must have heard number of symptoms like slapping gait and high stepage gait. One of the symptoms is inability to hold the chappals or slippers. So this poor lady, she was not able to hold her chappals. So she has tried uh, suthi, what we call in North India, with the chappal. So they has got bilateral foot drop. And you can tell me what is the cause of this bilateral foot drop. I'm asking her to lift the foot. Obviously, when patient is not able to do the movement, they compensate with the rest. So she's extending the knees instead of dorsiflexing. And you saw her son is trying to correct something. So what he's trying to correct? He's trying to separate the feet. Why feet are, feet are crossing each other? So what is your diagnosis? It's a spastic paraplegia with bilateral foot drop. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>
So deep peroneal nerve, as I told you, sensory is largely not largely not useful. Okay. Ah, so. Inversion should go, but inversion of the dorsiflex foot will go in uh, perennial, uh, the perennial. Uh, so my question is that that is the time when Gobi told that answer. Actually, you know, you look at the neither. Neither will go in if L4 also is caught. So if suppose somebody has a foot drop, and I ask you whether it is L4 or L5, and or uh, the perennial nerve, you said I will look for neither. If it L4 is the key thing for neither, if neither goes, you immediately tell, sir, this is uh, uh, L4, L5 involvement. I hope you understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clinical examination. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Saval. We'll proceed to the next topic. Another common and important sudden onset head headache. Approach and management by Dr. Ishwar. Shall we start? Yeah, the place, place. Place. Okay, fine. We are behind the schedule. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I flew in by Indigo Airlines yesterday. <laughs> well, when I walked in here, I met a couple of residents uh, I, and I asked them, how should this class be? Sir, the answer is very simple. We need to pass exam. Well, this presentation is not about passing exams, but also to help you to survive in the post-MCH days that are here to happen soon. Okay. My brief is to talk on sudden onset of headache. Well, <laughs> I talk about thunderclap headache. So it was in 1986 that this term thunderclap headache came in when Day and Raskin examined a lady who said, like a hammer hitting my head. Or most of the people who come to the cash emergency room space, the worst headache of the, or the worst headache of my life. 
So what are the characteristics of a thunderclap headache? You have a sudden onset of headache with vomiting, peaks in one minute, and usually comes down by five minutes of headache. And this headache is not accounted by, by any other factors like ICHD-3 diagnosis, international classification of headache disorders diagnosis. I'll come to that later. Okay, so this is thunderclap headache. Now, question is, is thunderclap headache a primary event or something secondary to some other pathology that is in the brain? Now, what the ICHD recommends is you should have a search for an underlying cause which should be exhaustive, especially because the most common cause of the two causes of secondary TCH. Primary TCH does not have a cause. The secondary TCH are subarachnoid hemorrhage due to aneurysms or non-aneurysmal and reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So these two things need to be ruled out. So you need to exhaustively investigate a patient who reports with thunderclap headache to the ER. Now, let me just list, this is what you need for examination. You need a lot of differentials. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, the causes of thunderclap headache include subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysmal and non-aneurysmal causes, unruptured intracranial aneurysms, ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, arterial dissections. This is something patients present with cervical pain, then headache. So this can also mimic a thunderclap headache. Cerebral venous thrombosis, pituitary apoplexy, acute hypertensive crisis, press syndrome, the us CVS, and the non-vascular causes, which are all, I'm not listing that. Let me go to that. Uh, in thunderclap headache, if you are to numerically enumerate the number of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, 25%, one fourth of them will have aneurysms or intracranial hemorrhages. Whereas 20% of patients with cervical artery dissection has TCH, 16% with cerebral venous thrombosis, and 15 patients have spontaneous intracranial hypertension. And bacterial and viral meningitis can also cause acute severe headache. Now, let me go to the un uncommon causes or the ones which we don't pick up uh, when we see a patient with severe headache. The RCVS is a multifocal arterial constriction and dilatation of the cerebral vasculature. Most of the times it is associated with non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And usually recurrent sudden onset severe thunderclap headache which lasts for one to three weeks, often accompanied by nausea, vomiting, photophobia, confusion, and blurred vision. Now, this is a 33-year-old lady who reported to Sri Chitra, and you can see that the arteries... Can I have a point? Okay. Okay, you can see that the dilated, di the, there is constriction of the M1 segment, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the M1 segment of the ICA. Okay. And sometimes the bead of the appearance also is there. Here, this is the contralateral. This is a 33-year-old lady who came with severe headache. And the contralateral also side also shows a narrowing of the M1 segment. The ACS A1 is not seen, very much narrow. Even the posterior circulation is not spared. Usually in vasospasm due to subarachnoid hemorrhage, posterior circulation is relatively spared. Uh, after three months, when you do an angiogram, it lasts closely up to this uh, vasoconstriction lasts for about three months. And after three months, it completely resolves. Now, what are the causes of uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome? Uh, most of them are migraine sufferers. Uh, they must be using a lot of drug, uh, drugs like cannabis, cocaine, amphetamines, triptans that are used for migraine treatment. Noradrenergic selective antidepressants, serotonin adrenergic antidepressants, and nasal decongestants can happen in eclampsia and postpartum. It can also happen when you consume a lot of alcohol. It can happen with surgical manipulation of wear vessels and strenuous physical activity, sexual activity, and well cell maneuver. Now, the, the next not so rare cause for like thunderclap headache is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or the press syndrome, which presents with headache visual disturbances, confusion, and seizures predominantly affect the parietal noxiflow. And that explains why you have these visual disturbances in this condition. Can affect the hypothalamus more than that. Hypertension is a risk factor. Most of the patients will have hypertension. So whenever a patient comes with severe headache, check the blood pressure. 
Okay. Now the radiological findings in press syndrome includes, which clinches the diagnosis. It's a radiological diagnosis, radiographic findings of white matter edema. And most of the symptoms are reversible after a period of time, two to three weeks. Now, hypertension is the most common risk factor. Uh, Preeclampsia, kidney diseases, especially renal failure, which all contributes to, kidney disease contributes to hypertension. Exposure to cytotoxic medications and immunosuppressants and autoimmune disorders. These needs to be checked when a patient walks in with suspected press syndrome. This is a classical uh, uh, MRI of a patient with press syndrome. Affects mostly the occipital and parietal lobes. So most of the patients will complain of visual disturbances afterwards. Now, a word about sentinel hemorrhage. If you look at about 25% of patients who report with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, they would have reported a headache two to three weeks prior to the actual rupture of the aneurysm. And this is called a sentinel hemorrhage. Sentinel means somebody look out. So the warning leak happens because the blood dissects through the wall. So the golden rule of the thumb is if a patient is suspected to have a severe headache, if the, even if the CT angiogram may be negative, go for a CT angiogram. So if it's the plain CT scan may be negative, go for a CT angiogram. This would save the life. Now, look at, let's look at the most common investigation that is used for evaluating a headache, that is CT scan, with subarachnoid hemorrhage especially, because that is the one where your intervention can change the life. If you don't intervene, the patient may re-bleed and die. So within the 6 to 12 hours, CT has a sensitivity of 100%. But if the patient comes to you after one week, well, don't trust the CT scan. Okay, now MRI, what is the role of MRI in acute severe headache? It is as sensitive as CT scan. The only problem is when a patient is having headache, lying in that gantry of an MRI machine is not the pleasantest of things to happen to him. So subarachnoid hemorrhage that can, and one advantage that MRI has is you don't have to poke the lumbar region for CSF. So SH that is missed on plain scan, CT scan can be picked up in with an MRI scan. So MRI scan with contrast is useful in not just subarachnoid hemorrhage, in spontaneous intracranial, intracranial hyper, hypotension, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, press syndrome, cerebral venous thrombosis, dissection, AV malformation, and even unruptured aneurysm, pituitary apoplexy, and spinoid sinusitis. So all this says MRI does have a role in acute severe headache, especially if the first CT scan is negative. Now, a word about spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So when the CS of volume decreases due to a leak or any other causes, there is sagging of the brain inside the cranial vault. This sagging causes traction of the sensory nerves and the vessels, which leads to headache. So the classic feature is a patient gets up from bed, has got headache, and the patient lies down, it's relieved. Now, many a times it presents with severe headache to the ear, and that's where you need, we need to work on it. Okay, this is uh, a picture of uh, the plain CT scan, which shows crowding of the basal system. And you can see the hyperincities in the cavernous sinus hyperdensities in the cavernous sinus. And in the MRI flare sequence, you can see the large tortuous transverse sinus, large transverse sinus, which is a classic feature of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And if you look at the ventricular system, you'll find because of the, the ventricles appear chinked or uh, effaced, and there is pachymeningeal enhancement on contrast and administration. Now this pachymeningeal, you can see the large transverse sinus of the patient, and this pachymeningeal enhancement is not limited to the brain alone. Even the dorsal spine and the lumbar spine also, the epidural, there is epidural venous engorgement and contrast enhancement. An MR venogram clinches a diagnosis with large tortuous sin venous sinuses. Now, let's look at the role of lumbar puncture and CSF studies. The, you know, when I was a, a, a house surgeon, my most important role was to do lumbar puncture for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Most of the time, they were traumatic. Now, the difficulty was to find out between whether it is a traumatic tap or is it subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, we all depend on sandochromia for it. There is a machine called spectrophotometer, which, you know, detects bilirubin in blood. And soon you're able to say that there is subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, in, in in the CSF. Okay, uh, there was a wonderful article in the Indian uh, in the Journal of Indian Academy of Neurology by Dr. Ravi Shankar, who is a headache specialist, who says that lumbar puncture should not be done. Instead, an MRI should be done 
because it has now fallen out of favor as an intervention, as an invasive procedure for diagnosing subarachnoid hemorrhage in a patient with a CT negative suspected subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, what is the investigation algorithm for patients with acute severe headache? Of course, the first investigation that should be done should be a plain CT scan. And if it shows, and if it shows subarachnoid hemorrhage, or even if it does not show subarachnoid hemorrhage, it would be wise to do a CT angiogram to rule out a sentinel hemorrhage due to an aneurysm. Now, if the CT scan and the CT, CT angiogram are negative, go for an MRI. And this MRI, if the his, history suggests something like a cervical artery dissection or a spontaneous intracranial hypotension, go for an MR spine screening and cervical vessel imaging also. Now, the lumbar puncture, as I said earlier, happens to be the last of the investigations of that is to be employed for diagnosing, for evaluating a patient with acute severe headache. Now, let me come to the last slide. So what is thunderclap headache? A patient comes to you with never before headache, never had such a headache in his life, accelerating headache and peaking soon and plateauing, vomiting and visual disturbances are present. Clinical signs include neck stiffness, visual disturbances. Some people are in altered sensorium. The blood pressure evaluation is very, very important because there are some symptoms, some uh, uh, diagnosis attached to uh, measuring the blood pressure. CT scan with angiogram of the cerebral vasculature would be the first investigation of choice. MRI with MR angiogram with neck vessel study should be done when CT brain is negative. Lumbar puncture, well, in an Indian setting where MRI is not available, should be reserved as a last choice. Thank you very much. Okay, one Some of us may be working in some place where there is some of us by misfortune happen to be in a place where there is no availability of neither MR nor CT. And the patient comes with thunderclap headache. The option for you is just, you know, you have to, it is not to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. It is to rule out fulminant meningitis. Understand? Because you may have to start antibiotics immediately for whatever it is. So in such situation where there is no MR, no CT, and it is not available. Yeah. Like next step. Uh, no, that's meningitis, it will be there. Meningitis. Yeah, meningitis, even and subarachnoid and, and hemorrhage also, uh, next stiffness will come. Everything will come. But, you know, when will you do that? That is the thing. Let's say, by misfortune, he also told, by misfortune, that particular good physician, he doesn't have any availability of CT, MR. He does an LP. And unfortunately, it becomes a traumatic tap. Your, your whole investigation becomes a, a nonsense. So people tell you, wait for six hours. With that headache, they should wait. Eh? And then after six hours, even if your tap becomes a traumatic tap, you can still do what he has told. You centrifuge and this thing will show, supernet and will show that uh, bilirubin. Eh? That is the catch there. Sometimes you may have to do a lumbar puncture to exclude Meningitis, fulminant meningitis, which can come with thunderclap and take a good lecture, sir. Thank you, sir. Huh? Hey, agreed, madam. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ishar. Next, we'll move on to the next topic clinical patient with hemiparsis by Dr. Subhash Kaut. No. 
everybody is awake after coffee. Otherwise, it's a challenge to have post-lunch session. Hemiparesis means weakness of one side of the body. It's usually because of pyramidal tract dysfunction. It may exist with aphasia, neglect, or any other neuro deficit, which is very important because neighborhood signs and symptoms are important. And this is the pyramidal tract where it starts. You all know area of four bed cells. And you know, if only this is involved, then you will get hemiparesis of various degrees. But if anteriorly this part is involved, then you will get aphasia along with it, motor aphasia. If even little more is affected, then you will get cognitive disturbances. If posterior part is involved, as it may happen in the complete MCA, then you will get visual field deficits. So the core is the hemiparesis, which can be isolated or it can be along with other signs. And it's important to know. And this is the uh, superficial surface of the brain. But if you take this section, it's very important to have a three-dimensional mental picture of how the pyramidal tract is. You know, this is the homunculus along the area of four, foot, hip, trunk, arm, and they're all scattered fibers here. But as they come down, they get concentrated. And at the level of internal capsule, they're just this thick. So therefore, imagine if there is a one centimeter lesion, which is near the cortex or subcortex, you will have a mild hemiparesis. You may have a just mild facial weakness or mild. But if the same one centimeter lesion is at the level of internal capsule, you will have a dense hemiplegia because all the fibers are concentrated there, right? And when it crosses the internal capsule and comes down to the level of midbrain, then you, you may have an associated third nerve palsy also, which is called Weber's syndrome. And if it goes down and goes to the level of pons, you have a sixth nerve palsy also. It's called millard gubler syndrome. If you open the textbook, there will be hundreds of syndromes which have been described. It's not necessary to know their names. It's impossible. But just based on what is associated with what, it will be given some funny name. Okay. So, but what's important to know is that you can have hemiparesis with cortical deficits, which means it's a large artery involvement, or you can have pure hemiparesis, which means it's a capsular infarct or a small artery infarct, or you can have hemiparesis with some cranial nerves, which means it's a brain stem thing, or you can have a nystagmus or some ocular palsy when it will become an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, right? Or if it goes to the level of medulla, then you will have bulbar dysfunction. And again, if it's a medial medulla, it will become medial medullary syndrome with the tongue weakness and the pyramidal tread. If it is a little lateral, it will become lateral medullary syndrome, you know, with nystagmus and dysphagia and pupillary changes. So therefore, core, you have to remember hemiparesis, and then you have to know what are the other symptoms and take five minutes to examine the patient. And just by clinical examination, you can localize the lesion. But for localizing the lesion, this picture you have to keep in mind and imagine and think where is the lesion. That is all about knowing what is the lesion in hemiparesis. Then as far as the etiology is concerned, it's very important to know how it started. That scene we have to think in our mind, how it started. If it is acute, which means 12 o'clock patient was all right and at 12, one he got this problem, then it's an acute stroke which can be ischemic stroke or intracranial bleed. If it is acute, for the acute, they have to tell the time at which it has happened. What was the patient doing at that time? But if it is subacute, which means two weeks have happened and slowly it came and all, then it cannot be a stroke. Then it is something like a subdural hematoma or a rapid lead tumor or a brain abscess or a venous infarct. Could be one of the differences. But if the patient says that I'm having this weakness for the last one year, and it has been slowly progressing and slowly, then you have to think of some chronic etiologies, you know, like a brain tumor or a spinal tumor, or sometimes even motor neuron disease, things like that can be asymmetrical as Gopi said, and they can have. So you all this we have to keep, that etiology comes last of all, and for that we have to know. But first thing is the localization. And after localization, the etiology. The most important thing in which you will see hemiparesis in the real world will be acute only. But as a neurosurgeon, you may see subacute also because you will be dealing with brain tumors. So acute and subacute is important for you. But most important hemiparesis not to be missed is acute stroke because time is brain. 
If somebody tells you there's a hemiparesis, which has happened two hours ago, you have to run with the patient. You cannot waste even one second. So for those patients, you have to know what is the vascular risk factors. Is he hypertensive? Is he diabetic? Because then it is probably a stroke. Is there any history of recent head trauma for obvious reasons, <clears throat> whether it's a subdural? Or has it come in the setting of fever on headaches? Then it could be something related to infection. It could be infective endocarditis. Huh? We should know this history. Many times we don't ask. And eventually somebody tells us what we know. It's very important. Fever, headache means infective endocarditis, stroke, or it means a brain abscess, right? Or does the patient have any other systemic disease like a connective tissue disease, a background of connective tissue disease? Hemiparesis, the setting is important because the etiology will depend on that. Is there any history of previous stroke or TIAs? Is he hypertensive, ischemic heart disease, diabetes? Is he a known atrial fibrillation, smoking, raised cholesterol? In general physical examination of a hemiparesis patient, mainly the acute hemiparesis, always we should check for the peripheral pulses. Takaya shoes can be missed if you don't do this. Coarctation of aorta can be missed, and they have been missed by professors just because they failed to touch the feet of the patient. So therefore, peripheral pulses, we should make it a habit. Temperature, xanthalus mass is a good thing to show, at least to impress the examiners. Check xanthalus mass. Look at the skin. Is there any cafulous spot there? Are there any neurofibromas there? Auscultation of heart is very important. Because in acute hemiparesis, sometimes there may be an underlying mitral stenosis. This used to be given in the MD medical examination to trap the students. And they would invariably miss it. And neurologists anyway have stopped using stethoscope. And I'm sure neurosurgeons also don't. But in a hemiparesis, you must use the hemi, you know, stethoscope. With stethoscope, we look like doctors. Otherwise, we are not doctors. I don't think brewery is important. It hardly makes a difference. But then it should be mentioned, no brewery. Fundus is most important. Fundus is most important because fundus actually gives you a clue. A acute hemiparesis fundus should be normal, right? If there is papilledema, normal I mean there may be hypertensive changes, but if there is papilledema, then you know you, you, you know there is something which is, there is a swelling is happening. It is probably an acute venous infarction. It's a CVT or it's the underlying brain tumor, you know. So fundus is very important. Don't forget to do this in acute hemiparesis. Don't leave it to ophthalmologists as Vivek Lal says, you know, Check the fundus yourself. And of course, neck stiffness to rule out any meningitis. So this is a general physical examination. And uh, now the evaluation of hemiparesis or evaluation of anything should be focused and it should be done in limited time. I think gone are the days when the neurologist used to take one hour to examine. He used to come with a kit and he would sit down and he would spread 10 things around the bed. We have done that. And other patients in the ward would also watch us what we are doing as if it's some magician who is going to do some. And then we would slowly, slowly check it. I think those days are gone now, uh, gone with the wind. We should be focused. And no neurological examination should take more than seven minutes. Quick and focused. Observe the patient's head and body and whether he's preferring one side. It depends on whether you have, many times these hemiparesis patients will not be sitting. They'll be lying down. So see whether he's oriented to one side because he's probably neglecting one side of the body. And trust me, in acute hemiparesis, you cannot make them draw the flowers and those maps and all. You just observe them. They are neglecting one side of the space. They are oriented to the other side. If he's conscious, ask his name, time, place for orientation. He's well oriented. And give him a command to follow. That's it. Show me your tongue. Close your eyes. That means he's conscious, he's comprehending. You have tested the speech. Enough. Look for the visual field cut. And look as an expert. Just give him, threaten his one lateral sight. And if there's a menace reflex positive, which means he's not blinking, this is enough to say that he's having a home when I miss him. Anyway, and the Don't waste your time looking for the nasal field and all that. No. Just the template. It's called field cut. There's a field cut. This is enough. Can he recognize people? Can he recognize his wife, his brother, whosoever is along with him? And then show him a torch. What is this? So that can he see the objects? Does he have a visual agnosia? And you can show him the name or ask him to read the name of your, your own name on written on your apron or anything. You know, you're quickly doing these things which should look natural, but actually you're picking up findings. You're already ruling out his disorientation. You are checking his speech in this, right? 
you are checking his cognition, you are looking for agnosias in a very natural way. Then ask him three word recall, which is easy, give him three, not that important, but if you do it, it's good. And if patient is conscious and in a good shape, there's a test called mini cog, which does not take more than three minutes. It's supposed to take only three minutes, which means give him three words, telephone, TV and pen, or any three words, right? And after giving those three words, if he's in that shape and he's sitting, ask him to draw a clock. Clock is a very good cognitive test because it tests so many things. It tests apraxia, it tests visual spatial orientation, it tests memory. And by the time he draws a clock, it tests neglect. By the time he draws a clock, it'll take him one or two minutes. Then ask him, what are the three words I gave you? And if he remembers those three words and if he has drawn a clock, his cognition is okay. And even if there is some abnormality, it doesn't matter. He's good enough to live in this world. Okay. Now, so far you have checked his hemiparesis, you have checked his cognition. He's reasonably okay if this is normal. And if it is abnormal, make a note of it. He may be having aphasia, he may be having sensory aphasia, he may be having a field cut, but you got your findings. Now you are coming down to brain stem. Look for pupils, look for ptosis, look for nystagmus, look for any gaze palsy and fundus. With this, you will get a reasonable idea about the brain stem. You will know whether he's having a nystagmus. You will know whether he's having an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. You will know whether there's any pupillary asymmetry and it's a lateral medullary syndrome. You will know whether he has a gaze palsy and he's looking towards his lesion. All that you will know within 30 seconds, right? Look for any facial asymmetry. Ask him to open his mouth. Ask him to say, ah, look at torch. Good torch from your pocket. Show the torch. Look at the uvula. Look at the tongue, whether it's deviated and any asymmetry. Now you have tested his head. You have tested his brainstem. Now come the limbs. Limbs are important because anyway, you know he has hemiparesis. That's how you have come to him. But look for any spasticity or rigidity. If those are the cases, then it is chronic. It is not acute. It is chronic and you may sometimes pick up uh, some any other extra pyramidal disease. Look for it. Now, sometimes the weakness can be subtle. So therefore, if he says, I have weakness only in the foot and hand is all right, ask him to raise both hands. And sometimes there may be a subtle pronator drift. And you will say, oh, no, you are, you are having weakness in the hand also. You know, many times they may not say there's any facial weakness. Ask him to smile. When he smiles, there, you will bring out the facial asymmetry. So these things are important. So pick up the unrecognized or unreported weakness because we are dealing with hemiparesis. And don't forget sensations. And sensations also don't waste time. Some sensations are very subject to patients will change uh, what he is telling every minute. So very grossly, you should check sensations. Do you feel equal on both sides? Look for any cross sensory loss, whether there's any difference between the face and the legs, whether it's cross sensory loss, because that will localize it to brainstem. And look for any, finally, look for any incoordination in the upper or lower limbs. Sometimes they exist together in coordination and weakness, which is what's called ataxic hemiparesis. Now, all this you have to do in all patients of hemiparesis. So you practice it. It should not take more than seven minutes. With practice, you can achieve anything. Okay, so based on this information, you have to localize this disease, this hemiparesis, into one of the five locations. So this is the examples. Is it a left hemisphere syndrome? If the patient has a aphasia and a gaze palsy and a visual field cut with a hemiparesis, hemiparesis is common to all of them. But if the hemiparesis is happening in the setting of aphasia, gaze palsy and visual field cut, you know you are dealing with the left hemispherical disease, right? Because of aphasia and because of visual, a cortical subcortical, large artery disease, or a brain tumor or something, which is involving left hemisphere. This is how we should think. This is the grammar, right? But if the patient is neglecting one side of the space, and he has gaze palsy, and there's a visual field cut, then you are dealing with the right hemispherical stroke. Does the patient with of hemiparesis have nystagmus also, with the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia and a crossed motor or sensory deficit? then you are dealing with a medullary disease or a brain stem, particularly medullary thing. Or does the patient have pure motor hemiparesis and nothing else? Or a pure sensory or sensory motor paralysis and nothing else? Or ataxic hemiparesis? Then you are dealing with a lacunar syndrome and lacunar syndrome can be anywhere from parietal cortex to internal capsule to pons. But 
one of the causes of hemiparesis can be in the cervical spinal cord also. You know, very uncommon, but not unknown. But in that, the clue is that the motor and sensory will be crossed. Sensory will be on one side, motor will be on the opposite side because of the obvious reason. It's very rare, but possible. So always, whenever deal with hemiparesis, consider cervical cord also, not thoracic cord or lumbar cord, thankfully, but cervical cord you have to consider. So now I will, so, so that is about the background. Now I will just show you quickly some cases. These are my own cases and I'll finish them in next five minutes. So that will give you a flavor of how the, these are all cases I remember because they are my own cases. This is a 55 year old lady, known diabetic, right hemiplegia with aphasia of five minutes duration and then completely recovers. CT brain is normal. So completely recovering hemiparesis with aphasia. So obviously this is a TIA. Okay, ECG echo carotid Doppler was normal. Uh, sorry, ECG echo carotid Doppler was done. Carotid Doppler showed 70% stenosis. So the treatment was carotid endarterectomy. And that was the cause of her hemiparesis and she recovered completely. This is a 48 year old executive hypertensive smoker. Again, he has a right hemiparesis with aphasia one hour ago. Blood pressure is so much, blood uh, sugar is 105. CT brain is normal, but his MRA is showing that there is one of the MCA is blocked here, as you can see. And he's a hypertensive diabetic. And when he comes, he is still having weakness. So he's thrombolized. Okay. He's thrombolized and he recovers with that. And the investigation reveals that he has got an underlying mitral stenosis, of which he was not aware. Many of these rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis, patients themselves don't know. And it is a stroke first time because of which they know. This is a 60-year-old man, hypertensive, acute drowsiness, headache and vomiting. Blood pressure is 220 by 110, gaze deviation to right, left-sided weakness. So any hemiparesis which comes acutely with very high BP in a hypertensive man, it's most likely a brain hemorrhage as opposed to ischemia. And I think as neurosurgeons, you will be many times called to see such patients. And in many of them, you may have to intervene also or do stereotaxic evacuation and all. There's a midline shift. This is a 21-year-old man who has a right hemiplegia since one hour. He's conscious but confused. Power grade 3 by 5 on right side. CT brain is normal. And patient recovered fully by evening. And this is a post-epileptic hemiplegia or Todd's palsy because it came out that previously also he used to have epileptic seizures. But he didn't tell us that. But eventually we came to know that every time he gets a seizure, he gets confused and he comes to hospital. And every time he tells the doctor, I'm having a stroke. Many of these patients, they call epilepsy also stroke only. So always ask them, what does he mean by a stroke? This is a 55-year-old diabetic on metformin and glimperide. Sudden hemiplegia for one hour duration. Drowsy, not obeying, confused, cold, sweating, CT brain normal, blood sugar 30. So hypoglycemia can come exactly like a hemiplegia. Not only clinically, even radiologically also. Radiologically, you will even have diffusion restriction. That is why the only absolute contraindication, the only test which you have to send in an acute ischemic stroke is blood sugar. You need not send any other blood test because hemiplegia can be absolutely mimicked by hypoglycemia. You have to rule it out. This is a 70-year-old man with gradual left hemiplegia, history of fall at home one week ago, mild drowsiness, headache since a week, no marks for that. 70-year-old man has fallen down, now has headache. He has a subdural hematoma. And uh, sometimes you observe them and sometimes you drain them depending on the size. Subdural hematoma is such a big mimic that I'm sure even Dr. Nair, you must have sometimes missed them. You know, you, it comes when you are least expecting it. And suddenly you see there's a subdural hematoma. So always keep that in mind. Many times we have been prepared for thrombolysis, everything, and seen that it's a subdural hematoma. This is a 25-year-old lady who was on oral contraceptives. That gives you a clue. Acute onset weakness of right side of body, preceded by headache for three days, one episode of seizure. So seizure, young lady, oral contraceptives, drowsy, fundus showing papilledema. So you know this is a CSVT. And when CSVT comes, it does not always present as an ischemic infarct. It presents as a hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage, sulcal hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma. And still you have to treat it with heparin. So therefore, it's very important to keep that diagnosis as consideration in the susceptible population. This is case 8, 19-year-old girl, looks toxic and sick, 
presents with acute right hemiplegia, history of fever and headache, sick, febrile, young girl. Obviously, some infection is going on somewhere, and you can see this brain abscess. And infective endocarditis, people also just look like that, febrile. So always rule that out, right? Case nine, 18 year girl with fever for one week, five days later, altered sensorium seizure, and she has a left hemiplegia. All of them are hemiplegia or hemiparesis patients, but the settings are different. So here there's a girl with fever, and after the subsidence of fever, fever has already stopped, and five days later, she comes with a hemiplegia. So something post infective is happening. So what is post infective? It is a demyelination, what's called acute disseminated encephaloid, ADEM or ADEM as we call it. And it, it recovers completely with steroids. And uh, case 10 is a clumsiness of left hand and altered gait for one month, mild memory disturbances, confusion, dull persistent headache since three months. And this kind of cases you are going to see for most of your life. This is a glioma and which many times can present just with a mild headache and some mild hemiparesis and all. And this is what you know. But Functional hemiplegias are not unknown. And uh, two of the functional hemiplegias I have seen, one in my own relative and one in my own class fellow. And the relative was having some business problem and all that thing, and suddenly he got a paralysis. And he was admitted. I was also young in my profession. I also thought that he's having a hemiparesis. Till in the night, I saw that he quietly woke up and went to bathroom and finished everything, moved around and came back and again took the role of a patient. So next day morning, I didn't have any sympathy. I said, you will get well, and he became well. But more difficult was that I saw it one of my class fellows also, one hemiparesis. And it's very difficult when a medical student gets a functional hemiparesis. It was not even probably functional, it was probably simple malingering. Because the planter also was up going. And the knee jerk also was brisk on that side. But then the patient recovered completely. So. In American literature, they are saying about 15% of the hemiparesis seen in acute emergencies are functional. That sweeps very high, but I'm telling you. So always keep that also. If it is inconsistent findings and examination is completely normal, keep that at the back of your mind. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kaul, for an extensive and uh, short examination. Uh, and one session, Dr. Kaul, uh, to differentiate between cervical and cerebral hemiparesis, the face examination will yeah, differentiate. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Face examination is very important because if there is no face examination, then consider strongly cervical. Thank yes, you, yes, thank you. We'll invite next speaker, Dr. Suresh Nair, visual loss, surgeon's perspective. Just continue. Of uh, Professor uh, Subhash talking, you know, suppose somebody presents with bilateral subdural, think of spontaneous intracranial hypotensis. And you will miss that. Do you think how it can come? I think of, and uh, Dr. Gobi is here, he's not there, he's gone. So, uh, one thing he told about, he's there. So, he told this, I am not a big neurologist, but at least, you know, uh, it said intramedullary tumors. They hardly never ever present with early bladder involvement unless tumor is arising from conus medullaris, early bladder. Otherwise, you see appendiomoma, everything, even bladder will not be involved at all. Old books, when we all studied, there was no image, only we used to do a lumbar puncture and myelogram and all. So, all myelitis, when something cuts through the cord, transverse myelitis or demyelinating. They hit the bladder first. So people equated that with intramedullary tumors. They are totally, so one should not tell uh, intramedullary tumor bladder is early involved. It is not involved. Second thing also, uh, so which I have told many of the neurology residents, it is dissociated suspended sensory loss. It is a signature of intramedullary lesion. So what is the dissociated suspender? So dissociation comes when there is association. So what is associated? It is the sensations carried through the spinothalamic system. What are that? They are pain, touch and temperature. Poor posterior column is behind. It has nothing to do with this. So when there is dissociation of touch, 
from pain and temperature is lost, touch is spared. We know it is all because of the crossing. Because pain, touch and temperature, they don't cross at the same level. Touch crosses more anteriorly. Pain and temperature, they ascend and cross. They cannot get caught at the same time. So dissociation occurring is in the anterior commissure area in the spinal cord. It is not the dissociation between posterior column. Somebody has got posterior column normal. The other things involved, it is not dissociation. I will put the reverse way. Suppose somebody has got a posterior column is involved. The other thing is uh, normal. Do you call it intramedullary? It's such a stupid thing. Eh? These things have been carried out for the ages. Eh? So now my talk has been made uh, so simple by Professor Asta. So uh, this is on uh, visual loss. I am the last man standing. I won't take time. This is for exam going students. Uh, so uh, these are the areas or beautiful picture. And uh, all say this. I think she has covered uh, most of the things: intracornal, extracornal, intercompartmental. I, I am leaving this presentation, so you will know what are the lesions which neurosurgeon should look for. Right? Uh, it's not that the optic nerve glioma or meningioma. Something more can come in the intracornal, extracornal. But the mother of all uh, things for the neurosurgeon is what is written in this red. I will try to tell something about this. Uh, not that others, if I get time, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll get time. First, let us go to uh, primary retrochiasmatic retro tumors. I am not uh, addressing at all. So these are the various areas in a lesion which can affect the uh, chiasm area, which will produce bilateral loss of vision. So these are the things, you know, which Professor Asta has told. And even suppose sometimes patient can have binational anopia. Usually it is from a bilateral calcified supraclinoid internal carotid artery. So let me tell in a few minutes what is happening to these lesions. So pituitary adenoma, it is the mother of all pituitary, all cellular, supracellular lesions. So usually, you know, people, this is the question asked, why vision drops from, say, your temporal, why it comes from uh, temporal up-down? You can see arrow there. This is the this is usually asked in suppose in a pituitary tumor how uh, vision comes like this. It is because of this you know inferior nasal fibers they cross anteriorly as opposed to superior nasal fibers from the retina, which is happening for craniopharyngioma. So in craniopharyngioma, what we tell if there is suppose somebody has ascending up like that, you tell it is from it is a uh, not a pituitary, it is a uh, something else. It could be anything other than pituitary. Okay, got it. The reason is this. So these pituitary tumors can come in all sizes, shapes. It can go everywhere. So many classifications. And there is some definition for giant tumors. You should know that. And usually they are aggressive tumors. They can have multi-directional spread, like what we see in these uh, things. And uh, frequently, they spread through their capsule. And uh, this is a very difficult management problem, as you see here. But what is a silent adenoma or a whispering adenoma, which you should know? Eh? The silent or whispering, is everybody should know what it is. Eh? Their pitu silent pituitary tumors are hormone immunoreactive without clinical signs of hormone hypersecretion, but aggressive tumors. But you know, their transcription factors are positive. So if you look for PIT1, T, PIT, SF1, they can be positive. Most common is silent corticotropic adenoma, which are which will look like a non-secreting adenoma to somebody who doesn't know about this, but they are really, they recur very fast. Some people call it even whispering adenomas. Second thing I told, you know, everybody should know about uh, in pituitary tumor, the medial wall of the uh, uh, medial wall of the cavernous sinus or lateral wall of cell. You can see it is the diaphragm. It, it is the diaphragm. You can see the red one. Red one is the pituitary. This is a dura which covers the pituitary gland. And also you should know that this I told in the morning. Uh, this nose classification, these things can come 
uh, to the cavernous sinus. But this is what you should know is, you know, you can come between the periosteal layer and the, uh, this dura, uh, dura and this periosteal dura in the pituitary area and we can go to this uh, medial wall of the thing. This is what I told, again showed, this is attached by some important ligament. So, especially for tumors, these are secreting adenomas, uh, GH adenoma, these tumors, they invariably affect the medial wall. So, you should know what are the ligaments which are to be cut. You have the inferior paracellar ligament, Heretical clinoid ligament is actually attached to the proximal ring. And uh, this is, you know, this picture I got from uh, my colleague at Chitra, uh, Pragas, he only I told, I warned him. So this is what he did. You know, open the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. This is a step one. And divide the inferior paracellular ligament. After that, detach the attachment of dura on the floor, or the cella and medial wall. Then he goes, then he goes up separate the attachment of the medial wall and the root, and then lastly cut the carotid clinoid ligament. This is how he removes the medial wall of the carotid, which is important for medial wall of cavernous sinus, which is important for total cure of secretory adenomas. And this is a picture which he has given, shared to show before opening and after opening. And here, Again, a large case with uh, this thing. Next, we'll quickly go to craniopharyngioma. It, it is always an enigma in its origin, growth pattern, consistency, etc. And uh, you know, there is a lot of difference between pediatric and adult craniopharyngioma. I, I will just skip this. But what is more important is you should know that most of the papillary which comes in the elderly people, they have BRAF V600 mutation with the activation of this pathway, MAPK signaling pathway. And while the adamantinous one, they have seen TNNB gene mutation with downstream activation of these pathways. Because also they express this EGFR and VEGG. This is because this is important. We can give personalized treatment with some newer drugs for this craniopharyngioma. So these are some of the examples of papillary and adamantinous so many classification system have come. And uh, this is a good classification people who are interested should see in relation to the arachnoid, eh, which I also read. It is infradiaphragmatic and supradiaphragmatic, infradiaphragmatic, and here it is supradiaphragmatic, extra arachnoid, supradiaphragmatic, intra arachnoid, and then subarachnoid. And what are the various types of tumors and its implication in uh, surgical management? Please read this good article. And Hoffman classified like symbols, cellular, pre-chiasmatic, retrochiasmatic, which we all uh, learned at that our time. Uh, it is a horizontal classification. Well, Sami classified it up, grade 1, 2, 3, all uh, extension to the ventricle. And another classification which people follow is now this classification, Kassan's classification. It is, you know, either it is in front of the infant develop. This is the infundibular, or it is trans infundibular, or it is retro infundibular, or it could be in the ventricle. So, which has important implications for management. So, I will skip all this. This is type 3. And this is another one article which has come based on these all variables. Uh, this, this is a good article which one should read. It has been classified like this, uh, cellular, supracellular, pseudo, intraventricular, all as some uh, implication on management. And these are the things. Uh, you, try, you can read that article and uh, see. And also, you know, this is the old thing. With you, you know, classification is there to judge hypothalamic involvement. If posterior hypothalamus is involved, you say your patient may not do well in spite of doing good surgery. Uh, this is, you know, you can do all this brain T2 images to see interface. So I think uh, Professor Asta has told all this pre-chiasmal presence with optic atrophy, retrochiasmal hydrocephalus, intracellular endocrinopathy, all this I will skip, which I told you. And the crux is, you know, whether treatment should focus on relief of symptoms or avoiding of treatment related to complication. So these are the things which uh, uh, people know is uh, surgery. It used to be uh, transferial, my time. Now it is slowly drifting here and mostly to this uh, uh, 
extended endoscopic. Uh, so this used to be post fix chiasm. It is easy for people to do a transcranial surgery. It was easy while uh, prefix chiasm people used to do a, a trans nasal endoscopic surgery. And this is, you know, they, this is the window is opened up. Easy for endoscopic surgery. As opposed to this, where this window is closed, which is good for a subfrontal approach. So these some imaging things are there to know the chiasm, stock distance. You should know how, what is it, how you can find out. And this is again, uh, there is an angle to know whether it is pre-chiasmatic or post-chiasmatic. But all these are going out. Why I will tell you. Intraventricular, it is uh, transcalosal surgery. But otherwise, you know, uh, the transnasal approaches are coming in a big way. And this is one thing from uh, Miranda group. What he is doing, eh? pre-chiasmatic, pre-infantibular are effectively removed through endonasal, trans-tuberculum, trans-planum approach. Subchiasmatic transinfundibular require the addition of transcellular approach with inferior pituitary tract position. Retrochiasmatic retroinfundibular lesions are better access performing endonasal superior pituitary transposition. In fact, craniopharyngioma is slowly going away from transcranial surgery to extended surgery. But this is some article which has come. What is the progression free survival in adults gross total removal in adults is I would say it is significantly better than subtotal removal in adults if you remove craniopharyngioma gross totally it is significantly better as opposed to in children it is not like that so uh, this is again another study to show so treatment options we have all these treatment options these are also coming. You should know BRAFT V600 targeted therapy, EGFR inhibitor. We go quickly from there to chiasm, hypothalamic glioma. So it is a big spectrum. You know, this is a dodge classification where he has classified into optic nerve chiasm, retrochiasmatic, and all this you can read. And this is also uh, depending upon whether hypothalamic sulcus is the tumor is in front or behind. Again, some classification has come, and you can see with tractography the optic nerve also. So, uh, in optic, it's as opposed to optic nerve glioma, this presents with diencephalic syndrome, endocrine dysfunction, raised ICP. We have seen enough of uh, this from uh, Professor Asta. I will uh, click. This is one of the uh, chiasm glioma. Uh, this is, you know, basically, you know, it is a the decision to intervene is by a multidisciplinary team. Most of the treatment is uh, uh, is actually, you know, uh, medical treatment only. Uh, so chemotherapy only. But there are some indications for uh, surgery when uh, to open the CSF pathway when there is hemorrhage or when there is exophytic component. Otherwise, basically, it is uh, a medical management and radiotherapy or sometimes CSF diversion. Uh, so, sir, biopsy, uh, there is a limit, limiting role for biopsy to sporadic op optical chiasmatic lime in the relevant trials with a typical radiographic feature. So, this is some uh, targeted therapy, which is what people are looking at. We go to the next lesion, that is supracellular meningioma. This is a common thing which uh, uh, neurosurgeons see. None of these supracellular meningiomas produce visual loss. The king of that is uh, uh, the planum sphenoidal olf olfactory group. Hardly, they don't produce, uh, they produce, in fact, papilledema and sometimes optic atrophy of one side, but not. This is a big planum and this is to show a Foster Kennedy syndrome. This also won't produce clinoidal meningioma. It produces unilateral visual loss. And this is a sphenoid being. It produces proptosis. But the meningiomas with neurosurgeon should know is a planum meningioma. Planum, sorry, tuberculum meningioma. Tuberculum meningioma pushes the optic nerve up and posteriorly. So this is, it can, it can also extend into the optic canal, producing bilateral visual loss. So tuberculum cell displaced optic Chiasm superiorly, posteriorly, optic canal extension is common. And the presentation is asymmetric bilateral field cut. 
Uh, so uh, let me skip this. This is a typical example of uh, uh, tuberculum meningioma with extension to the optic canal. I am skipping all this to show. And sometimes very large planum, tuberculum, dorsum, meningiomas, you don't know from where it is arising. There is some article has come which will tell us from where it is arising based on angle and all. You can refer that. And there is some grading score. This is important because minus is here or he has gone. Manas. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Manas? Uh, Manas, yeah. So, uh, this is, you know, some prognostic scoring has come for uh, uh, tuberculosis cell meningioma. One has come from Hyderabad, uh, minus a series of 41 cases. And this has come from University of uh, uh, California in San Francisco, where they have put grading score. And this is the grading score from uh, San Francisco, where they put tumor score based on size, grade, optic canal invasion and artery. And this is minus a score based on duration, which was not there in the other than peritumor lidema. And this score was patients of, with the score of less than six had improved vision. Uh, so it's a good thing. And another thing which has come is our uh, Atul Goyal's on presentation also. Is that I don't know it is missing. He, uh, good day that is not in the crowd uh, so uh, so the thing is how do you manage this you know tuberculum cell meningioma unlike craniopharyngioma craniopharyngioma it is totally it is becoming endoscopic way while tuberculum cell meningioma usually you know this is the most of the series we do periodontal subfrontal but this is coming in a big way endoscopy so this is, you know, some of the articles which have come, which I could get from India. It's a one from, uh, one, fortunately, I am also there with Rajinish Katera. This is uh, Minus's place and this is Atul Goyal. I could find these three for transcranial surgery. And most of these things, so good visual outcome. These are two good series. One is tuberculum cell meningioma. And this is a comparison between endoscopic approach versus uh, transcranial approach. Transcranial approach was done in University of California, San Francisco, McDermott unit, while endoscopy was done by Kappa, Bianga, and uh, Divitis in Naples, and they found equal outcome, a uh, visual outcome. And this is again a replication, similar thing from one of our friends, Suresh Angla. I hope he's recovered, he's fine now. He also has duplicated that finding. And there are some uh, anatomical factors to decide which approach for meningioma. And uh, this is comparable out from for both Suresh Angla. And, uh, so what is the aggressive resection as the benefit of eliminating the risk of future complications of radio surgery? However, complete resection is not sometimes possible in cases of n plaque sphenoidal meningioma. So lastly, paraclidot aneurysm, successfully I am going to skip because I have told you in the morning. Okay, thank you. And I have unilateral visual loss, which also I will skip. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next, we will move on to the MCQ session. Uh, we are now so moving on to the last MCQ test for today. I would request each other, ma'am, to come on to the stage to moderate this. So I think this was uh, very a full blown lot of things to learn from this session. So. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Sriram is having his maths exercise. He's calculating and calculating for all of you. And you can see right now who are leading today. The test scores are out. And first one, I think when they write in short form, in their certificate also, we should write that. H K H S P R T H. Then I 
So anyway, we'll go, we'll start because quite a long day and then we have interesting case discussions. So can we come to quiz four, right? Be ready, open your app. The pin is there, three, seven, five, eight, eight, nine, four. The hall seems to be a little vacant than what it was pre lunch. Anyway. Still 95 is good enough. It will go up, yes. We'll go till 110, if not 120. But who is Bahuwali God? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think. Maybe someone. <laughs> okay, I think we are done. Oh no, it's coming. And then ten will go. <laughs> so someone is playing now, I think now. <laughs> someone is playing up, I think it's time to start. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here we go with the first question. So, paracellular ligaments getting attached to medial wall of cavernous sinus includes all except the following. Carticoclinoid, inferior paracellular, anterior paracellular, superior paracellular, posterior paracellular. There is that brilliant diagram by Sir. Okay, so I think just post lunch effect. Sir, whatever you gave me, put it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will get marks. Okay. Classification system which divides hypothalamic chiasmic glioma into three groups based on anatomical localization is named Dodge, Bhagwati, Suzuki, Matson, Yasagil. So, okay, so the answer is Dodge classification. Sir, you said this in your like in your speech, you said this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yes. So the next, uh, yeah, here's some new person, Harsimran and Shweb, Nilesh, so men and Arpit. Okay, let's see how it goes. Next question, please. Thunderclap have they refers to worst heading of ones like primary causes almost always there. Peaks in one minute and plateaus after some, all of the above. So we got the answer and most of them got it right. It's all of the above. So Nilesh has climbed up. Okay, Rupashri has come there. Okay. So next, RRR is the highest climber. Who is this RRR? <laughs> the following about reversible cere cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is true except seen in migraine. Mimics aneurysmal SH, small arterial infarcts can be evident on imaging or dehydration is a predisposing factor. Okay, the correct answer is dehydration and unfortunately very few people got it right. So this was tough. All excellent. So now again another player has come, Prem. Okay, next. What is the most likely location of acute right hemiplegia with aphasia? Left frontal lobe, cortical and subcortical, left internal capsular, right medullary region, and left pontine region. And the answer is correct by most of them, and it's left frontal lobe, obviously. So, sorry, you gave a good, easy question. <laughs> so, Rim continues, right? Okay, next. What is not a contraindication or to intravenous thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke? Intracerebral hemorrhage six months ago, acute ischemic stroke two months ago, closed head injury five months ago, and SH with unclipped aneurysm. Closed head injury five months ago. That's the answer. And oh, Prem is very fast. Fastest finger fast. It's what helps here, right? So, okay. Let's go. Next. An elderly woman presented with focal motor scissors and postictal right foot drop. What is the most likely diagnosis? Common perineal nerve injury due to fall of the scissors, intramuscular injection in gluteal region and meningioma compressing paracentral lobe or osteoporosis causing lumbar fracture. It's a good, very nice, confusing. Oh, see, so most of them got it right and it is meningioma compressing paracentral lobule. <laughs> so, next. Uh -huh. Unbeatable, huh? Prem is unbeatable this time. First time one uh, is not moving anywhere. Okay, next. UCSF uh, grading to assess surgical outcome of tuberculum cell meningioma includes all except duration of visual loss, tumor size, extension into optic canal, and arterial involvement of ICA or ACA. <coughs> So majority got it right. Majority means, yeah, <laughs> not majority, we can say like 37 only. So, okay. Cost of is come up now. 
So next. Oh, you are also in the race, Dr. Dhamal. <laughs> His name came. Food drop due to intramuscular injection in the gluteal region. More likely to have which of the following? Weakness of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Weakness of dorsiflexion and eversion. Weakness of plantar flexion and inversion. Weakness of plantar flexion, eversion. Injection, yeah. Yes. So it's weakness of dorsiflexion and eversion. So 34 of you got it right. Uh, some new player now, Soman, and uh, we'll go to the next. Craniopharyngioma can be treated successfully with all of the following except BREF, V600E inhibitors, temozolamide, interferon A, bleomycin. It's, it's a straight sitter question. Okay, so that, I mean, uh, there is, I thought there would be more like right answers. It's temozolamide. So, oh, he has gained back his seat. Prem has got back. Next. Which is true regarding silent corticotropic adenoma? Uh huh. -huh. See, 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 you have to cancel this. This is something wrong, which is. Okay. Yeah. Next. Breast syndrome involves the following except headache, vomiting, and visual disturbance, sin and hypertensive, angiography must be performed immediately. Treatment is to address the symptoms. Yes, except is there. So, yeah, majority got it right. Angiography must be performed immediately. Okay, scoreboard. Okay, the lead is being maintained by one. Next. Investigation into thunderclap headache is not true. So CT angiography of the brain's vasculature can be done after two weeks. CT brain imaging without contract should be performed as soon as possible. CT brain imaging is not useful after two weeks. Lumbar puncture is no longer the primary investigation of choice. So CT angio, but then uh, accept, right? <laughs> CT angiogram of the brain's vasculature can be done after two weeks, okay? 40 people got it right. So let's come to the scoreboard. NS. Who is NS from here? We are done, no? One oh, one more left. Okay. Okay, next. Aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is true except. So this is like a lawyer room. We are talking in negative most of the questions. Presence almost always is thunderclap. Can present with cardiac dysfunction. Neurological deficits are confined to damages to the motor areas of the brain and low threshold for brain imaging. Okay, so 38 got it right. Neurological, I mean, this was subarachnoid. I think most of you see it very commonly, but yet majority got it wrong. <laughs> Confined to damages to the motor areas of the brain. They must not have seen the except. So let us see who is the winner of this session. So the third position is by NS. Second by Soman. Her first is Kostopsha. Can they stand up please? Kostopsha. Okay, you are from? Can you? BGMC Ahmedabad. Okay. And the uh, Soman Medica Kolkata, very good. NS 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 is online, I think. Then 
yes so i think we come to the end i'll hand over to ajay for the rest of the proceeding thank you ma'am thank you everyone i request chairpersons to hand over the memento to the two speakers sir i request dr ishwar hp to come on to the stage to receive memento I also request Dr. Dawal Sakla, sir, please come onto the stage. So, Dr. Dawal, sir. Okay. I request a Suresh sir, to come on to the stage. No, no, sir. <laughs> to hand over the token of appreciation to the chairperson. Okay. Uh, we'll have five, ten minutes break and then we'll go for case discussion. Um, means I repeated class for uh, people to volunteer for case presentation, only one person, one resident. We don't tell the, we will not tell about the case. So, uh, so we have uh, two, four case presentations short. So for each case, I will request two faculty to chair uh, within half an hour or something. So we can take a five minutes break and uh, just relax and then join. Nobody will disappear, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The... No, no. It is just for. It... Five minutes. I just yeah. People will sit here because they know where to go. <laughs> they know where to go here. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll have the first. Uh, so, if people don't want break, we'll continue. Coffee is over. We give we serve. Uh, okay, then we'll uh, we'll. Huh? We'll continue. Okay. Okay. Please sit down. We'll continue then. We'll continue. Uh, the first case will be by Dr. Chirag. Can call uh, people who are outside. Can call them. We are starting. Be ring the bell. No. Ring the bell. The bell is there. Yeah. It's over. Five minutes is over. <laughs> ring the bell outside fast. Yep. So please sit down. The first presentation will be by Dr. Chirag from Ames and New Delhi. The second will be by Dr. Chandrasekhar from Kims. And the third will be from huh? Dr. P.K. Okay, Dr. P.K. from Nimans. And the fourth will be by Dr. Ravinder from Kims. I, I, from Tanayar and Dr. Subhash Kalpas called to moderate the first case. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I can sit there, sir. And I need uh, two volunteers also because I don't want all the questions to be asked to the presenter. Yes, yes. And two volunteers to come and sit in the front chair so that if the, if the presenter cannot answer, it will be passed on to the volunteers. So two volunteers, please. If you don't volunteer, then I have to... I have to force like, huh? Bahubali, who is Bahubali? 
Katappa and Mehodan Kaane. Prem Kaane, Prem. Come. <laughs> uh, and who can you tell Rupasri? Who is Ru Rupasri? Yeah, please come. I'm sitting the front. I'm sitting the front. So give me the list of the top 10, so I'll tell volunteers for the next cases. Uh, a very warm uh, good evening to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Chirag Kinsel. I am from Ames Delhi, a junior resident. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss a clinical case presentation over falsine meningioma. I will be discussing the pre op presentation of the patient, the operative findings, and the post operative course. So, let's get started. This is we are telling in the diary of this. We start with a case. And we have uh, analyzed that case. Okay. Now, you finish quickly because there is nothing uh, there, no? The only thing patient survived, no? There is a, <laughs> more than that, you have told everything. Uh, so, any quickly present. We thought it is some interesting case. We will still ask questions. Uh, okay, present. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Case presentation means the diagnosis nobody knows. Only you yeah. know, you present the case. We'll ask them how to uh, analyze yeah, sir, sir. like that. Okay, now you uh, present there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Patient, uh, 62 years old female, presented with a chief complaints of episodic headache and vomiting and uh, holocranial headache since last two years. And there was complaint of chronic movements of face and left shoulder since last 1.5 years. And also the patient complained of chronic neck and left shoulder pain since last 1.5 years. And complaint of numbness over the left side of face since last 1.5 months. And there was complaint of seizures involving the neck muscles since last one month. There was no history of diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, tuberculosis, coronary artery disease, or bleeding diathesis. On examination, uh, vitals were within the normal range, and uh, there was normal general physical examination, respiratory and cardiovascular system examination. There was normal higher mental functions. Cranial nerves were intact, and visual acuity was 6 by 9 in both the eyes, and both the pupils were normal size and reacting to light. There was a positive finding of the left pronator drift, and power was 5 by 5 in all the four limbs and there was normal tone and bulk of all the muscles. No sensory deficits could be found and there was no cerebellar signs. Patient had normal gait and no meningeal irritation signs could be noticed. What about fundus? Sir, fundus showed no papilledema or no features of uh, raised ICT. On uh, a radiological examination, the MRI findings, uh, the T1 with contrast and T2 images were suggestive of uh, uh, a middle third parafalsin meningioma with bilateral extension, which is left more than right. So a uh, brief uh, discussion about the various types of uh, meningioma I had uh, introduced here. One is intraventricular meningioma, which is uh, labeled as uh, one, and parasitical meningioma is two, and falcine supracellular clivus foramen magnum convexity olfactory groove or cerebellar. All these can be different types of meningioma, out of which I am taking falcine meningioma in this case. Now, this, this, this patient is a picture report. 
Sir, we are seeing that MRA to looking after this uh, blood supply to this uh, uh, tumor. So you want? Uh, so do you want anything specific from just ordinary MRA pictures, uh, which will give you some information? Say, uh, you have to remove the tumor, man. Understand? So after that, we'll go for some other investigation, which I want that. Which I thought they will tell. So what uh, with this MRI they have done a contrast scan. What other investigation will tell you that the tumor is easily suckable or not? But why is it called a meningioma? Ah, it is we are taking it as a meningioma only. Why is it yeah. Yeah. Any differential diagnosis for this? You can if there is a cat, you should not tell the differential diagnosis is dog. Understand? Cat is a cat is a cat. So this is obvious. It looks like a, a cat only. And so what say say MR? What findings will tell you? It is no, easily. Uh, question is why it, why it is a cat? Yeah. Okay. It's a cat. But why it is a cat? What are the features of cat? It's a meningioma. So that is such a large lesion. So all the sequence you should see. All the sequence you you should see T one T two. Contrast, whatever sequence, and then you tell why it is a meningioma. And this is easy to operate or difficult to operate. Already you have to operate. Easy to operate means, you know, you, you are not removing it like a cricket ball. You have to decompress the tumor. Understand? Every, anything in neurosurgery is decompressed. First step. You have, after reaching. Second step is what? Decompression. The circumference is sure. decompression. Till... The whole thing reduces and capsules start falling. Then only you start dissecting. Understand? So for that, what, what information? First, you answer why it is a meningioma. After that, tell what all. If anybody can answer. When our time, so we have got another 21 minutes. Eh? Please what, don't tell what, us. Eh? <laughs> how, many minutes? how many minutes for us? How much? Okay, okay, please, yeah. So what are the features of meningioma? Why you say it's a meningioma? Quickly. It is, uh, That's very easy. We are telling you it's a meningioma. All you have to say, why? One is the dural tail. So what is that? 
Somebody has told it's the false and many job also. Okay. Okay. What is that? Uh, so, the paradigm is shifted to either side or left and oh, thank God. Eh? So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, that we agree, man. What else, man? What is there to suggest? Uh, Legion is hyper intense in the contrast imaging. And uh, uh, they, 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 this, this is Fondra. So, this one. That, that is also Fondra. So that is T2 there. That is T2. Yes. This is T2. And uh, I don't know, that is also and Corona. This is all T2. Understand? Oh, we are seeing, I, am, I, I need not train my, I am seeing it here. Okay. So why do you think it is a meningeo? Uh, anything else you want? Questions are posting the rotation. Yeah, yeah. Are you seeing anything? Talk loudly. Uh, section. That's a dural tail along the fox. Some, some small uh, tail like thing is there, which, is, which can also be appreciated somewhere here. Yeah, contrast. Understand. So, people are so, for a broad based dural attachment and uh, it is there is no uh, intervention. Is it meningioma of one side By pushing the parts to the other side or it is a meningioma which is arising on either side of parts? Sir, Asper imaging looks like arising from both sides. Since uh, the dural attachment is uh, uh, seen in predominantly. Uh, so, in it looks like it is arising, arising from, from the parts on bilateral. Uh, either side of either parts. Side. Or is it arising from this side, whatever this side and Left. pushing the parts to the opposite side. No, sir, because it is the bilateral. Is maintained and, uh, uh, what is that? Midline is maintained, so there is no midline shift or any. Uh, okay. Agreed. It is what, bilateral. What investigations will you will tell us whether it is easily stackable or not? Sir, uh, any diffusion restrictions seen in. Uh, no, diffusion restriction. It is, you know, the tumor with low proton density. They will appear. Hypo on T2 weighted image. Anything which is hypo on T2 weighted image, either it is fibrotic tumor or it is highly cellular tumor. If it is fibrotic, you cannot even send it to your, your enemy, he will operate. Suppose it is a cellular tumor, you should operate. So, how will you find out from a T2 hypo? Uh, here we are seeing that film. T2 it is it's a hyper. Eh? Hyper, I don't know, from my side, uh, it's not very hyper, neither very hyper, in between like that. Okay. So, if it is hypo, it is either, either so calcification, it, uh, highly cellular, like a medulloblastoma, lymphoma, like that, or a fibrotic tumor. So, what you do, give contrast. If it is enhancing very well, it is a cellular tumor. If it is not enhancing very well, it is a Fibrotic. 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 So that ease of removal during surgery, you can assess with that T2 image and contrast image. Understand? Now coming to this patient, you are telling it is arising from either side of the path. And we have to take it out. Not with finger, with proper uh, surgery. So what other investigations you want? So DSA to rule out the feeder vessels. You know, I am not hearing it. So cerebral DSA to rule out the feeder artery. So that feeder is... artery, who is bothered about feeder artery? It is the least important for us. Huh? Feeder artery. Hmm. Somebody told, what is that? Bridging vein, sir. We, you have to look for bridging vein. This tumor can be accessed from either side. Either side. So to know from which side you can access. Sometimes it will be easy to access from that side. Because if there are no printing veins troubling you, from the other side, people can access from there and go also. Understand? So, it is most important investigation is it is MR we to look for printing veins to see which will come in the way. Understand? And now, suppose this meningioma, uh, this side, this side, uh, there are less printing veins. Right. Uh, this, this is which says less breathing weight. And you want to operate. Understand? Uh, so, how will you position the patient? 
You will tell, you can tell, I will come from the other side only. Uh, but you know, you can put this ipsilateral, there is no breathing way. You can put this ipsilateral side down. No. Understand? And turn the table and uh, take the, uh, to, uh, the other side tumor also. Understand? This breathing will go back to him. Now tell us. Tell us uh, what was done, what complications you had. Uh, sir, actually, the bridging veins preservation is all, always important uh, while doing surgery because it can be resulting in postoperative infarct over that uh, if the veins are sacrificed. So that has been uh, very well taken care of during the surgery in this patient. Uh, I, I will be explaining uh, in later slides how that. Was. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so as I was discussing, uh, the we can uh, just discuss a brief compare. I think the slides are not. But uh, don't teach us about meningioma. Teach us about this way. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah. So uh, the meningioma can be approached in falling by falling approaches. There can be anterior uh, type approach, uh, which is done in a supine position, and there can be middle uh, approaches, which can be anti middle anterior and middle posterior. And the occipital uh, approach is used in the prone position. Depending on the position of meningioma, all these approaches can be used. In this particular patient, we used anterior interhemispheric approach. The patient was positioned in semi-sitting position. A linear incision was um, made. And also, uh, the was made in the midline after raising the skin flap. And then left parietal craniotomy was performed, and also, uh, which was extending across the midline. And dura was retracted medially. Uh, so, these are the brief surgical steps. I also have a surgical video. So, MRV picture or some venous anatomy picture is there. Sorry, you have MRV or uh, any DSA picture or something. No, sir. Actually, for this patient, we uh, got this many investigation only. Uh, no, no, no veins were studied at all. Uh, no, sir. It would have been studied, man, 100%. Okay, you would not have seen the picture. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I have a... <laughs> Is the position the same? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Taken from above. So you are doing it in a semi sitting position. Yes, sir. Okay. So the position of the location of the tumor is, is no, in no. the middle third posterior. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually, uh, this side is anterior and this is posterior. Here, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir, uh, uh, anterior, I, I, this is taken from a posterior. Like, uh, in season, is uh, along the coronal. Uh, sir, this is taken from the side only. Yeah. One ear is seen, other ear is not seen. No, one, sir. Two, <laughs> Two pins are here, one pin there, and your base is that only, no? So it is transverse. Okay, please tell that. Background, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Please explain to me. Transverse incision, and then the skin flap was raised, and the power was made in midline. You mark the transverse, but not the midline sagittal sign. In the ER. So uh, by marking uh, only the transverse incision. You don't mark the sinus. Midline sinus, don't you mark? Uh, it was done under MBH kindness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't tell all that, madam. <laughs> you should uh, mark that. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, I have a brief surgical video also. Uh, no, we will go back by plenty of time. We also want to know how to finish this time. So we go back to the previous slide. Yeah. I am wondering how to finish so, though. I don't know. No. So you have written one essay. No, so ah, what is it? Uh, sir, this is the surgical steps. Uh, I can explain via video if I am allowed. No, okay. You were not noted at that to pass and go into the opposite side. Oh, God. Eh? <laughs> at least I could have saved two minutes there. No? <laughs> The next case, at least don't tell the diagnosis. Eh? The next person, right? Eh? Only saving 
great for us is many a time videos from run. No, it is running. So uh, this is the surgical video. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so here, okay. it looks like it is. I think it is, it is uh, uh, anterior yeah. interhemispheric approach, and it is present in anterior one third of faults. So we have used uh, middle one, middle one third of faults. And middle. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, it was present in the middle. And... Yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually, uh, we we have used uh, uh, anterior interhemispheric approach and. Uh, sir, what what is the brain you are attracting? You will tell retractors further, you know. Yes, sir. Retractorless, no? Don't tell that all my. If you have to retract. Rema Rupasri. Which, which, what part of the brain you are retracting? Parietal lobe. Lobe. Yeah. yeah. They have a, they have the pointer, no? Means if, if I present it, then we have to. Ask for half an hour. <laughs> Can you tell me what is this, this line? Yeah. And uh, what is the brain in front of that? What is this line? Uh, what is that line that is showing? Pareto occipital line. Uh, Pass on. Pareto occipital line. Okay. Pareto occipital line. Very good. Okay. Yeah. So, so what is the brain in front of that? Yeah. There is a superior parietal lobule and an inferior parietal lobule. This is medially we are talking now. Medially, what comes in front of the superior parietal? This uh, this sulcus. What comes medially in front of that sulcus? Uh, what is that? The precuneus. Precuneus. Precuneus comes there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And precuneus extends anteriorly where? Supra superior parietal lobe. Correct. Yeah. Now, uh, okay. So what was done for this patient? So what is the function of superior parietal lobe? When you have it, morning with the thought, no? Sir, yeah, superior parietal lobule uh, has a role in uh, maintenance of bladder function as possible. Uh, whenever uh, and also also the social, uh, social uh, uh, behavior of the patient, like in the parietal lobule, parietal lobe. No, uh, so superior parietal lobule is uh, central lobe. No, compared Dr. Call to... only has taught that. <laughs> See, it, it, there is a sulcus which divides the parietal lobe into inferior parietal and superior parietal lobule. Inferior parietal lobule, both supramarginal and angular mm -hmm. are highly eloquent. The other one is relatively, uh, uh, what is that, non-eloquent. Under that, you are not much bothered unless you go to the depth. So what will come? The video you show? Yes, sir. Yeah. You're a first year student. Yes. I think you're a first year student. Yes, yeah. second year. Huh? Oh, five year course. Yes. Eh? Oh, man, you're already passed, man. Okay. For <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay, show the video. Uh, so, as I said, patient was positioned in semi sitting position and then the uh, transverse incision was made uh, and then uh, the tumor. Uh, Tumor was approached by anterior interhemispheric approach. Uh, the dura was uh, uh, dura was cut and also it was very carefully uh, observed to preserve the uh, cortical bridging veins. Uh, minimal traction was used uh, as being shown in the video. And then uh, after the uh, very careful dissection around the bridging veins, uh, uh, that to, uh, the fast was uh, approached and the uh, dura was cut. Uh, to uh, uh, remove the tumor from the left side. Uh, this tumor biopsy is being taken here. And then uh, the sequential decompression of the tumor is being done. This is easily suckable, no? Uh, so this is the sequential decompression of the tumor.
This is the fibrin glue that is being used uh, to reinforce the cortical bridging veins so as to uh, avoid any post-operative infarct as why I was already discussing. So uh, now that we are going to contralateral side as well to remove the tumor as, a, as it was crossing the midline. <coughs> A uh, close total excision of the tumor was achieved. Simpson grade one excision of this tumor was achieved. Uh, hemostasis is being ensured. Uh, so that was the surgical steps of this patient and uh, as I already discussed, inferior sagittal sinus was ligated and gross total excision was done. Uh, pericranial graft was harvested after that and lex duroplasty was done with the pericranial graft. As I already mentioned, fibrin glue was instilled over the suture dura edges and the cortical veins to preserve the bridging cortical veins and to avoid any post-operative infarct. And then bone was placed back and fixed with mini plates. Uh, this is the post-operative radiology of the same patient. As we can see in the post-operative MRI, T1 with contrast and T2 images, uh, the uh, whole of the tumor has been removed and there is a good post-operative cavity. So, Simpson grade 1 excision has been achieved. And then uh, in the post-operative follow-up of the patient, uh, there was no residual and also there was complete preservation of the cortical veins and tumor biopsy was reported as fibrous meningioma WHO grade 1. Uh, patient was also having a good post-operative outcome uh, with uh, no more episodes of vomiting, headache and also symptoms uh, that were present pre-operatively had been reduced. Last follow-up was done three months after surgery. What did you learn from this? What is your message? Sir, I learned that uh, uh, it is very important to assess pre-operatively uh, what exactly uh, we need to plan for the surgery. And then, uh, like in this case, uh, the major challenge was, I think, uh, the bridging cortical veins. If uh, uh, if by chance that would have been sacrificed, then the patient uh, in post-operative uh, field might not have doing that well. Uh, there might be some residual neurological deficits or infarct that might have dwelt. So uh, it was taken care by using that glue and also the minimal... Very, very good, man. So the moral is, you know, such a large uh, tumor can be removed excellently. By very good surgical technique, what we noticed is there is no retraction at all. Right? No retraction. Uh, and uh, for lucky that it was easily suckable to you, right? Yes. And the uh, patient came out well. And another one minute, 42 seconds I have got. A any comments from the uh, audience? No, it's yes, what did you look for post-op? That's what I was asking for superior parietal lobe function. You went from the left side, no? So post-op, what did you specifically look for? Or what deficit in this patient? Because you said post-op, fine. Uh, and if, I uh, mean, you took uh, a precaution for infarct, if there was an infarct, what has happened? And what what do you look for in post -op? Some weakness, if, if at all it can be present, because some corticospinal tracts are there, which also uh, come from the anterior parietal lobe. No, yeah, me. that is bowel and bladder function that is important. And also Any... the motor hormone... Uh, Sensory function is important, sir. Yeah.
इसे मॉर्निंग लेक्चर्स ऑन पैरेटल लो डोमिनेंट हेमिस्फीयर नॉन डोमिनेंट हेमिस्फीयर कैन यू रिकैपिटुलेट एंड टेल यस सर लाइक वन इज इफ वी टॉक अबाउट डोमिनेंट पैरेटल लो देन दैट इज एसोसिएटेड विद मेंटेनिंग इट इज द इडियोमोटर और रेडियोस्टिनल एप्रेक्सिया इन दिस डोमिनेंट हेमिस Okay, don't. Okay, time. Time. Fourteen seconds more. Thanks, boy. What is your yeah. name? Chirag Bansal. Okay, Chirag. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah. you. The car is coming back. So you have to go back and read about parietal lobe. What post of what specifically you have to check. Okay. <laughs> so the. Uh, Thank you, Professor Nayat, for the Subhash call. Uh, oh, country for Parayatal. You have to teach me. I am very busy about this. So, uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Uh, Chand Chandasekhar. Yeah. Uh, I request. So, we request Dr. Sandeep Mahetar and Dr. K. V. I. S. Yastri sir, come on to the stage, sir. the last presentation what the audience was see especially the upcoming residents how do you decide the patient is to be late prone or supine in a case of parasitical tumors anyone up till which extent of the tumor attachment to the sagittal sinus you will have the patient in supine position and at what level the patient is made prone for surgery posterior one third of uh, sagittal it is the uh, 9 cm it has got no vein first 7 cm has got no vein so the game is on the middle in the only in the middle part so first 7 is decided last line is decided yes sir so the case which was presented was middle third only so in middle third most of the times the surgeon prefer the supine position because of the inherent problems with the prone position and the lower inferior sagittal sinus from parasagittal to false sign the lower most part the inferior sinus the tube is to get more and more vascular and the anatomy of the anterior cerebral artery should be delineated first in those cases when the tumor moves from superior to inferior moving along the sagittal sinus in this case this tumor was exactly in the midline so aca was not discussed okay thank you good evening sir uh, i am dr chandra shekhar i am presenting the case of a 65 year old gentleman who is a resident of kalimnagar telangana uh, who is a retired railway employee uh, educated and uh, history was given by himself and which was reliable uh, the patient presented with a chief complaint of uh, pain in his lower back for uh, last years aggravated since last 20 days and uh, history of numbness in the uh, right lower limb since uh, last one month uh, coming to the present history 65 years old gentleman uh, came with a complaint of uh, pain in the lower back for the last years which increased in intensity intensity in the last 20 days it was in insidious in onset he noticed the pain initially when he stood up suddenly from sitting position when getting up uh, from his uh, driving seat uh, the pain is of dull aching in nature and intermittent and radiating to right lower limb from hip along the posterior aspect in the right foot uh, pain aggravates while standing up from sitting position while bending forwards and pain is also aggravated on uh, prolonged hours of sitting and pain gets relieved uh, after he stands for few minutes after sitting pain is also relieved uh, by lying down position for few minutes or the, on taking uh, analgesics initially pain was uh, relieved on taking analgesics but over the period of time the frequency of taking analgesics increases there was issue of difficulty in walking due to pain since the last 15 days due to the progression of pain there was also issue of uh, limping while walking since last 10 days due to the increased intensity of pain uh, it was uh, first noticed by his wife and got to attention he has also history of difficulty in rolling uh, on side uh, to sideways on bed due to severe pain in the lower back 
Painer was not having, not having any diurnal variation and is also not associated with any morning stiffness. Uh, patient has issue of numbness in the right lower limb since last one month. Started initially in the outer, as uh, outer aspect of the foot. Later uh, progressed to the involve the till knee since last 15 days. Patient is uh, able to appreciate decreased sensation of trousers and soft over the right lower limb uh, since last 15 days. He is able to feel a decreased sensation of hot water uh, over this uh, right leg during bathing. The, there is no issue of any unnoticed injuries or burns over his body. There is no issue of giddiness on washing face in the morning or on walking in the dark. Uh, there was issue of uh, slippage of footwear in, on the right leg since 10 days. Issue of difficulty in negotiating foot, uh, into uh, footwear in the right leg. There is no issue of difficulty in getting up from satin position or wearing trousers. No issue of tightness in limbs, frequent tripping over small, small objects, uh, slowing of pace while walking. There was no issue of sweating and loss of hair over lower limbs. There is no issue of joint pains or joint swellings. Uh, there was, uh, no, patient has not sustained any trauma or fall or fever. Uh, there was no issue of any revealing rise of temperatures. He does not have any uh, discoloration of skin over the lower limbs or swelling of legs. Uh, uh, there was no issue of bowel and bladder disturbances. He does not have any associated neck pain or paresthesias in his upper limbs. There is no issue of any swelling or dimple or tuft of hair over the back. There is no issue of any headache or visual disturbances. Okay. Coming to the past history, uh, patient is a known hypertension since the last 10 years and he was uh, taking tablet uh, amnodipine 5 mg once daily. And he's also a diabetic since last seven years on tablet metformin, fine enemy twice, twice did. Uh, in family history, uh, there was no neuroketogenic syndromes in any of the family members and no issue of no TB contacts or TB um, uh, issue of TB in the family members. Uh, coming to treatment issue, he used to take uh, initial painkillers like diclofenac from a local practitioner and uh, gets pain relief. But uh, recently, the frequency increased and he's not having any improvement. Uh, because of that, he came uh, to us for the further management. <laughs> Uh, patient uh, takes, was uh, taking mixed diet. There was no issue of loss of appetite or uh, no significant weight loss. No issue of uh, alcohol consumption or smoking. No issue of uh, drug allergies or no issue of uh, previous surgeries in the past. So to summarize my case, uh, it is a 65 years old man with a low back ache radiating to light, right lower limb since 3 years. Increased in intensity since 20 days with pain aggravation on bending forwards and limping while walking due to severe pain since last 10 days with decreased sensation on right leg since 15 days with difficulty in negotiating right foot into footwear and slippage of footwear on right foot since 10, since 10 days, which is not associated with any bowel or bladder, bladder disturbances. Uh, coming to anatomical localization. Uh, we didn't ask two volunteers. Uh, two volunteers... Uh... Uh, who are the good? Yeah, come, please. Then one more volunteer. You can, both of you, come sit there. No. Yes, huh? What do you think about case? How do you analyze the problem? Uh, as there is one lower limb involvement and uh, it seems ascending. Okay. What is the ascending? Did patient mention any history regarding uh, ascending or descending type of... Uh, in this case, what's your analysis? Yeah. So as there is a history suggestion of a radicular pain, uh, patient can have a... Uh, PIVD disc pulse. So you think it is a, a radical it involves 
maybe a chronic uh, onset which uh, has uh, progressed into an acute episode of pain yeah no history of no history suggestive of any acute event but uh, the intensity of pain has increased uh, over 20 days what what will be the diagnosis One of the DD can be a lapsed intervertebral disc, which is causing compression. Sir, this can also be an uh, extradural uh, SOL, which uh, was there since uh, years, but uh, it has uh, entered into neural foramina since days, which is uh, causing pain while bending and uh, radicular-like symptoms. But the back is As there is no history of trauma, uh, listhesis is less likely. As there is no history of evening rise of temperature, tuberculosis is less likely. Though age is 65, sir. So this can be sir, as well, I think. Sir. What? Extra dural tumors. What I can do? What I can accommodate one elephant without producing any. extra Extra, yeah, extra. So, why are you thinking it is radicular? We suggest of a radiating pain to the right lower limb. That's it. The all radiating pain need not be radicular. Somebody was telling us about judicular pain also. No? So, why are you telling radicular pain? So, what are the characteristics of a radicular pain? It's always along a dermatome. Understand? Radicular pain usually many a time from there. Understand? What is it? Understand? So, always it has to come from behind along a dermatome thing. And that is what and gets aggravated by. Straining, sneezing, everything. Eh? So that you should tell. Understand? Coughing, straining, sneezing, everything that pain can get aggravated. Eh? And it can have varying qualities. Understand? So, but that is how you describe a radicular pain. What else is there in this patient? Could be radicular then? Patient has loss of sensation, something on the right leg. With uh, difficulty in negotiating right foot into footwear. So, what is that suggestion? Sensory loss of the uh, foot and uh, difficulty in negotiating uh, uh, or slippage of footwear while walking suggests. Uh, L5S1 involvement. L5S1 involvement. L5S1 involvement. Okay. And it is extra dual. It's all already extra dual. Extra dual tumor. Hello. Uh, Dave, what do you think it is? Tell something. No? What is the culprit? If it is a root, what roots can produce this? Probably L5 is one thing. 
which, which root involvement patient will have difficulty in putting this uh, footwear and all. You have to observe what kind of He was having issue of slippage of chappal while walking, sir. And uh, while wearing shoes, he was having difficulty in uh, negotiating into the shoes. So what does that mean? What is that? His chappal was slipping away from his shoes. So which muscles are there? He was not able to sleep. Doctor says that we. Then sir. If there is doctor pressure that we, they have difficulty in what type of water? Heel walking or toe walking? Heel walking. But that's a first. Yeah. That's one. Where they will have difficulty in pro walking. So that history, what is there in that? You didn't tell that history. So you can add patient had difficulty in walking with toes or with toes or with heel. Is anything possible? The people with you know heel, <laughs> heel, people heel, they cannot, they can still walk with toes. So that you didn't clarify. Do you understand? understand. The people with foot weakness, uh, people with foot weakness can have either a L5 involvement or a S1 involvement. One will produce difficulty in walk heel walking, which is L5 is involved. In S1 is involved, they have toe walking. So which you should tell in the history so that they can tell correctly. You understand? Yes. You can tell now only. Uh, he was having difficulty in heel walking. Heel walking, yeah. Okay, now you tell. Continue. <laughs> so, what do you think? What route is implicated now? L5. L5. Okay, with this history, uh, where, where do you think the problem is? L5 is getting caught. Whether it is uh, uh, getting caught uh, uh, in which part there? Uh, central, paracentral, inside the canal or far left? Neural foramina. So, paracentral, this collapse, where? At which level? L4, 5, L3, 4, L5, S1. So if there is a paracentral disc at L4-5, is it the traversing route which is caught or the exiting route which is getting caught? Exiting, L exiting routes. So L4-5, there is a disc which is the exiting route. In L4, L5, intervertebral foramen, which route goes? L4. L4. Okay. So, it is how you learn the L4, L5 intervertebral foramen. Which route goes? L4 goes or L5 goes? Eh? L4. So that is called the exiting route. Understand? So you are telling in paracentral this collapse at L4, 5. It is the exiting route L4 which is caught. Eh? You understand? So usually it escapes. Eh? It is the uh, traversing route which is getting caught. Understand? Uh, you understand? So, uh, L4, L5, you are implicating, implicating a posterior lateral disc. Uh, so, it has to be L5 root which is, which will get caught. Understand? Because it is traversing. Uh, can L5 root get caught by the same level disc? Suppose in this condition where L5 root is getting caught. But it is uh, the traverse, it is exiting route. L5 is the exiting route, but it is getting caught. That is far lateral. Understand? If it is a far lateral, this collapse, 
say the exiting route itself can get caught. Understand? Now this important thing. How will you diagnose from history whether this patient has got L4, L5 paracentral disc or L5S1 paralateral disc? Both can produce uh, foot weakness. How will you find out from history? Anything is far lateral, it catches the ganglion. It is extremely painful. That is what if pain is very severe. Otherwise, you know, if the paracentral dyspolar, you lie there, your wife will give you all coffee, everything. They won't have any pain, man. They're happy. They, they want all that thing. But far lateral fellows will keep on jumping. They cannot turn or anything. Severe pain. Now, rest you tell. What was the finding? Neurological examination finding. Coming to uh, hey, all this, we leave. Uh, limb examination on inspection. The uh, uh, limbs are normally symmetrically sized limbs. No shortening of limb, lower limbs. No prominent veins on legs. No ulcers on legs. No skin discoloration of limbs and no swelling of legs. No atrophy of parasomanal muscles and no trophic changes in the limbs are seen. Patient was walking with limb on his right leg and having antalgic gait. On palpation, there was tenderness present on uh, right paraspinal area of lumbar region. Step sign was negative and all peripheral pulses were felt. Uh, coming to motor examination, patient was sitting in and standing uh, independently. He was able to sit in good erect posture, but uh, unable to stand in erect posture. On examination, a straight, lazing, uh, straight leg raising test was positive at 30 degrees on right side. And cross straight leg raising test was positive on left side at 60 degrees. Patrick test was negative. Tone was uh, normal in uh, both the uh, upper and lower limbs. Okay, okay, go back, go back, go back. Yeah. So, what is the inference of this straight leg raising test? Sir, so on um, uh, raising the leg straight, uh, above 30 degrees on the right side, patient was having pain on the right side. On, uh, on uh, uh, raising the uh, left side, uh, lower limb straightly, above 60 degrees, patient was again having pain on the right side. So, what is the inference of that? Inference of cross straight leg raising test. Well, well, you know, both sides. No, no, one side only. It's a, it's a, even if the unaffected limb is lifted up, he gets pain along the affected side. So, what is the inference of that? No. Well, it has some location of this one is axillary. Other is older. Look at that. Axilla means if they are more prominent there, opposite leg you raise, they get pain. Understand? Now that is the inference you have. <laughs> sorry, I am very sorry. It is YouTube, it is going now. Okay, that is the inference. Understand? Uh, that, uh, what is Patrick test? Sir, flexion, apparition, external rotation of the legs. Yeah. So, what? why did you do that? So, uh, in case of patient with dysosis on flexion, abduction, and action motion, uh, no, it is sacroiliac joint, lumbosacral joint disease, Forever. a triple joint. Mm -hmm. Understand? If anybody has a lumbosacral so problem, uh, understand <laughs> this Patrick test will be negative, but their SLR, SLR rod will be normal. Understand? There is another test called Lessig's test. What is that test? Okay, anybody can tell what is Lessig's test? That's a basic question. Say, you, you lift the leg up. At some point of time, they will tell they are getting pain. Understand? Then you bring it little down. And then suddenly don't shift like that. But if they jump with pain, it is also classical of our root compression. Understand? There are other tests called uh, Sickard's test, Bonnet's test and all. That is, you know, you do, it's a you straight leg raised, then you dorsiflex the big toe. They start getting pain. Or you adduct the, uh, you internally rotate the leg and do SLR. They get pain. So they are all suggestive of, if normally SLR is negative, but you do all these maneuvers, if they get pain, it is also suggestive of a positive SLR. Understand? What is Simmerman trust? Simmerman. Simmerman test is, you know, you make the patient prone and then you keep a palm over the posterior aspect of the lower thigh. 
and suddenly flex the limb and they will get shooting pain along the anterior aspect which is suggestive of l34 understand this can understand so other things are suggestive of l4 l5 l5 as well understand next findings you tell for yeah on uh, on uh, motor examination uh, ankle dorsiflexion section was weak sir uh, by five and uh, ehl dorsiflexion was weak uh, weakness was present sir and uh, patient was unable to walk on heels squat and the was good reflexes reflexes uh, reflexes ankle uh, ankle jerk was absent sir other the rest of the reflexes were two plus patient is a non diabetic non diabetic and non hypersensitive okay Otherwise, you know, suppose a patient is not a diabetic, can you explain that axial angle jerk? So unilaterally absent angle jerk. Suppose this patient is not a diabetic. Since both angle jerks are involved, obviously it should be from uh, diabetes. But if unilaterally patient is not a diabetic, angle jerk is also absent. What is your inference? Uh, yes, one second. Uh, involved. It's a more the, the next descending rule that is also getting caught. Understand? Uh, so, so what are the features of S one root involvement? Absent ankle jerk, sir. Absolutely correct. That uh, difficulty on uh, walking on toes. Yeah, plantar flexion weakness. Uh, and one more thing is there. It is avatar weakness. Understand? Avatar weakness. Angle jerk absent. And plantar flexion weakness. Suppose a patient has got posterior tibial neuropathy. Understand? That fellow also will have absent angle jerk. That fellow also will have plantar flexion weakness. How will you differentiate it from a S1 root lesion? Correct. Look for aversion. Aversion will be normal there. Understand? Okay, these are gimmicks. So, uh, did you investigate this patient? No. Okay. Uh, diagnosis. Uh, on sensory examination, there was a uh, reduced pain temperature and foot touch on right side, sir. So, why did you do this rhombox and all? Already, you know, it is in the order of equine. Unnecessary things you did not write. Eh? Okay. No. We have evaluated with the uh, MRI today. <laughs> uh, my possible visual diagnosis is uh, L4, L5 uh, uh, discrotation, central or parasitical. For the L5 S1, uh, central or parasitical discrotation, sir. Please don't need to bother. Uh, uh, we have the local and central. We have written L4, L5, L5, S1. What is it, man? L5, S1 will implicate which root, man? L5. L5, L5 S1 parasitical will produce S1 root. There is nothing to suggest S1 root involvement in this. So, unnecessary things you should not write. Otherwise, you should write L5 S1 bar handle. Understand? Like that, you should write. Right? And the morning, we don't know. So when there is a crow, don't tell a monkey like that. Understand? Sir, my. Always one diagnosis. My first diagnosis is L4, L5. Parasendral. Second, L4, L5. Parasendral. Third means you increase the sound. L4, L5. Parasendral. One diagnosis. So the picture. This is a... What could have happened for the aggravation of symptoms? <laughs> See, he would have had a dysprolapse because he's having backache and right leg pain for the last three years. Last three weeks, 20 days, he has aggravated. What could have happened? It, it could have entered the foramen, neural foramen. It could have entered. He would have strained without, you might not have yes. any history. Due to some and it, this bulk would have excluded. Did it? 
a sudden deterioration of the neurological signs and symptoms. So, titubated uh, uh, MRI image uh, of a uh, post spine screening showing uh, uh, some uh, cranial to coral or C. C5, C6, C6, C5, C6, 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 so on actual cuts, we, we can see uh, there's uh, L4, L5, perfect disc uh, more on the right side. But static cells are there. Here we told it. What is important? Nobody looked at this picture, right? Here, I'm very tall at this. Hey, you see a left side, normal side. You can see, you can see that fat shadow there. White, white, white. You see. L4, 5, you go and see. That will not be seen. I am not seeing from here, but you can show that. You know, that is the importance of this picture. We should see, people should not neglect to look at this. Ah, very nice, man. So you, you can see for very nice you have made. The, uh, that, 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 that picture up, up there, up there. All the roots you can see. All the roots you can see. Understand? And now th this side, that is a disc. Eh? There are also fat is seen, man. Okay. okay. But that is very important. That here, laterally, you can see all the roots there. Uh, usually, cycle cuts uh, they will come from uh, right to left side. Correct, yeah. Right. <coughs> so, here and all, it's uh, everything is okay. Huh? And uh, this is where left comes. Right. You assume that is the left man, okay. So, so uh, this is a paracentral dyspolar cell four five, and what you people did, man? Okay, uh, it is not operated. Not operated. What you will do for this way, sir? So, uh, no. Other than uh, this endoscope, you tell me. Uh. So only single level is involved in causing compression. Uh, L four five. So what are the procedures you know of? And uh, how to remove this disc? So, uh, we can offer micro discectomy uh, and uh, laminectomy with discectomy, sir. The lab, laminectomy with laminectomy. Discectomy, sir. L four L five discectomy and micro discectomy can be done. Uh, no, so what what is that procedure called, man? So what, what, where is that? Or a penetration? Yeah. Tell me, it's giving the answer. What is the attachment of ligament and flavor? Okay. Talk loudly. So ligament of labum attached uh, superiorly lower half of the lamina and uh, inferiorly to the edge of the lower. Superiorly it is attached to the inner surface. Inner surface of the uh, yeah. lower half of the lamina. Yeah. And uh, inferiorly attached to this uh, uh, okay. edge of uh, edge of this uh, lower lamina. And uh, medially, it is attached to the spinous process, laterally to the so, facet so, okay. Suppose you have to remove some lamina. Which lamina you remove? L4 or L5? Part of the lamina in this? L L4. Very good. So suppose there is a L, between L4 and L5 and L5-S1, uh, where you can avoid, if at all, you have to do a laminectomy, ME or something, which is easy to operate, where you can avoid a uh, small laminectomy. L4, L5 or L5, S1? L5, S1. Why? And foramen, that introvertible. Not foramen, man. Space. 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 Right. 
I think next case, okay, man, very good. Eh? Thanks. It, it, it is going to be operated next. Sure, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. For this, uh, Dr. Rastan, Dr. Vivek, uh, to come on to this stage sir, for chairing the session. Dr. Rastan, Dr. Vivek. You can come. And uh, one more, one more volunteer. So, well, it's being recorded. That is why. Right. Control, and then. So, can you introduce yourself no, to volunteers? They can ask. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Praveen Krishna, uh, second year player from uh, Finance Bangalore. Uh, here we have a short case. Uh, I'll be showing a video of a patient uh, which was referred to as uh, like to a neurosurgery OPD by neurology resident. Uh, like they saw the patient and uh, they have uh, done an evaluated the MRI. So based on the MRI finding, they were yeah, referred to us. Just for... tell the clinical findings. Yeah, yeah. I'll just show the video, sir. It's yeah. just uh, a spot. Okay. So this is a 10-year-old boy who presented with this uh, abnormal uh, twitching of the face uh, since two months. Uh, so the question is to the audience, like what surgical approach will we be doing? And, uh, no, no. Before you go to is, a surgical approach, tell us what's happening. What is, what is the diagnosis? Like, I just want to ask the audience, like, what, do you oh, what is the age of the patient? 10 years. 10 years. Uh, male child. Uh, and what? Uh, but what is happening? Tell us what is happening. You should describe your differential diagnosis and we'll ask you questions. What is happening? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let him tell his observation first. Yeah. The patient came to us. And they show that again. So, see, we heard about so many movements chorea, ethetosis, dystonia, seizure, epilepsy, everything we heard. What do you think is happening? For that, you need to describe that what is the movement which is occurring and where is it occurring? So, uh, so when we got it, uh, we, we were told that... You have the video? Just tell it now. It's okay. Whatever you got the rest of the So, there is a abnormal closure of the uh, left side of the... Uh, abnormal involuntary. Involuntary. Yes, involuntary closure and also twitching of the... Uh, angle of the mouth. Angle of the mouth. And they are occurring simultaneously? Yes, simultaneously, they are occurring simultaneously. And uh, so we, they want to do the MRI. And, uh, what do you think it is now? Can it be dystonia? Okay, let, let me ask you. Can it be dystonia? Is it dystonia? Is it normal to? No, it is not. Why? Because dystonia is a prolonged, continuous contraction of a muscle. Is it a focal seizure? Why? Why can it not be a focal seizure? It may be a focal seizure. You can ask the volunteers also. Yes. Anybody can answer. You can answer. Can it be a focal seizure? So yes, what will to, you to see whether it's a focal seizure or not? You may, may not get the exact answer. But what should you see? What should you do once uh, such a patient comes to you? He uh, could madam, be... Madam, one more thing. Is it glyphoros spasm or is it hemifacial spasm? So, uh, we are not in this hemiphagia spasm. Uh, uh, why, why did you think hemiphagia spasm from here? Or to help you, what is other Babinski sign? Hemiphagia spasm, what will happen to frondalis muscle? So, it is, this will contract at the same time. Occiput, this frondalis muscle also contract. That is characteristic of hemiphagia spasm. Understand? It prefer a spasm, it doesn't occur. Understand? Here, when this contract, this also contract. 
That is named after Babinski. Abdar Babinski said. Understand? Go and read. No, you should just know. So it is, it's it's like not a rocket science. It's of course hemifacial spasm is something which you should recognize. But what I'm talking is the differentials in such a condition. So at least rule out epilepsy, ask patient questions, see whether his pupils are equally reacting or reacting. Focal seizures, this all may be not seen. But still do think of one such uh, differential. And uh, especially if it's continuous. So it can be epilepsy, a partial is continuous. So, like, uh, no, what are the differential? Uh, just one is epilepsy, a partial or continuous. One is no, no differential diagnosis before you go to MRI. Uh, two two causes we have said possible causes. One is epilepsy, partially continuous, facial focal seizure. Second is hemifacial spasm. Can you think of any other differential possibility in a young boy? Ticks can be. Yes, ticks can be. So how do you differentiate between ticks, blepharospasm, and seizures? Like uh, ticks, uh, like uh, it is also involved in movement, uh, unprovoked. Uh, but in uh, difference between hemifacial spasm and ticks is like uh, in ticks, th this patient also has a left shoulder movement also, and also platysma is also movement. So it can be a motor tick. So why is it not a motor tick then? Because the patient, so now, now comes the role of your history taking and examination skills. Ask patient whether he is able to voluntarily subdue these activities. Takes patient will be able to stop these activities even voluntarily. Voluntarily, I mean to say. Why is it not blepharospasm? It is not blepharospasm, but why? Like because blepharospasm is ideally bilateral. So hence that should, have, that should be enough to give you a clue that it can be uh, hemifacial spasm. Why is it not dystonia? I told you. Yes, so, so why is it not facial dyskinesia? There are many differentials. Why, why is it not facial? Especially because the neck is also moving. So why is it not dyskinesia occurring? So just, just to make you think about what are the differentials. So think of these differentials also alongside. So your neurologist went to you with MR or what was their diagnosis? Their diagnosis was a psychological loop between the seventh and eighth. I saw an immediately found like a loop. He already has a mic. So now, I mean, he has confirmed the diagnosis to you that it's hemifacial spasm. It's more or less certain. So, what will you do now? You want an MRI to be done. So what will you advise the patient? What kind of MRI you should go for? Uh, before, just before yeah. that. Okay, hemifacial spasm diagnosis. What are the differential diagnoses for the cause of hemifacial spasm in a young child? There can be a lesion which is causing... What type of lesions? Neuropathy, uh, young patient, so uh, NF, uh, neurofibromatosis in a small lesion in his right knee. Small lesion. Please report, man. First, the report is the word. No, no. What are the conditions? He, he looks healthy. Uh, what are the other things you have to look for? What are the differential diagnoses? If you say hemifacial spasm, anatomy of the lesion is in the CP ankle. So, what are the conditions which can occur in the CP angle in a young child which can cause, because the child did not come with any headaches, vomiting, ataxia, anything. What are the differential diagnoses? One you have already told. Uh, yeah. One you already told. No, one was the uh, definite diagnosis maybe, but other things... So let me put the question other way. What other lesions in CP angle can lead to this? Any, any patient with a hemifacial spasm, what are the differential diagnoses? Uh, can be a uh, meningioma. Uh, uh, so it can be tumors, you want to say. Meningioma. Which tumor most commonly causes hemifacial spasm rather than a uh, meningioma? Let me ask you again in another way. Which are the irritating tumors? Uh, 
which tumors are irritating epidermoid epidermoid sometimes occasionally epidermoids can also cause arachnoid cysts all these things because he is young and he's not presented with any uh, symptoms of raised intracranial pressure any past history you would want to ask any specific past history you would want to ask in a patient who presents to you with a definitive hemispatial spasm the medical side so from surgical side uh, i have seen one case of hemispatial spasm in a case of trauma also I had a history of trauma long time back and this patient also had this so from surgical side we will also ask for trauma medical side history of a facial nerve palsy past yeah sent to us but do ask the history of past facial nerve palsy so well spouse so what are the other features of bell's palsy you can answer you you can answer you can take up and answer oh, what happened In the examination, it's called mouth, digging the grave. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, don't fear, don't fear. Good man. Okay, that's all right. Because we are losing time. Okay, so you can tell it's okay. You can tell from the audience that he is he was wanting to tell. Yes, yes, please. Facial nerve palsy. Yeah, that's uh, and deviation. Use the mic. What the other features, sir? the yeah, angle of deviation of the mouth angle and the throwing in the forehead i want to i want to ask you like a person she said that a person you should ask this question that whether a patient had bell's palsy or not so you have asked and the relative of the patient says the parent says yes this patient had bell's palsy now he has come to you okay so how will what questions you will ask this patient now to make to that will help you clinch the diagnosis that is it an ica loop or is it an abnormal facial nerve that is what i am i am interested in knowing what are you telling you can continue with that other signs of the facial nerve palsy like the deviation of angle of mouth and the throwing in the forehead it may be the so what happens in bell's palsy uh, the nerve gets injured somehow after a viral infection and then it will regrow back so when the fibers of the nerve they are growing back the fiber which is supposed to be reaching here might reach here yes. the fiber which is supposed to be associated with the uh, salivation can go to the lacrimal duct as well so a person who is going to eat he may start crying also okay so these are the questions that you have to ask this crying is known as crocodile crocodile tears so you know this jaw winking and other. and again one should when we talk about the uh, lower motor neuron facial what are the other just not the facial there are something else also occurs for the nerve to stapedius and hyperacusis and all these things one has to keep it in mind So now you have asked everything, and it's very clear that this patient has hemifacial spasm. How will you proceed further? What will you do? What will you advise the patient? Go back home. Give him some medicine. Give him some medicine. Advise some tests. What will you do? The MRI investigation, sir. So what will you write on the OPD card of this patient? Go get an MRI brain done. MRI brain with the trigeminal protocol or facial. Protocol. So what's that so protocol that, called? Cis protocol. Cis protocol. Cis protocol. So what is cis protocol? It's a heavily T two weighted sequence. Cis is basically a Siemens sequence. It is also called as Fiesta for G or Philips. Okay. So you want a heavily T two weighted sequence. So will you write just this? Get a cis sequence done. They'll do the cis sequence and send the patient back to you. And still now. instead of patient you will be crying why because you require a 3d sequence so that you are able to see the nerve in three dimensional view where is the compression is it inferior superior where is that compression you want to see that so always if you are thinking of this diagnosis write on the opd card get a mri brain done with 3d cis sequence and he should bring it back on a cd so that you can 
load it on a console and see that. Okay. So now if you see that there is a compression which is causing this kind of a problem, then what will you do? What are your options which are available with you? Before, before that, you know, he said any other location in a child, some other region somewhere, which can present with any patient. My answer cannot be wrong because this is from the Google. <laughs> Google does Google because I will tell you hemi facial this is recording. Hemi facial spasm caused by intraaxial brainstem cavernous malformation. In child only, eh? that hemi facial spasm caused by pondine glioma. So don't jump always to uh, outside eh? uh, to the uh, CP angle, understand? And suppose, you know, both the patients have got, this is not written here, this is my knowledge. Eh? So, suppose both the patients have got facial nerve involvement, understand? One has an extra axial loop or tumor or epidermosis or something with patient. Other patient has got a brainstem problem. What clinically will tell you? So this is inside the brainstem and that is outside. Do you like to examine the cranium? What is the uh, cranium? I am telling only, only facial nerve is getting affected for uh, this, this thing. Hypothetically, it is only facial nerve outside the angle affected. In the angle is affected. Other facial nerve is getting affected inside the brain stem. How will you differentiate? Look for taste. He wants to answer. Taste will be spared in. He wants to answer. Different nuclear. Understand? So that is the importance of looking for taste also. And then look for all other signs brain stem. Understand? So don't jump. Straight to epidermis or Ica loop or anything. Google will tell you so many diagnoses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This patient has an Ica compression and you have documented it. What will you advise the parents now? Go ahead with surgery. Go ahead with the surgery with the microdiscular compression. Now I am the parent. I refuse. I I fear. I mean, I don't want to undergo surgery. Are there any treatment other other treatment options, doctor, for my child? But yeah. so you can. Counsel them that this is not something not functional. Yeah, so exercises to control. Anything else which can be given to leave the patient off the center for the moment? They are not ready to get a surgery done. Yes. Yeah. So even uh, rhizotomy, rhizolysis can be done. Okay. So these are the two other options: botulinum toxin you can inject, and rhizotomy you can do. And in which position you would like to do the surgery? What are the, I mean, surgical positions which can be utilized to achieve this decompression? Park bench and lateral position. Park bench, lateral. Sitting position. So anything by which you can do a retromastoid craniotomy, that position can be achieved. This can very easily be done in lateral position as well. Can also be done in parsed when some people do it by turning the neck because unlike fifth nerve, seventh nerve is slightly low down. So you can easily see that because if the fifth nerve is very high up, sometimes the shoulder blade comes in your view. So this surgery can be achieved by any means. Normally, Aika goes with seventh, eighth nerve, man. I can say one pre what is that pre canalicular what you call pre meatal segment another is a post meatal segment so there at this pre meatal segment is closely related to seventh eighth nerve so why are you telling it is Ica involved and all that Ica normally goes man all of us Ica is along with the seventh eighth man many of us it is in touch only. With the seventh, fortunately, 
we don't have this uh, problem. So why did you think it is Aika aberrant looper? What are you telling? It is not aberrant, man. It's normal. You understand, man? Aika anatomy is like that only. So why are you telling it is? I am not telling. It can produce, man. Aika can produce hemifacial spasm. Uh, after you have ruled out everything, then fiddle Aika, man. Uh, so otherwise, normally it's with the seventh, eighth nerve. Understand? You are showing his video of surgery. Eh? Okay. What were you wanting to ask the audience in the beginning? Yeah. Uh, what is it? MRI? MRI you have? Okay. It was done. Yeah. So, could the patient suppress these movements voluntarily? Yes, he must have been if they are fixed. <laughs> because that's how you differentiate between these two. If the patient... Oh, huh. Yeah, sorry. That is why I asked you the question that one of the commonest causes of these or abnormal movements in this age group is uh, non-organic. They are self-limited. Even if you think even therapy go away in next two, three months. So that's why I asked you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, the, I can, the purpose of, uh, just a minute, the purpose of this presentation was like neurology residents saw high felt hemifacial spasm. MRI showed proximity of ICA to 7th, 8th complex and immediately referred. So as surgeon, just because it is referred to you, you need not to do surgery. <laughs> so, so I knew it is sticks. So we referred to our movement disorder neurologist. They confirmed that it is sticks, and we sent for behavioral therapy, and the child is fine now. The, the, the thing is, you know, surgeon should not be like Maslow. You no, know, Maslow is a carpenter who goes with a hammer, seeing everything around him as a nail, and he want to nail everything. So. Neurosurgeons, they will see so many loops here, there, and don't. Don't think it is all for uh, microvascular decompression. Okay. And I think uh, it's good that the movement disorder specialist sent him for behavioral therapy. Otherwise, many of them would botox him. So at least he survived that. Botox is okay. At least costly, but patient will not die with that. No? Thank mm. you. Now, uh, the next case uh, will be presented by Dr. Ravinder from Kim's Hospital. I would request Dr. Dal Sakla and Dr. Ranjit for chair research. And volunteers. Uh, to volunteers. Anybody volunteering? I have to again go and. Yeah. yeah people, people are hiding the eyes. I have to ask them. Both of you. Yeah, you. Still want it. Check, check. Check, hey. Check. Good evening to all my teachers and my colleagues. Uh, 
Good evening to all my teachers and my colleagues. Today is my uh, case presentation. I'm Dr. Ravindra Reddy from Kim's Hospital. Uh, this is a case of a 40 years old, uh, old male, right handed, married person, resident of Orissa, uh, grocery store business by occupation, history given by himself, and it is reliable. Uh, he presented uh, complaints of re uh, reduced hearing and right ear since two years and headache since two months. Imbalance when walking since 20 years. History of presenting in this patient was apparently asymptomatic two years back when he noticed a uh, uh, reduced hearing in right ear. Which was initially in onset and progressively increasing. Initially, it used to talk over mobile, people on the right, but people or the people in heaven to start to switch over mobile to the left ear. In fact, we found more difficulty in understanding why it was that the reality is done. They could hear very good hear some sound, but not able to appreciate the words clearly. They report that hearing and hearing progressively wanted to be clear. Yes, I have a very good way in hearing why. In a noisy surrounding, no history of current origin noises of sound when he increases volume of television or mobile phone. No history of training association of buzzing sound in the right ear. No history of noise of stopping in the right ear. No history of ear pain or ear distance. There was no history of tribes or trauma of other surgeries in the right ear. There was no history of intake of any medication apart from over counter analgesics. Patient then did not get evaluated further. Uh, decreased hearing on the right side as his day to day activities were not disturbed grossly. Uh, he developed headache in the hospital region for last two months. Headache was insidious in onset and intermittent. Headache is of dull aching type and lasts for a few minutes. But no history of any derniere variation of uh, headache. Pain had no aggravating factors or re relieves on taking medication or subsides by itself. Headache was not associated with uh, nausea or vomiting not associated with any visual disturbance or blurring of vision. Headache gets relieved by taking over-counter analgesics. Initially, he used to take medication once in a week, but now frequency of taking medication has increased. Uh, he is taking once in every two days now. Uh, patient also developed feeling of unbalance while walking uh, since the last two, uh, 20 days. He found difficulty in reaching the targets in a straight line when he goes to any market. Patient while used to feel like he was walking No history. Of. Yeah. Uh, no history removed. Everything, everything. Family all removed. Okay. <laughs> Consuming so What is this? Uh, 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 to summarize, uh, 45 years old gentleman, pain is progressive, right side and hearing loss since two years, and intermittent delaying headache for two months in imbalance while walking from 15 days. Uh, uh, pain is progressive, right side hearing loss could be apical cranial nerve involvement in a headache. Uh, possibly dural stretch and imbalance while walking could be a vestibular pathology or cerebellar, uh, cerebellar pedicular cerebellar pathology. Why do you say dural stretch? Because uh, headache was not associated with any vomiting or early morning rise of headache. Uh -huh. So, so it's a dural stretch. What is the characteristic of a dural stretch headache? Uh, so it will be dull aching type stretch. What is the characteristic of a dural stitch headache? Oh, it is a uh, dull aching type. Yeah. And a positional one. Positional? Why position? It doesn't change with the position because only one part of the anatomy. <coughs> it is a continuous headache. Because uh, the dual city is not waxing and waning. Okay. It's a continuous headache. Okay. There may be occasional exacerbations because of the raised pressure. But the headache is continuous. Background headache is always there. Okay. Isn't it? Yes. And sometimes it can be localized also, depending upon the site of the lesion. So where do you think is the pathology? Uh, to the CP angle region, sir. Yeah, because, uh, first uh, symptom was uh, sudden on uh, hearing loss, gradually progressive hearing loss, and uh, gradually developed a headache followed by imbalance, uh, could be gradually uh, uh, growing, uh, slow growing tumor, causing now mass effect from the cerebellar region. So, 
see, you think it's in the CP angle yes. because the H now is involved. Yes. No other. Why can't it be in the uh, meatal or in the middle ear? Why only in the CP angle? Because uh, it imbalances this one. Well, vertebral component you may be having. Middle ear, he could hear uh, sounds clearly in the noisy environment. Mm -hmm. Because in the, there was no history of any uh, ear discharge or to uh, justify middle ear. Okay. On examination, what do you define? On examination. Uh, on examination. Brain stem region will not present with the initially hearing loss. But bilateral, they may present with bilateral. Yeah, yeah. So, what type of hearing loss you can get in brain stem? Yeah, uh, what type of? Don't tell that. Most of the time, it doesn't present, but it can have dichotic hearing. The normally, you know, I can listen for uh, sounds coming from here, there, there, everything at the same time. These people will will not be able to uh, understand like that if two people talk from the two sides, or you cannot localize from where it is coming. In. So they also have some hearing problem. Don't tell that they cannot present. Understand? Okay, what else? What, what, what else in that history rolls out a brainstem? Rest everything can come up. Uh, I, present, uh, lower cranial nerve pads, also the swelling difficulty. And, uh, uh, well, if, if, the, if, the, if the lesion, that can come with the angle lesion also, no? Yes, sir. Uh, so they, all the other things can. Can you go back? Go back. I know. Uh, sorry. Localized pressure. They can come with all seventh nerve, sixth nerve, uh, everything it can come. What in your history rules out uh, brain stimulation? They, they can have walking problems, they can have vestibular problems, they can have uh, hearing problem, seventh nerve, sixth nerve, gaze fallacy, everything they can have, man. Something in your history you told which will not occur there. Very uh, really fast you are going, man. Please. No, no, no. Your initial history. Something is there, man. They will not present with headache. Oh. Understand? Headache, they will not present. Understand? So, so you, from your history, you feel the eighth nerve is involved. Yes, sir. Where okay. it is involved, man? Uh, retrocochlear. Why are you telling retrocochlear? Sir. So, or gradually progressive, sir. Last that can years. occur for end organ also, man. That fortunately, that patient is good that he could not listen to and uh, not understanding what his wife is talking. But uh, children, he can listen. Uh, you, you saw that. Uh, what does that suggest, man? He's a very lucky fellow, man. <laughs> so, uh, what does that suggest, man? Uh, high frequency, high frequency loss. So, what is the why you are telling it is a retrocochlear? In a retrocochlear, uh, uh, there will be loss of high frequency. Uh, but end organ also it can produce high frequency, man. But uh, end organ also associated other symptoms are headache and uh, imbalance. No, 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 no. I am telling just a cochlear pathology. A cochlear uh, pathology. So, how did you rule out a cochlear pathology? Say. It is uh, sensory neural as a sensory component, which is cochlea, end organ. Yeah, then uh, the neural part is uh, our nerve, man. Understand? Cochlear nerve. So, uh, sorry, end organ pathology. Like recruitment phenomenon. You, you tell in history, man, all that, man. Understand? In cochlear pathology, they will I, 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 So, what is the hallmark of... Uh, uh, sensory neural deafness of retrocochlear hearing loss. What is the signature, man? Signature. Speech discrimination. Absolutely. It is speech discrimination is affected uh, out of proportion yeah. to hearing loss. So if you have seven, 60% of the cochlear nerve cut also, 
patients still have normal hearing van understand yes. uh, but their discrimination will go so why this discrimination is going because uh they can't they can hear the noise but they can't uh, understand then, you don't say tell us the uh, meaning of discrimination man you tell why it is occurring why discrimination is going but hearing is uh, relatively well preserved there will be early tone decay if if anybody can tell this answer I, that i will give a drink from whatever drink they are giving today evening <laughs> <laughs> that is, I don't have to spend, but you can drink with me. But people who are interested can come and ask me. Okay, continue. Oh, okay. Uh, other thing, you know, uh, any other location can you tell, man? Don't jump to CP angle, man. Uh, one brainstorm we have told, one CP angle we have told. So what about any other location? Uh, can it be a Meckel scape lesion? Uh, yes, uh, could be, sir, but he does not have any uh, like uh, facial symptoms or facial yeah, numbness. Come on. Say, uh, middle fossa, there is a large lesion in the Meckel scale extending to middle fossa. GSPN can get involved. So it will catch the genicular ganglion. They will come with facial weakness. They can have hearing loss from cochlea. They can have walking problem from pedangle involvement. They can have headache. So everything can come from there also, man. Yes. But what won't be there? Uh, facial numbness and facial... No, they, they said, it's a Meckel scale, man. They can have well, sent all uh, fifth inner problem, sixth inner enter through Dorolo there. They can have sixth inner. They can have hearing loss from cochlea. They can have everything, man. Uh, so what won't be there? So second drink, uh, evening, uh, from our counter for anybody who tells that answer. Okay, continue. Uh, on general examination, patient is sitting comfortably in a chair with his hands by his side, moderately built, adequately nourished. Uh, uh, BMO is 25. Uh, blood pressure and pulse rate were normal. No paler, ictrous, synopsis, clubbing, or pedal edema, generalized lymphadenopathy, no swellings or pigmented patches uh, all over body. Uh, no, uh, in a olfactory nerve was normal. Uh, in opti uh, optic nerve examination, visual fields uh, were normal. Uh, uh, fundoscopy, there was no papillary edema. Uh, in a, uh, uh, extra ocular movement, there was a horizontal gaze overcoat and nystagmus was present. Uh, on trigeminal examination, no uh, temporal muscle wasting was noted. I, uh, uh, can I just interrupt you? So the horizontal gaze work nystagmus, you have to just describe it a little more. So which side was it? The fast component, which side was the... On the right side, sir. With the slow component on the uh, uh, contralateral side. Uh, Force nystagmus was on the side of the lesion, sir. And the slow component was on the opposite side, sir. Contralateral side. So, wait, wait, then had a post nystagmus on looking to one side. Yes, sir. And the side, uh, nystagmus on the opposite side. High frequency, uh, nystagmus on looking to the opposite side. That's what they are doing. Yes, Low frequency towards the one side. High, high frequency towards the four. High nystagmus to the opposite side. Yes, sir. So, what is the problem? We are not telling that now. Walls nystagmus, sir. Do you hear me? And was there a rotary component to the nystagmus? Was there was there a rotary component to the nystagmus or only it was horizontal? Horizontal, sir. Horizontal. How would you differentiate between a 99 percent loss and a 100 percent loss? It was bilateral intact, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, facial sensitive, uh, fa facial no taste sensitive no present, no facial deviation. Uh, eighth uh, vestibular no. Uh, uh, Whisper not able to hear in the right ear. Renee's uh, right side AC more than BC and left AC more than BC. Weber's lateralized to left ear. Uh, suggestive of sensory neural hearing loss on the right side. ABC, ABC uh, absolute bone uh, conduction was decreased in the right ear. Uh, glossopharyngeal uh, nerve in the vagus now. Uh, you will not collect.
Uh, motor examination was normal. Uh, tone was normal in the both upper limbs and lower limbs. Uh, gait was normal. Cerebellar signs. Uh, uh, tandem gait. Uh, Dear uh, can you say uh, finger nose this everyone everything was negative. Uh, you know nystagmus horizontal gaze evoked uh, nystagmus course high amplitude with the fast component to the right and the slow component to the left. Uh, anatomical localization and substrate involved right side sensory neural hearing loss could be a vestibular or cochlear nerve pathology and gaze evoked a coarse nystagmus CP angle pathology, imbalance while walking, cerebellar pedunculum, and CP angle pathology. Uh, my provisional diagnosis, uh, CP angle lesion. Middle Provisional diagnosis, uh, CP angle lesion, vestibular schwannoma with uh, mass effect on the cerebellar, uh, middle cerebellar pedunculum. Uh, other possible diagnosis could be a meningioma or epidermal cyst. Sixth level is normal. Normal. Uh, normal. Sixth level is normal. Yes, sir. And then uh, yeah. lower genitals are normal. No, yes, sir. So only hearing loss is normal. Only hearing loss. That is sensory neural. Seventh is normal. Seventh is normal. Seventh. No cerebellar pain. Cerebellar signs, uh, yeah, imbalance in the diagnosis. The nystagmus is there. Nystagmus. Understand? Yeah. And so only hearing loss with nystagmus. Uh, how can you put it into the angle and produce only diagnosis? So for you to tell cerebellar formed an angle, there should be something there, man. It will uh, suggest that, man. That's because there is a hearing loss. I am telling it is from wax in the ear, man. Uh, wax, the patient has a wax. Uh, so you have to tell why, man, it is a cerebellar pondine angle like that. You are telling uh, vestibular schwannoma with mass effect on cerebellar pedangle and cerebellar. What is the growth rate of vestibular schwannoma? Mm -hmm. eh? Yeah, so it is around, so if it grows above 4 millimeter only, neurosurgeons will open their eyes. In that time, we sleep only. For this patient, what is the size of that leaf, uh, tumor to produce? What is that you are telling? Pedangle, hemisphere, mass effect and all. What is the size you are telling? It and with that size, that patient uh, should develop some other pineal nerve, which is not there, man. No, uh, You understand what I am yes. telling? So whatever you are written, cerebellar, pedangle, cerebellar, hemisphere, mass effect, that means what should be the size of the tumor. And you are telling two millimeter uh, growth only, but uh, patient has got uh, all this, and you are telling it is a vestibular schwannoma. It's difficult to digest, man. I imaging may show the same thing, man. So you should think of something else also, man. Understand? Yes. If uh, suppose somebody has got just hearing loss, don't put it in the angle. Understand? Put it more into the board. Understand? Continue. Oh. Double, okay, double. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, correctly, man. You could look into the brain, yeah. This is a uh, T2 weighted image with a uh, uh, right uh, CP angle. Uh, right uh, CP angle region, there was a hyper intense lesion. With a uh, widening of uh, uh, internal auditory canal and causing mass effect, uh, uh, mass effect of brain stem and cerebellar region, and uh, we can see there is effacement of uh, fourth ventricle. You, you, you have to tell that patient has got uh, vestibular schwannoma with very strong cranial nerves, which cannot get affected uh, uh, because you know this size definitely. Uh, fifth nerve, all will be affected, man. Sensory loss, all will be there, man. Understand? Yeah, seventh I agreement may not be there. Hearing loss, you have told there. But I, this size of the tumor is so huge, there should be at least fifth nerve involvement, man. Sensory loss, man. Understand? <laughs> and uh, see where the fourth ventricle is, man. Yeah.
operated or not operated or not operated sir how will you operate man uh, through a retromastoid uh, suboptical craniotomy okay what is the retro retromastoid okay so what will happen man uh, retromastoid with cerebral lectomy or Mm -hmm. Why you are telling this nonsense, man? So it is an old thing which has been like intramedullary. Uh, it is posterior column, is fired, that type of nonsense. Uh, it, it is retrosigmoid. Right. Understand, man? Okay. You have to go see the sigmoid. Uh, you cannot see the medial part of sigmoid without doing mastoid removal. Understand? Okay. So you should never utter retro mastoid, retrosigmoid. Understand? Okay. You are which year student? Second year. Okay. How will you differentiate? Uh, why do you want a, uh, do you want a CT scan for this patient? Uh, CT scan to see Petrus bone. Which... Why, man? Correctly, you have something you are telling. So, what is the role of CT scan for vestibular chart? MRI gives all information, no? Yes, MRI gives all the information. CT scan, you know, if you are a trans labyrinthine surgeon to see if the patient has got contracted mastoid, then it is a relative contraindication for a trans lab approach. Other thing, you know, people tell that you can appreciate emissary foramen, a jugular bulb, everything with the CT scan. Investigation you should do is this only. Why? Which is that information which MRI can give, which CT cannot give. So that is the third drink for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, now, zero, zero, is that has become. When did Not... uh, second year yes. student only. Okay, at least you know you should tell retro sigma. Okay, retro sigma. Huh? Dr. Dhawal and Dr. He didn't ask any question. Dr. Uh, can, you, can you show the location of the fifth now in this titivated image?
Bring it down. Bring it down so you can bring it down. This one. Yeah. No, the normal set. First show the normal set. Is Mackel scape formed by bone, dura, or arachnoid? Bone. It may be located in the bone, but is it is it bone? Mackel scape. Is it bone? Anybody else? Mackel scape. What is it? So it's a subarachnoid space. So what does it contain? CSF and? Here's Mike. Here's Mike. Can you, can you show the Michael screen? That may not be the fifth term because it looks like a ploid of some. Show the Michael's K first. On the normal side, you show it. No, that's not the Michael's K. Yeah. Hey, it's, it's, yeah. It's more like Say, Meckel's cave, you know, Meckel's cave is a dural pouch. Understand? Yeah. It's a dural pouch. It is in the middle fossa, in a spoon shaped depression. In the anterior superior end of the middle fossa, there is a spoon shaped depression. That depression is called the trigeminal impression. It houses a dural pouch. That dura doesn't belong to middle fossa. It belongs to posterior fossa. So it, this dural pouch, which is enclosed between two layers of middle fossa and dura. That is dura propria of the middle fossa and periosteal dura of the middle fossa. In the uh, trigeminal limbration is called the Meckel scale. It houses trigeminal ganglion. Behind that, there is CSS space. Understand? And distal to the Meckel scale, this dura of the posterior fossa, which is this uh, Meckel scape, it continues over the division as the epineurium over the division. Understand? It is in simple words. So, yeah. Complex words, if you want to tell them. This is a yeah. simple yeah. word. Yeah. This is a dural hey, Why did you do diffusion weighted image? Any Pardon? Uh, to see any diffusion restriction. Obviously, no. And what diffusion restriction you wanted to see in vestibular show, no? Hmm? Now, don't go back to diffusion image. Is vestibular show no diffusion restricted or not restricted? Uh, no, sir. Hmm? No, sir. No. Which tumor it will be restricted? Epidermides. Any intraparenchymal tumor it will be restricted? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Uh -huh. All embryos, all embryos, and then lymphoma. Yeah. They are all highly similar to it. They all will get diffusion restriction. So, uh, diffusion restriction in brain parenchymal tumor no? it indicates high grade malignancy, like lymphoma, medulloblastoma, they are highly linked layer tumor. So, that will differentiate from higher grade tumor versus lower grade tumor. That's all. Then, I have that. Okay, thank you. Before you go, 
whole day you have listened to lectures no you had no chance to ask your any doubts you have or you have only doubts when it will get over yeah no no if there are no doubts you can uh, write in the group also there will be feedback form uh, you can write in the feedback form what uh, 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 means you are free to go to uh, Silparama, which is nearby, which is walkable. And uh, you can, I think some exhibition is going on on art and craft, if you're interested. And then have dinner and then uh, uh, come in the morning at 8 o'clock. We'll start sharp at 8 o'clock, but because many faculty have uh, uh, flights to catch. So we'll start at 8 and finish uh, by lunchtime. And uh, your dinner is organized in the ground floor. Uh, it's in the ground floor, no? It's where you had the breakfast. Uh, yeah, in the restaurant only. Where the break had the breakfast. And uh, for the faculty, there is a, uh, as a separate place is organized. Sir. Yeah. That's in the M floor. The faculty is in the M floor. M, M. M for Manas, sir. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I just a request from uh, the from Icon people because the checkout time is 12, no? So please check out before coming because otherwise you have to go in between the classes. So please do the checkout and come to the class. Thank you.